Okay, yeah, that's the bad season. Bah, bah, bah. <laughs> what? No, it's not. <laughs> oh, whoops, sorry. I mean, season two. I'm Sorry, I, what I meant to say was season three was the bad one. I meant to say it's a bad season, not the bad season. Correct, oh, Mahler, because out, they're all four, that bad. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> episode four was a notably bad episode of it a was. bad season. Indeed, it television. was. Upsetting. It's because it was it like, stood oh no. Out being particularly bad. And that's on, even on the Mandalorian grading scale, on the curve, that was a really bad episode. Well, yeah, Mando's character got assassinated in episode four. It's just yeah. like, oh, wow. I realized, oh, we're just doing the show where everyone in the galaxy is a retard now. It's like, okay, everyone's stupid, including Mando. This is great. I really like this character and this universe so much. Ba, ba, and once again, ba, ba, I'm reminded ba, 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 that ba. everyone is an idiot. Hey. At least you got to see him be a terrible parent several times and desperately care for this creature that eventually led to some of the like is is baby Yoda not basically the most important fucking creature in, in the universe for that continuity feels that well way. they treat him like that because luke skywalker apparently only wants to train a single entity and it's fucking baby yoda he's not <laughs> trying to build up a jedi temple and find people he only wants to train a single creature and it's this infant remember when he offers the baby the armor or the lightsaber you're old enough to make incredibly <laughs> life so weird. decisions at a young yeah, age what it, does they mean by will this determine whether or not you get to like that's it you know <laughs> like that's that's it you know you want to you want to be a jedi you want to go hang out with mad dog yeah. you don't do you want to be a jedi for the rest of your life or do you want to be with this bounty hunter guy for the rest of your life infant you could totally Here, tell Baby Yoda is like, you mean. I have no fucking clue what's happening, bro. I just want some milk. <laughs> I want some milk. eat some <laughs> yeah. people's babies. Luke was like, hey, just go ahead and uh, tell me what your decision is. Oh, yeah, that's right. You can't even talk. Well, Ahsoka, Ahsoka was able to mind meld somewhat with Baby Yoda, I think. That, that was a thing. Remember that? I do remember that thing. That's how we learned his name was Grogu. That was a really, really <laughs> awesome... Wow, I just... Ahsoka is such a very cool character. She's so cool. I wish they'd give her her like own show. She's just so cool. Those are such cool women. Oh, her and Sabine and the green one. Oh, <laughs> the Hera. <green> one. <laughs> Boy, they are so cool and badass and awesome. Man, I hope I can grow up to be just like them. Oh. Cute. Don't you like how basically the whole the whole storyline of Ahsoka was completely undermining that guy's choice at the end of that other show? Just like completely undoes it. Isn't it crazy? He he made both of them. Like he made both of those shows and he did that. He did. Well, yeah, he, He's gonna he, save Star Wars. He also was an important guiding force for the Acolyte. I mean, of course he is. He is the chief creative officer of Lucasfilm. Like, he is ultimately in charge of the creative decisions well, of that quite company. A, um, it's quite a cornering now, because either, as anyone out there who's a fan of his his input, you have to think either that uh, this catastrophe was caused by him, or that he allowed it to happen. I mean, that's those are the only options. He yeah. is the that's his job. His job is to oversee the creative decisions made by like the company, all of the creative projects. Like that's his that's his domain. So the does fact he that still it have out, fans? Because like the, that, that so. seems to be the calculation they've made, right? Which is that you know, they've started coming out and saying, "Oh no, it was Dave Filoni's idea that the witches don't all have to be night sisters, and they can be different kinds of witches." Dave Filoni said that. Hey guys, it was Dave Filoni. Like it now. Is that actually? Working? Does he have I think, a, it's, a I think it's starting to not work now, and I do wonder if it's just a matter of um more people saw like Ahsoka than saw the Clone Wars. I don't know if that's actually the case, but maybe that you it, know that it might like, be the case. It might be or also case. just that it's the later work. You know, even even if you were to you know whatever your opinion is on the Clone Wars, it's like well that was you know that was like a decade ago at this point compared to what he's doing now. Yeah. I mean, I think it is hard to get past the fact that Ahsoka is like the dream project from the perspective of a lot of creators. It, you get to write it, you get to direct it, it's your characters, you've got all the money that you could want, you know, now's your chance, and it was really bad. And to think, I, I Ahsoka pulled... Season 2 will happen eventually, and that's going to be awful too. It will. The Mando movie will happen. And then the Mando movie. That'll yeah, be terrible, right. yeah. 
That's a great idea, a Mando movie. I just want everyone That's to realize pretty... what we're praying for is that they're short. <laughs> um, Hour and a half of yeah. Mando movie would be nice, yeah. That's the the merciful. Eighty four minutes would be great. Yeah. That's the merciful <laughs> element of the acolyte is at least it's short. Ish. Mm. Had it all in you. Halo is like an hour each episode. Yeah, that's tough. That's um... rough, man. <laughs> that's a lot of bullshit to sit through every week. That's How many episodes were in the season? Oh, oh it's like eight. seventy-eight. <laughs> what? No, it's eight. <laughs> It felt oh, like okay, 78. Right. Oh, okay. Same as this, right. but in terms of total runtime, it's probably twice the length. Yeah. I pulled Nothing's the, made uh... to end anymore. It goes on forever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. Unlike yeah, I mean, EFAP, which like does it. definitely end, so don't get your hopes up. We yeah. will have to... <laughs> we, we, this will, stream will end. We can't talk someday. about signs forever. That's right. <laughs> hey! Speaking of signs, um, I pulled up our YouTube uh, stream here, EFAP number 289, and... Uh, I always, I'm, I'm always looking forward to what the, the AI generated chat summary is because it's always wrong. Um, or is it? I guess Ooh. we can find out. Uh, our chat summary is people are chatting about the latest video posted by the YouTube streamer. They are discussing their excitement, thoughts, and reactions to the content. Wow. I mean, that's, that's probably the most accurate it's been. It, it's actually, yeah, to give it some credit, it is the most accurate it's ever so been. I suppose they could just have um, posted that every time and they'd be close to not to write it is vague enough to apply to pretty much anything like a horoscope yeah, well, yeah that's true well however well, i uh i gotta i gotta get this off my chest because it's it's about time that we revisit this someone in the chat said that dog meat is best meat and listen let me tell you something about dog meat fuck dog meat i hate that dog and let me tell you why let me tell you why so dog meat pales pales in comparison, he is not even a shadow of a shadow compared to D Dog and Boomer from Far Cry 5. Now, let me tell you why. Okay, Dog Meat sucks. He is always getting in the way. Bethesda must have specifically programmed Dog Meat to stand in doorways and through narrow gaps. He is constantly not only getting in your character's way. But he will constantly walk right in front of your cursor as you're looking around and looting the environment. So, oh, you think you're going to grab that duct tape from the bin? No, dog meat. He's here. You now engage dialogue with dog meat because dog meat loves to just walk right in front of you all the time. But you might be saying, but hey, dog meat, do, but, but dog meat sometimes will, will sense that there, there's an object nearby and he runs off to go and get it for you. And you have to go and say, oh, what, what, what is it that you got, dog meat? What, what is it that you found for me? Oh, great, a pool cue. That's great. I'll put it in the trash where it belongs. Thank you so much, dog meat, for that pool you know, cue. Right. I really isn't appreciate it, isn't that. Isn't it uh, your onus as a uh, dog meat, you know, caretaker uh, to, you know, like if he's, if he's doing things that you don't like, that you need to, you need to help him, you know, guide him on his way and figure you know, out the right way to interact with the world. You know, that, that's, a, that's a fair thing to say, and I wish that mm -hmm. Bethesda would uh, ha have given me the option and opportunity to oh, be able to do that. Someone else takes some personal responsibility. Yes, it's the, it's the, the gods of that world who made it all that, right, that all right. do not even give me the option of being able mm. to do anything. But, oh wow. boy, Boomer and D-Dog. Oh, Boomer and D-Dog. What a, what a pair of excellent lads. Incredible. Oh, we love Boomer and Dog Meat. Highlighting enemies, tagging them, only being aggressive if you want them to be aggressive. They don't get in your way. You can clip through them if it comes to that. If it comes to that, you'll clip through them. But normally they know not to get in your way. D-Dog especially, he's always like to the side and kind of behind you a little bit. And he'll always turn based on where you turn so he's not constantly in the way. Oh, D-Dog and Boomer. What a pair. What an excellent pair. You want to go through a Far Cry stealth, you know, sneaky, sneaky run? Boomer is your boy because he's going to tell you where those enemies are, and he's not going to bug them, and he doesn't set off traps, right? Another thing Bethesda fucks up, dog meat? Yeah, he'll just walk ahead and set, up all, set off all those traps. Yeah, it's, thanks a lot, Bethesda. I really appreciate you doing that. It's a good thing one of the most popular mods was companions don't set off traps. Oh, how did that possibly happen? I'm going to go get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that he's, he's gotten that out. It's, uh... <laughs> Long time coming. 
Yeah. The thing is, is that Dogmeat can't make a case for himself. You know, it's not so very it's fair to cool. talk bad about a, yeah. a guy who can't can't be here today. That's the yeah, that's not nice. Well, that's... even if he could be here today, he'd just be barking or not saying anything at all. I mean, you know, it's Fallout Universe. Maybe he's developed some tech at this point that he could speak. Can't can't really say. I don't oh, know. What? The tournament's a dog. <laughs> yeah, For sure. Bob, yeah. <laughs> park, park. I mean, I, that, I, I think it's, I, I think the far side bark, comic yeah. that implies that if dogs could talk, they would just be saying "Hey, hey, hey" over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think what word it would be. It'd be really funny if it was just being said over and over again. It's not even "Hey." It's just just penis. Oi, penis. <laughs> Love saying this word. You've cracked the code. <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, while he returns, we we decided, you know, EFAP is a bit of a wacky show. We have all kinds of episodes all over the place coming out of the left field. You never know what's going to happen next. And I asked some fine gentlemen, uh, after I decided to do the same thing, to watch Signs so that we could talk about it. Now, the reason why it came up for me is because I saw a video with uh, a sort of exploration of what happened in the film. I'd always remembered it's kind of famous for being a bit silly. And so I was like, oh, those those are interesting ideas. Not necessarily good or bad, I'm just saying interesting. And then uh, I decided, you know what, I'll rewatch it. And I did, and I remembered how much of a film that I, I, I had opinions about it in, in all kinds of different ways. And so I thought it would be fun to watch it, have a bunch of other people watch it, talk about it, and then talk about some some videos on the YouTubes that talk about it. So mainly we're going to be talking today as a change of pace. It'll be interesting to do. How is everyone? Well, good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we call. Maybe talk about engaging. signs. Um, yes, I suppose. Uh, I don't even know what to say about about M Night Shyamalan. It's a uh, it's a bit of a fascinating story, and I think people who are youngins today probably don't even know who he is, right? That's that's probably a, a reality now, because um, that's very mean. His last film was great, whatever that was. Knock at the cabin door. Oh yeah, oh that one. <laughs> what a film it was. Did you see that one? I did. I didn't like it. Oh well, at least the one before that was. Um. Was it the elevator one? I didn't see that one. It's like no. Devil in the Elevator or whatever it's called. Old. Remember old? Oh, they went to the beach that makes you old, yeah. Yeah, and then and then before that was Glass, which um was like the final nail in the absolute coffin of ever believing that something could come from him that would be awesome. You know, it's wasn't it the third and the Shyamalan cinematic universe. Yes, because was like the... <laughs> Unbreakable is like potentially his best film of all time. Then Split is a movie that's like, whoa, I thought you were terrible now, but you made something that's not terrible. Hmm. And then Glass is supposed to be the sequel to both of them. And you're like, oh boy. And I remember, wasn't the meme... No, wait, was it was it Split? The, the reason everyone assumed this one was better than the others is because he'd written it back when he was not shit. And he never made it into a film, and that's why it was better. I remember people trying to find a way to explain it because people don't like things not making sense. <laughs> so, it was like... There has to be a reason. How did this happen? But uh, yeah, the broad uh, sort of journey for him, um, he he has his breakout... Not It's not even his first film, but the the Sixth Sense was the one that everyone was like, oh my god, you, you did a film that's good there, nice one. And then uh, Unbreakable, which I assume... Has everyone here seen those two? Yes. I don't think which, I have, actually. Ones? I haven't I seen don't. either of them? I don't think... Maybe I have. If I have, I've forgotten them. But I don't think I have. The Sixth Sense and Unbreakable. Oh, Sixth Sense. Sorry, no, I have, I have seen that. Actually, no. Sixth Sense is almost a meme movie. And I don't mean that in the sense that it's not a, a well-executed film, just that everyone knows the meme about it. And it, and it, become, it became like the yeah. poster child after Empire for the example of a spoiler. Because uh, knowing a particular thing about that film changes the whole perception of it as you watch it. Um, 
The Sixth Sense was on a budget of forty million, and it grossed uh, six hundred seventy-two million worldwide. That's pretty good. That's yeah, very good. Uh, yeah. He's pretty... he's been very profitable for the studios he's worked for. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> so, <okay. laughs> well, well it was early thing, early right? on he was. Yeah. Well, yeah, because that's the thing, right? This this tracking this is kind of fascinating. Um, Unbreakable didn't do as well, but it's still, it's very critically acclaimed, and it's considered one of the best superhero movies of all time, which is kind of interesting. Um, and it, it, we, we kind of just spoke about the latter portion, that's the earlier portion, right? Because eventually, I think the most famous failures from him all happen in a row, being The Happening, The Last Airbender, and After Earth. Those Pretty three much. are like the really high but profile. That was the one that kind of created the i guess the era that we're currently in for him where the films are lower budget mm. um and and uh i guess like you, you know they're not as successful as the films that he used to make in terms of making a lot of money but they are profitable yeah because i see uh six cents and unbreakable as a as a block then signs the village yes. and lady in the water as the next block and then happening last day and uh, after earth as the next block just where... a second just a I second would... <laughs> the only thing i would change is i would put lady in the water in the happening block fair enough lady i haven't seen that in forever it's so. horrible <laughs> i remember lady in the water being the first big bomb where like the most people yeah. suddenly figured like what is he doing now he's lost the <laughs> plot completely well, that's the thing. He's he was known, and this is kind of cool for just being a guy who just made original films, and you never knew what was gonna happen. He was expected to do twists, expected to make you think, and um, a lot of the times he was coming through, but uh, gradually that reputation got completely eroded. And uh, Signs was one of the first where it was like, hmm, a lot of people love it. A lot of people thought it was pretty okay, and a lot of people were like, okay, but I have a few questions. And uh, yeah. As his career progressed, more and more questions came about. Until, yes, as was mentioned, his um, his thing now seems to be much lower budget, uh, sort of like horror premises. That I mean, I didn't even see Knock of the Cabin or Old. Maybe I will one day. But uh, enough people saw them to allow him to keep making movies, which I suppose is the interesting thing about his uh, trajectory as a director is that there was really only like one instance in his career where it was actually becoming difficult to, uh, for him to make films, which was when he did uh, the visit, because that was after After Earth. Yes. that was like the one time when he was in a little bit of trouble in terms of his capacity to make movies. But th that's it, you know, across many, 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 many years of directing, which is really interesting when you consider how you know. It, I I feel like that says a lot about how much. Uh, stock he got from his earlier films that he it was it took like a decade <laughs> like well, uh, uh, until it was actually becoming a consequence that he had been making worse films he's mm -hmm. fascinating for so many reasons because i was about to say like the estimated budget for the visit was five million and it made nearly a hundred million it's like whoa I, I guess he's still he's not he's not doubted out you know he's still going <laughs> like he'll still get people being like yeah you can make this movie we'll, we'll fund that but uh yeah he was on fire at one point could do anything, working yearly, and or too yearly, I guess, with a lot of these. But pretty quickly, yeah. Pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. And, and I would argue, kind of on top of the world in a way of what you would expect he would want. As in, I'm someone who wants to tell stories, a filmmaker, and I'm getting to make my original ideas come to life with very big budgets, very famous actors, and uh, to to the acclaim of the and, audience. Yeah, and people know that that he did it, right? Like, an M. Night yes. Shyamalan film was something that was notably marketed, which is something that there are a lot of directors, even a lot of successful directors don't get that, you know, that, like, a big selling point of the film is the director uh, yeah. over cast members, you know? Well, that's what I want to try and make clear. When I was a, a, a boy child, he had... Uh, I remember him having a good reputation, like, the kind Likewise. that you could sell a movie on. Uh, he had he was good enough at that point. Like I think the village, it was still pretty pretty strong. As was mentioned, Lady in the Water felt like the first major blow. Even though uh, you, everyone's probably going to pick a different. Maybe maybe they will pick a different film for where they think he's uh, is where he fails. Um, 
in any case, his name is now synonymous with something different than what it was when I'd say the last Airbender is probably where everything it went it went catastrophic. Like he's a hack, he doesn't know what he's doing, he doesn't deserve any good reputation. Blah blah blah. Um, yeah, because that was when um because After Earth was the first film that didn't prominently advertise that he was the director. No, they worked really hard to make sure that people didn't really know that he was the director of that film. Well, and After Earth is a very funny movie as well. That like, movie's hilarious. <laughs> well, and I was actually going to bring up, none of his films have, uh, they're, they're all like goofy bad, uh, the happening especially, but uh, Glass pissed off <laughs> fans of his, and The Last Airbender pissed off everybody who obviously was fans of The Last Airbender, but also just uh, who, who didn't even know necessarily who he was or what he was up to. They would see that and be like, good God. So it's like a... Uh, in a sense, a one-two punch, it was over for him at that point. Because Glass, like, oh, that that felt like a film made by someone who didn't like the uh, Unbreakable and Split. Um, it was funny. Wolf was doing a stream on the Highlights channel. I think someone asked him about it, and he, like, started to have PTSD flashbacks of... Um, I was about to say spoilers, but, I mean, Glass is a horrible movie, so I don't really care. The uh, uh, Bruce Willis dying in a puddle, like, that was his fate. He's he's got a weakness to water somewhat, which you know what thematically relevant. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, um, couldn't even be a pool; it was a puddle. Yes, <laughs> it was a so puddle. Sad. It was well, the deaths of everybody in that movie was sad as hell. <laughs> the whole ending <laughs> was so sad. It was uh, <laughs> difficult to watch. Um, anyway, signs. Why don't we uh, before? carrying on get everyone's perspective on signs i don't know it will we'll just go left to right assuming everyone has the same left to right uh in fact i'll just post my left to right so that you can all see what i mean by the order which would mean capital o first up what did Hello. you think of m night shyamalama Naba ding dong as a lot of people say is uh movie <laughs> signs yes i had, it had been years since I had seen it, and I didn't remember having a very high opinion of it. Watching it again, uh, there are some things that stood out to me positives that I was surprised to find. There's still a lot of stupid. There's still a lot of silly things that don't make a lot of sense and kind of ruin the movie, especially the ending. But um, it's way funnier than I remembered in the first half. I wish it was consistently funny because it was quite amusing. On a rewatch, it was like, ah, this is kind of silly in a fun sort of way. And then they kind of lose that thread and they get a little self-serious. It has some redeeming qualities, but I, I don't really like it, especially by the end. It was an interesting rewatch, though. He's certainly made worse movies, but it's uh, maybe right in the middle for him in terms of quality. It's a star-studded affair. I'd forgotten even some of the child actors are pretty famous now. Uh, yeah. It's an interesting film. That's that's what I that's what I'll start with. Fair enough, Fringy. What have you got? Um, it is a real mixed bag. There's uh there are aspects about it that I like, individual scenes that I think are quite good. Um, aspects of the filmmaking that I like, but then there are also aspects of the filmmaking or like the structure of the story that are a little bit perplexing. Um, I do think that the film does uh, deteriorate towards the end, though. Um, in a big way, uh, and thematically, um, I, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't know that I find it, um, super coherent, um, but I mean, really, it seems like the big problem is the big problem that everybody talks about with this film. You know, it's, it's just like one of those instances of, now, look, right, if everybody is wondering the same thing about a very specific plot point, you know, like, hmm. It's 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 one of those just kind of uh, questions of man. I feel like this. I feel like the premise of this film has a serious problem. Um, but at the same time, it's like I said, there are aspects of it that I uh, that I I find like yeah, you know, there, there's some good filmmaking there, some good scenes, some good dialogue here and there. It's a real mixed bag. Fair enough, John. What do you think of Signs? Yeah, it's. A mixed bag. I think I might lean a little more negative. Like I saw this ages ago, I think in theaters, and uh, I was, I'm a huge fan of the Sixth Sense. So I mean, I liked M Night Shyamalan. I mean, I still I don't 
dislike the dude, but it's just I don't know what the fuck he's doing these days <laughs> with his filmmaking. But uh, I watched this again, and I liked it a lot less than I thought I would. Um, there are some really well done scenes in it, but there's too much dumb dialogue. The there's obviously a link between horror and comedy, but like the the it feels like the comedy in here really doesn't work. It's always coming at the expense of the horror. Um, and uh, I I like that he did put thought into the ending and the thematic of the whole thing but it's all just so clumsy and on the nose and obvious um wasn't a fan i like i don't hate this movie but i don't like it either it's somewhere in between well uh considering i'm next up i kind of actually feel like that captures my position on it it's such the absolute middle road for me with his career it, it feels like the transition movie from going from a, an acclaimed filmmaker to whatever the hell he ended up as. Uh, this one is <clears throat> filled, scene to scene, almost dialogue line to line with like, oh, that's good, oh, that's bad. Oh, that, that works, oh, that doesn't. A very strange experience uh, to watch this film, and it's, it's partly why I wanted to talk about it, is that it really does capture a, a wonky film-watching, film-going uh, emotional roller coaster. I want to like a lot of it, I'm almost there sometimes where I'm like, this, this is, this, I am having, f and then I'm like, oh no, because that, that, uh, and I start thinking about how everything works, and then, uh, uh, I guess I'll say that, um, I think I understand exactly what he was going for in terms of the meaning of this film, and I find it quite, uh, almost cowardly, the, uh, the theme for, for, for what happens here is very, uh, limited scope and, um, hides away from a lot of realities in order to feel good about itself. Which is just like, okay, it's nice that you pulled that off, but there's a hell of a lot more to what you were talking about that you didn't really want to address. Um, yeah, uh, it would be interesting to just highlight a few things that I think uh, work and don't work before we go into some of the YouTube videos. But before that, Rags, what do you think? I think that I might have been unfair to... Um, not to dog meat, because fuck dog meat. All right, asshole, piece of shit. I was unfair to Timber. Now, Timber is the canine companion in Far Cry New Dawn, and I think that I would be doing him a great disservice if I didn't <laughs> make sure to correct the record and say that not only are Boomer and D-Dog like, super high tier in terms of canine companions, Timber deserves to be up there as well. Because not only will he tag enemies, he'll get you crafting materials, he will tag them on the map, he'll let you know if there's alarms, and he'll even <laughs> intercept animals that try to attack you he'll take one for you that's how incredible he is so i wanted to make sure that just the record was set straight and fuck dog meat okay now that we've got the important stuff out of the way my opinion on signs is mostly negative and i think the more that i think about it the more negative it will become there are some parts of signs that i like in isolation and uh, there are some little bitty scenes and conversations that I do like. And it got, like, a couple laughs out of me. A couple genuine laughs out of me. But one thing that I would say about Signs, there's a lot of things, but one of which is that this is a very strange movie in terms of the, 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 the viewing experience. The way that shots are framed, the way that the dialogue is written, the way that actors portray that dialogue. Um, I think that just in terms of its direction... A lot of it is its structure, as was uh, mentioned before, is just unusual to me. I think a lot of the decisions in terms of its pacing and the sense of escalation are very um, askew. Um, I don't... Uh, I, I, I was really disappointed with a lot of things in the movie. And I think, in a way, what kind of upsets me the most is that depending on what exactly he wanted me to take from the thematics of this movie, I have potentially an, an, a great deal of umbrage towards it and what it is trying to say and what it might be attempting to do with it. Mahler had mentioned that um, the way that it tried to execute its thematics was you know, potentially really, really bad. And on that, I'm, that's kind of what I think about the most as being in a somewhat similar position in a way to our protagonist. I really don't appreciate a lot of the way that he frames sort of the themes and the elements of what makes the story the story. 
And all of this is kind of unfortunately underneath the malaise that is an understanding of the plot being really, really bad at times. Um, and obviously we'll get to... I, I already know what everyone's probably referring <laughs> to here because we haven't we haven't really like talked about this beforehand a lot of the time we'll be like hey what'd you think that's the all right see you for you and well we haven't really talked about this at all together but uh yeah I'd, I'd say that probably more so than anyone else uh here so far uh i really actually don't like this movie and uh i might depending on how this conversations go grow to hate this movie Ooh. um but that's it kind of depends on uh our discussion and in our chat and finally, Will Platoon, what did you think? Um, very similar. It's sort of like, thematically, it's, it's the movie equivalent of that very smug person who says, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, and then sort of huffs their farts, <laughs> and then you try and ask them what the hell they mean by that, and usually it's just some vague nonsense. Um, so, like, it's, it's, it's nice in spirit, I suppose. It's just sort of slightly incoherent in, in delivery, but then plot-wise, it's, I always remember quite enjoying signs up until around the halfway point. Um, and then I always remember not really remembering what happens after about the halfway point, because I usually drift off when it turns out that aliens who can build spaceships can't open doors, for example. That's a bit dumb. Um, aliens that are allergic to water come to a planet that's 70% water. That's also a bit dumb. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that, that just strains against its own premise. Um, and it does really good work until it has to grapple with its own premise and then it sort of falls into incoherence, really. Um, but until that point, it's kind of enjoyable. I, I like the, the family. I like the character dynamics. I don't particularly mind the dialogue even because I think what he's sort of going for is this sort of hyper normalcy almost. Like th these are not people who are pre-prepared with speeches with the exception of maybe one or two scenes. Um, kids are a bit weird, obviously, because they're kids and kids are weird. Um, I, I like, I like this, they're not. Well, maybe, I don't know. I've, I've met some weird kids. Um, I was a weird kid. So I don't know. I, I, I don't mind the dialogue so much at all. It, it really is just the case that it, it's a really nice, fairly satisfying build up. It does mystery and suspense quite well. Then it does the reveal and the reveal drags the whole thing down. All right, fair enough. In that case, let us, uh, I don't know, open up and talk about whatever the hell anybody wants to talk about. I will say that uh, I think a lot of this film was built believing that you would, uh, it'll have an impact of um, a theater experience rather than to be uh, sort of looked over in detail and discover what, what works and what doesn't work about it. There's a lot of ways this is built up that I think has more effect when you can't um, think about it for too long. I, I guess you could say that about a lot of films, to be honest with you, but I get the impression from uh, the director specifically that he was thinking about how it would feel to watch it, and that uh, having a first-hand experience and knowing a lot of people's description of how they felt while watching this film, it was actually very scary when it released for a lot of people. Can you guys believe that? Um... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you'd say that. I can, I can believe that like one or two parts could be considered scary, but yeah. I think that one of the movie's great. I, I would say this is a, a very massive um, issue with its, uh, with its construction is that its tone constantly didn't keep me. It wasn't balancing its tone well, and that someone had mentioned it in regards to the humor. Where, yeah, I, I laughed a couple of times, but I don't think that was worth the times I went, wow, that is a really shit joke, and you wasted a lot of time with that, and now the tone is ruined, and I'm thinking about how terrible that joke is, and it's weird the way that it was even constructed within the frame of this being human beings speaking. Yeah, uh, on that note, there are specific moments that I'm like, oh, I'd snatch that and put that in the good version, you know? Yeah. Where we fix everything up, because that was neat. Um, you know, feel free for anybody else to highlight any particular thing, but uh, I quite like the sprinklings of sort of weird creature uh, uh, clues that they get earlier on in the film um, because the, the intrigue is, is pretty up there in terms of just like what the fuck is this thing um, mm. and why is it doing what it is doing and it doesn't really match anything we could assume would be doing that. Like that part I think does work pretty well and even has some ideas that I would even congratulate him that Good, good lord! I would, I would like them now. You know, like, like, like more subtlety in terms of uh, it's as simple as noises, or it's as simple as a, a obscure visual that we can't really know for sure what we just, we just saw. Um, obviously, it gets more of it as the film goes on, which I'm okay with as well. I just um, appreciate the subtlety. There's, there's not as many, I guess, jump scares or hyperactive camera work. Uh, that's another thing that struck me about this film. It's very 
for lack of a better term, uh, shot with clarity? Hmm? Shot with clarity. Um, yeah. The camera is very mean. calm and oftentimes pulled back enough that you, you get every piece of information you could possibly need. You're not, you're not losing anything from, uh, the hyperactivity is kind of where I was going with it in any way, shape, or form. Like like cam or like underlit scenes and stuff like that. It's all very clear. Yeah. Matter of fact. Well, what's funny is that I'm always struck by the fact that when you see a, a later work by Shyamalan, it's like he lost the ability to uh, film movies somehow. Because like, a lot of them mm. look so much significantly worse than his uh, older stuff. I think that's true of a lot of movies, but yes, definitely yeah, yeah. for him. I, I'm foggy on a lot of his later work, but like in his the first string of films that he made, like I think his camera work is definitely one of his strengths. He's quite good at it. The way the places he decides to set his camera, the way he moves it, it's well done. No, yeah, there's a lot of like there's a lot of extremely wide angle lenses in this movie that kind of you know accentuate a weird kind of silly feel that works for some of the jokes. It just it makes things feel a bit uncanny. You know, like really close up wide angle shots of Mel Gibson's face and he's making a weird expression. You know, it, it has a strange off kilter vibe you know, it, to it. It makes me feel like it's the DNA of the shots of Mark Wahlberg in The Happening. Where... Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> well, the, only I... beat, the only beat I remember that shot that you described occurring is when like just before it flashes back to the big like conversation he has mm -hmm. with his wife. Was Were there, were there other... Um, moments like that where he uses like obviously an extreme wide angle lens. I don't, maybe person. extreme wide angle is a bit um, of an exaggeration, but there's a few shots in the movie, sometimes very low angle. Sometimes uh, I, I can picture one of him in like the the yard in front of his house, and it has a pretty wide angle close up shot of Mel Gibson's face, and it just kind of distorts the face in strange ways. I don't yeah. know. It just I just remember it it having that kind of feeling across the movie. Yeah, I'm okay with the sparing use of that sort of thing because it it does like as long as like the sense of vertigo is aligned with something the character is going through. Like, holy fuck, what is out there in the mm -hmm. cornfield? You know, like that can work. But speaking of the, oh, I'm sorry, go for it. I was just gonna say, you know. Molly, you said that there's something of the DNA of the happening in Mark Wahlberg's like close-ups in that movie. In this, yeah. I when I was watching Signs again, I was like, "Is this supposed to be funny?" You know, there are obviously oh, some moments that are supposed to be jokes, but I can't always tell whether this is supposed to be silly or not. It genuinely feels like he had someone go through the script and add in a joke per five minutes. Uh, sometimes <laughs> there's a cluster. It's kind of surprising. I think it's been commented on a couple of times before we've started this up uh, fully. But like it's, it, there are lots of jokes. Um, even the you know the part where they believe the the people the the Wolfington brothers or whatever have come back to fuck with them, and then the whole sequence of the setup is kind of amusing with the camera you know closing in on them as they're deciding their plan to deal with them, and how Mel Gibson's yeah. like oh, I I don't I don't know how to be angry or swear. What do you mean? And there's like an awkward back and forth, and then they do the running, and he's like I'm insane with anger. It's like that's that's yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, somewhat. Yeah, that's kind of fun. And then, um, and then yeah. we it's... switch immediately to like horror of how the hell did it get up there? And then sounds it's making, and then being like, wait, maybe this is a lot more than we thought it was. And it's like, this, this is kind of bold of you to turn, try and balance that way. I'm almost impressed. Yeah, there are moments that I think the tonal whiplash actually does kind of work, and then much of the movie does not. I think, but there are a couple genuinely amusing moments. One, it, it, it's. It's all in the presentation. I can't quite tell whether it's supposed to be funny, but okay, he goes outside, Mel Gibson does, and the dog is barking, and then he kind of snaps, tries to attack Mel Gibson, goes back to barking at the corn, and he says, Isabel, you're going to feel real silly when this all turns out to be make-believe. Like, I like that line. It's funny. Right. It's so, strange. Oh, I actually quite oh, I didn't even that. register that as a joke. I thought that I was just see that, trying... Is, is that seeing, supposed is, to be a joke? I don't know, but well, it's kind I, of funny. Oh, okay, because for me, I was like, I just thought he was just trying to, he was saying that for him, for himself. Well, definitely, yes, but I don't, uh, something about the line did make me laugh. I was going to say, I, I think that's totally fair that it. it's both of those. I think that it could easily be seen as funny that he's, uh, he's talking to the dog about its fear of the cord, but he's really talking about his own. 
you know but at the same yeah. time it's it's gradually getting us into what i think is probably one of the strongest scenes in the film i actually cr really like the the way that he makes it really creepy going through each section of the the cornfield so like the yeah, yeah. the narrow so to speak hallways and then the going through it directly where it's just entirely claustrophobic but then to get the um the full crop circle space which actually feels in some ways worse better and worse at the same time right more clarity of vision but that open emptiness and no sounds it's just like kind of creepy and then, and then i quite like the way that he sort of comes to realize that that he's confidently like you fuckers messing around with my corn you know you're not going to get anything from this and then it's just sort of like dot 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 and then wait maybe that isn't what's happening i'm gonna leave yeah i, I like, like um <laughs> Some of I, I'm very mixed on the protagonist. Uh, a lot of the stuff he does, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. That feels like a human thing to do. This seems like a pretty good thing to say. And then a lot of the times, I'm also like, what uh, are are you an alien or, or is like you just being weird? But then a lot of people just act weird, and a lot of the conversations are just super weird. But when I catch him doing some things, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That that's a reasonable thing to do. I would expect him to do that. But then we get I the think, opposite um... as well. So. I think the the scene that you're talking about, Mauler, probably has my favorite, I guess, ooh, spooky alien moment in the film with uh the alien's legs sort of poking out next to all of the uh all of the wheat and then it moves. It's like a it's it's like a, a fairly good I get because I I don't like calling it a jump scare because it doesn't have any of the crazy loud sound effects accompanying it. It's a very much a mm -hmm. you're in the moment after all of the suspense has been built up across the scene. For something that is very small, blink and you'll miss it moment. But if you see it, you're like, "Oh shit, that's that's like kind of spooky." Um, that's that's what I mean. It, well, it um, was like occasionally decently spooky in my view. I quite thought like the one the shot of him at the back, and it you know reaches in a bit closer, and the sounds that we know they make start to play pretty close, as though they're in your ear. And then yeah, and that's then he drops it, the flashlight. Yeah, like it's 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 really effective that the alien was that close to him. And looking at him, and like you know, but he doesn't understand what's happening. Basically, like filmmaking. You yeah, know, it's the place of the I mean. camera, the, the movement of the camera. There is talent happening here that uh, makes it almost impossible to say that Shyamalan like has nothing going for him. It's like no, th no, it, yeah, this is too intentional. It's too deliberate, and it's 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 like clever, good use of the medium. It's just unfortunate sometimes, yes. when you get <laughs> sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think his strengths in early in his early filmmaking are his camera work, um, his and his sparing use of music and sound design. Like he obviously has a good score by James Newton Howard here, but like there's scenes where there's just no score, no stingers, and it's just the the quietness of the house, like the the pantry scene, most notably for me. Like I thought that was really well done, and there's no stingers, no scoring. And he knows where in within the sequence of shots of a scene, he knows where to put the scare for maximum effect. Um, like the 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 leg going into the cornfield is another good example of that. I like in the pantry where he's uh, puts the knife under and he's like checking the reflection of the blade oh, to yeah, see where he is in the room. Cool. And that there's was, like, uh... there's no music, there's no stingers, and you don't see him in the reflection, but you're waiting for it. It's like, oh, is he going to like suddenly show up and go blah, but he doesn't. And he pulls a knife out because he's just like too freaked out. It's like, fuck, I know there's something in there, but I don't know where yeah, it is. is that, that feels like a good example of kind of like the problem with the film is that that as an individual like uh, shot and idea is pretty cool. But the overarching situation of, oh, there's an alien locked in there. How'd that happen? <laughs> like, that is yeah. There's there's an overwhelming amount of that in this film because yeah. even the idea this is what I mean about his ideas in general having a shadow moving behind that door and then Mel Gibson saying hello, hello? and the shadow just stops moving it's like mm -hmm. that's creepy that's really uh, good that is, yeah yeah the little things really yeah it's 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 got those little bits and they're kind of sprinkled. But we need more than a sprinkling, you know. It well, needs yeah. to be I think, more. I, I guess the thing would be that I think that there's a decent amount of these throughout the film. It's just that the longer the film goes on, the broader context of the story starts to work against um, these sorts of moments. Where it's like, yeah, yeah, individually it's cool, but what's happening in the story right now, in terms of everything that made this happen, is starting to get to be like, 
Okay, all right, we're, we're starting to... Rep I mean, I feel like the clearest example is the dog part, right? Because I imagine in his mind, he's like, oh, that'll be like a really cool scare, but the problem is afterward, it's like, dude, they left their dog out there? Are you serious? Do you want to explain, <laughs> just in case, just context? Oh, uh, well, they've got their dog. Uh, they have a dog, and um, you later don't. on in the film... That's right, but for most of the film, it's just the one doggo. And then uh -huh. later on in the film, for whatever reason, they essentially conclude... All right, we're going to fight the aliens by locking ourselves, like, in the house and barricading the house up. And they do that, and they're like, oh, wait, the dog. And then the dog gets killed by the aliens. It's almost like it's, um, it's all... worse, mm -hmm. sort of, in the... They say, we're going to have dinner, then we'll get the dog uh, put up into the, the... I think he says the garage, like, the... Or the so basement, it, something like it, that. The implication being, of course, we need to get the dog uh, in some form of safety, because it will be exposed and then they forget about the dog and they explicitly say like whoops we forgot about the dog and it's clearly <laughs> in aid of creating a payoff which um, is basically that with, with uh no visual it zooms in on the wall as you hear the dog bark and then it gets killed by the aliens this is like a gordon from two uh from 2012 moment for me this is just one of those things that happens in a movie that like really 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 annoys me on like a very visceral level, like you forgot your dog and you left it out there to get killed by these aliens. Like that really sucks <laughs> like for you none guys. Of you. It's kind of yeah, it's a family you dog. Yeah, yeah, it's your dog. And, and it seems like a there. reasonably easy thing to fix because they, they've already established that the dogs are you know, quite violently scared, and like they've already had to put one dog down essentially because it did attack them. Like, yeah, I, I think you could have got away with forgetting about it if you'd simply said, "Well, we we tried to get it in." And I will show them try to get it in. It just won't be controlled anymore because it's so madly fearful. You know, it just attacks them and bites them. So they have to leave it. That would be a sad moment you as opposed to a, oh, lol, we forgot to bring it in. We're too busy <laughs> making five different dinner options. That no, that <laughs> it's the last that supper. Took, that had to have taken a while. Yeah. They didn't. Yeah. That's fucking pissed me off when people make food and they don't eat it. <laughs> well, because just to uh, back up what Frankie was saying, it's like, yeah, they had absolutely had the exact same experience of like, oh, wow, there's so much to celebrate here in terms of how he's using subtlety for horror. We don't see any of it. We simply hear it, and then we see the uh, the shadows moving with the light. We, we hear the sounds of the footsteps. You hear the wind chimes moving as the aliens are passing. It's like, these are all really great ways of using our imagination. How the fuck did you leave the dog out there, guys? What the hell? Like, Yeah. yeah. That's wild, man. It just A lot of the... <laughs> Subtly effective moments in isolation with the aliens are ruined by me going, okay, what do the aliens want? What are they doing? Why are they doing this? Why are they oh, doing that? Why are they here? Don't worry, they made it explicit, uh, at least as far as this movie goes. Uh, I almost think they explained too much, or rather, their, the movie's opinions on the aliens were cringe. Like, uh, uh, I don't know that like we have enough information. and stuff, and well, so the... Things they that read they a book for whatever reason. They read a book that tells them there's only two reasons aliens would ever encounter Earth: one for exploration and two for hostile reasons. And it's like, well, what about all the other reasons? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, 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 from, of <laughs> reasons <laughs> between those two, yeah. <laughs> it almost, um, I feel, is a little bit insulting to the whole concept of fucking sci-fi. It's like, why would you suggest? We've got a billion stories about all kinds of reasons we end up uh, with close encounters with aliens of any kind. Why? Would why are you suggesting that? And you know exactly why it's suggesting that. It's because the audience is supposed to go, oh, geez, I hope it's exploration and not hostility. And then yeah, the film later is like, it's hostility. Yeah, they want to set up this dichotomy. Yeah. 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 I, I, I can as, understand. As if we needed to be, like, wary of alien potential invaders. Like, the film felt the need to really clumsily try and set up a dichotomy of the only two possible things. When, obviously, if aliens show up like this, people will be concerned about their intentions. You don't have to do this clumsy setup. Well, to the point Whatever where they, they look at an image of a burning house that's just like their house, and then they point out that looks just like our house, and then there's three bodies <laughs> being a dad and two kids. They're like, oh, wow, look at that. And then he's like, okay, we should stop looking at that. That, that to me felt like, was this a comedy beat? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, that's the thing. There's a lot of moments like that. I can't tell how farcical it's trying to be. I think yeah, I well, the, the role about... comedy plays in this movie is one of the strangest things about it. I mean, especially considering, like, if you watch the special features, he describes it in terms of genre as horror drama. And it's like, with the amount of comedy beats you've written intentionally and unintentionally into this script, it's like, it's... I have a hard time believing you don't think comedy is an essential component 
of the genre here. It's yeah, it's pretty clearly meant to be like a partial comedy. He did say in an interview, I think it was in 2020, like, like he actually sat down and was committed to making this as cheerful and optimistic in every single element as he could possibly do. So like, it's an odd one anyway, because you're taking the premise of effectively like alien invasion threatening the end of the world, which doesn't sound like the most cheerful thing in the world. Um, <laughs> but he apparently sat down and said, I'm going to every time like there's a scene which seems like it's getting too sad or it's too serious, I'm going to make it nice and lighthearted. Every time I feel like the shoot's going terribly, I'm going to pull myself through it by having fun. Like he, I, he sort of passed it in this sort of rediscovering faith in his in himself kind of thing. Um, and obviously like, unfortunately but like, well, and I, it comes after 9 11 as well and so that you have the all bad things happen for a reason motif that comes in which again is always snapping it back to we can't be too dour and serious and and miserable about this we do have to keep keep on carrying on be be nice be cheerful be chipper about it it's so weird mm -hmm. to hear you say that he said that considering like how we just talked about how he wrote it to where they forgot their dog and heard it get murdered by aliens. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like why? That's not very cheery. You could have just had the dog with him, like a normal family, like a normal human being would be like, oh yeah, my, my faithful canine well, companion, as, as... Our, our our family well, you member. You could have done the, the dog. thing in, in the day after tomorrow. We were talking about Roland Emmerich on my mind because Gordon still upsets me. But you know, the homeless guy in the day after tomorrow, his dog and that dog survived. That you, dog you can, was in danger, and he got out of it. As Little Platoon yeah, highlighted, you, you can I want it to live. you can write it so that payoff still happens. You just didn't you didn't need to make the family look like all four of them forgot they the just dog. Didn't care about their dog? Yeah, that they didn't care. It's weird. It's Anybody who has a family good. dog of many years, that's not a thing. At least it's a very unlikely thing. Um, and it's it's like a missed opportunity as well, right? Because everyone loves caring, it, watching people care for dogs because it's something that we can associate with. Everyone typically does. Um, yeah. They could have successfully put it in the garage. They could have locked it up and then they could have heard, the, like with, with great struggle, right? Because the dog was very aggressive. They could have heard the aliens go there first and they can just have to sit there listening, knowing they couldn't have the dog with them. But if they if only they could because they could have protected it. Like, you know, something sad so, the, the, the also works about the desperation. But it's so awkward. I know that we're spending some time on this. It's just that it it has an effect. He wrote it that way. <laughs> he wrote that to be the way that he not. He wrote it to be the way that it was. And he wrote it in a way that seems about, pathetic. It's, it's just that when there's like a massive sort of disconnect in like a recognition of what's happened. Because, I mean, to explain it again, the reason why the Gordon thing in 2012 always annoyed me was because that guy, like, came through so many times in that film. Mm. None of the characters would have survived without him. Um, he was actually, like, a pretty good lad, and he gets the worst death possible, and they immediately move on from it. They basically say, replace Gordon's him. Gordon's worse him. than this, because at least Gordon's the film acknowledges this. how sad yeah. this is. <laughs> yeah, like, they just completely <laughs> move on from Gordon. It's just like, yep, you get crushed to death in some gears. Anyway, you're replaced by, like, it always annoyed me, and this is another one of those, it just annoys me of this disconnect of, do you not, do you not, like, understand that people value dogs a lot, or, like, what, you know what I mean? It's like, do you, mm -hmm. Did you just not get that this might, would, this well, would just um, be perplexing and bizarre? This is kind of throughout, because I was just thinking, before they, uh, at least after their meal, they're still boarding up the whole house, uh, uh, Mel Gibson walks close to outside, I don't know how much time has passed, but... He's listening to the crickets, and they just stop. Like, the, the crickets mm -hmm. in total. I was like, oh, that's creepy. But then I was also like, but... Wait, what does that mean? Like, the, the aliens the wiped out the crickets? The, aliens. the crickets are scared of the aliens? <laughs> well, what's you know, weird I think is that it... crickets fear man, but whenever dudes walk around outside, the crickets aren't like... <laughs> well, they do when you get close. So I started like an individual might if you get really close to it incidentally, but not all of them in totality. That's that's the yeah, way it's it to me. They it sense something. To, it's a trope, right? Because like what they're doing, and it's the same thing with the dogs at the beginning. You know, all the animals in the entire town are acting strange. It's just like I think he's seen it in other horror movies where animals have a preternatural sense that a bad thing is happening, and so they act bizarrely. Um, it's it's just a way of conveying the tonal shift, I, I guess. It's just no, it doesn't make sense. But like we've seen it before, dogs bark at Terminators. That's sort of the yes, thing. We do. Doing. We yeah. can, There's some about them. You could tell. It's the eyes. It's the eyes, boy. Yeah, I I wonder if that much thought was put into it beyond it just being a spooky sound design thing. Like, ooh, that's a bit weird. 
Um, but like, if you had to explain it, I would think maybe it's like one of the cloaked ships is like hovering over and it's emitting something that's making all the crickets. I thought, I thought shut maybe up. it was implying like, that somewhat because the is it the aliens that knock out human communication temporarily or whatever with the uh, like the television doesn't have any signals anymore. Yeah, I assumed it was the aliens that did that. I, I would assume so too, because I could. That's one of the ones I could believe, like the cricket stuff and some of the animal things, and like okay, I can believe that the aliens would wipe or, or stop or stall or do something to mess with our communication broadcasting. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty reasonable. Can we talk about like, okay. what the aliens want and what they're doing? Yes, um, you know what? <laughs> it was that's said that point. they came to harvest us. They came to collect humans to harvest. That's apparently... That was one guy on the radio's theory when it became obvious that they weren't trying to take over the entire planet. Oh, yeah, why not... would you start at a random farm and in... I'm not saying the, the middle of nowhere. Like I said earlier, yeah. like I, I think the the film's opinions on the aliens are cringe. Like I, I don't know that we could conclude fucking anything from what we saw. Really, in fact, there's a lot. We'll we'll get to that. But like the the nature of that radio thing, yeah, is he says that they had a poison that they secrete that essentially knocks out people and then they drag them away. Uh, they wanted to harvest them for something. That's the theory, and that they all left once a weakness was found. Which in this Some case, people in the Middle East found a primitive means of defeating them, which I imagine involved like water pistols, <laughs> some melee weapons, Super and soaker. locking them in a room. Water balloons as grenades. Well, I had an issue with even that line. The idea that on the radio they said, oh yeah, over in the Middle East, they found out that there's a primitive way to defeat them, but no more details. It was like, how, how did you learn A without learning about what A was? Yeah, what was the primitive thing? Yeah. Let's go. How, how, what did they say? <laughs> All the people in the Middle East were there. Well, like, we don't yes, speak Arabic, we have, so we don't know. <laughs> we have discovered a primitive way of defeating the aliens. <laughs> Goodbye. Isn't that what happens <laughs> like, in Independence Day? <laughs> what are you doing? Like, help us out, Hakeem. Also, there's not a lot of water in the Middle East, depending on where you are. So, like, it's an odd, it's weird to make it that specific. Yeah, yeah. you'd think that they'd What's be that? like, yeah, all the people, all the aliens around Seattle are just melting. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't think the movie makes it like super explicit what exactly they're there for, but it does that thing where there's a scene where a multitude of options are expressed. Well, and the last sinister one that is mentioned is the one that the audience is meant to be like, oh, that's why they're here. They're harvesting people. I will say for the cast today, we'll, we'll be discussing a lot of things. If you're aware of a newfangled theory about this film, uh, don't share it yet and don't look at chat. Chat has already mentioned it a couple of times. We'll get to it. We'll talk about it. Uh, there's, there's a, this is part of why I wanted to talk about this film. There is a, a point of view about this film that changes a lot of how you can make sense of certain things that happened. We will talk about it, but we're going to talk about it as though the film is taken for what everyone has talked about it for years first, uh, which is what we're doing. The alien right is now. Bruce Willis. My God. Time. Oh my goodness gracious. He sees Earthlings. And so, uh, yeah, like the, 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 the so much about it is baffling and uh we've i guess the the primary issue as we've come to it now with not only the motivation of the aliens but uh their their weaknesses they just don't seem to make much sense at all they're um it's very difficult they're to staggeringly take incompetent um <laughs> and the only way that they can work for the payoffs in the film is by nerfing them entirely from what they would obviously be if they well, were yeah, interstellar creatures if they were able to Exactly. If they're able to travel across the stars in massive spaceships, it's like, okay, so they do that, and then they got on Earth and run around naked, just going... <laughs> like, just run yeah, around, no weapons, no equipment, <laughs> nothing at all. It is funny, the idea that we invade a planet, go down this, strip off the astral clothing, <laughs> and just run around going, boo! <laughs> like... <laughs> well, um, that is, unfortunately, one of the things that... Well, the thing that undermines a lot of the scares in the movie is just like like you were saying, like they they have traveled intergalactically, they have cloaking on their ships, but then they exit their ships on foot and they're just fucking running around. Well, and, and <laughs> on a planet that is our equivalent of if you went to like Venus, I guess without the atmospheric pressure, but you know, it's like it rains acid, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, all right, that's not a, a great in, planet. It's... Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there are like little young aliens called teasers, and all they do is fly around the galaxy landing at like abandoned or like distant farmsteads to troll people, basically. They have no reason to be there. They just land <laughs> to, to scare people and they fly off again. And that's where all that myths come from. It's kind of how the aliens act, because like 
there is no one that's settled more, motive, that's and that's what believable. they want you to think. It I is more believe believable. that aliens, like sapient creatures, just like they just want to fuck around and have some fun, but they're not trying to piss off the rest of the aliens because they're like, you oh, know, you can't be doing that. It was like, yeah, but we're gonna. It's because it's funny to see the the weird Earthling people. You know, I think the point is that it. you can't reconcile the motives of the aliens, and that's what the film is quite happy to do, because then it gets you thinking, well, I don't necessarily know, but the theme is everything must happen for a reason, right? Have faith that it's all for something. You don't ever have to explain what that thing is, because if they're only there to harvest people, they don't reveal themselves by floating ships over massive cities. They can just yes. pick people up from abandoned farmsteads. Oh, gosh, if they're yes. there to invade, then they don't land mm -hmm. at abandoned farmsteads, and they do something else, and they actually use weapons. Like yes. the, the, you, These two things are fundamentally in contradiction, but the film wants you to think, well, I don't necessarily necessarily understand i just have to have faith that they're doing well, the, something the, the film that's how shyamalan that, writes um this the have crop circles i'm writing this for a reason the film assures us the crop circles are for navigation allowing the ships to coordinate it's like why would they need that and why would they well, yeah, do that it reveals um, that there's something weird going on to the population of this planet why would you do that as revealed by the events of the film where it clues us in yeah. <laughs> something weird happening when all these crop circles show up it's like yeah well, let's just be clear thing. you guys can cross the galaxy to find a little planet which is like pinpoint accuracy across unconceivable distances but you need to make massive symbols in cornfields in order to coordinate going to places on the planet fuck off I don't know. That's that. <laughs> no. Stop undermining everything you're trying to do with this movie by making me constantly second guess everything about the film's antagonistic force. Well, and mm -hmm. um, with the... it's it's weird because um, the film like it it does a lot. A lot of the film, you know, there, there's all those scenes trying to establish. Oh, what's the deal with the aliens? What do they want? What are they after? But at the same time, the film doesn't want you to think too much about like the aliens and what they're actually up to. Because when you do, then you're less focused on the suspense of any situation and more just, why would they do that? Why are they doing this? Why are they making that choice? Why are they doing that? Why are they being so dumb? And that's, that's, it's, it's throughout the entire film because there's so many different accounts of what people in this universe believe about the aliens. And some of it's like reasonable, like they might be here for this, they might be doing that, maybe we should do this or that. And a lot of it's just like, you, you're just like talking shit, you're just making stuff up that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The, um... The carrot Ray, uh, Ray is his name, right? Uh, the the M Night Shyamalan plays. Yeah. Uh, he's like, I noticed that a lot of these uh, the, the, these crop circles aren't near water, so I think they don't like water. I'm like, what? Uh, uh, that was what? a leap. What? <laughs> it's a leap. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. what? Did you write this movie? Oh shit. Um, he but, did. Like, he did write this movie. <laughs> so there's so there are like elements of that. I see people saying things, and I'm like, you're just you're why? Well, Would so you say that one that's I think huge. Uh, when discovering the aliens are real, like Mel Gibson <laughs> chops the fucking fingers off of one of them, he doesn't tell anybody really about the fact that he's got an alien cornered right now. He doesn't call the police. He doesn't immediately decide as a fucking American farmer that I will get my shotgun and keep it with and me throughout the rest of this movie. Or whatever, yeah. uh, they don't decide to leave. They think it's safer to stay in their weaponless fucking house. Even though they established that the the landings happen close to the crop circles, yeah, we're, th th yeah. Th this this is this was part of sort of the movie where I was just like, none of this would happen. Sorry. Um, so, two things, I guess. First off, someone in chat said they also didn't land near lava, which is true. But I actually think <laughs> that lava is a weakness of theirs. It probably so is. That yes, one checks that's out. Probably true. Lava probably is one of their weaknesses. Um, it's one of it's one of mine. If you guys are trying to, if you you're trying to get me. Uh, lava is one of my weaknesses, so keep that in mind. I'll give you that one for free. Uh, and someone else has said, um, which I was actually kind of wondering if someone would bring it up, but uh, perhaps they've, they've done it for me. Uh, they said that the movie isn't about the aliens, but the problem is that it is about the aliens on a very deep and intrinsic level, because if it wasn't the aliens, then like there wouldn't be... The pay you, you can't have the payoff either plot-wise or thematically without the aliens. Well, we've, we've dealt with this the, before. It's, we've, I assume they're saying it's not about the text, it's about the subtext. And it's like, sorry, we care about probably, the text as well. But, like, yeah. but also, even subtextually, um, in order to get that execution, you have to essentially you invent a wild... Through the text? Well, you have to create a very bizarre scenario like this in order to get payoffs like the one that the film wants to say yeah, for that sure. it has. 
Well, it's gonna... Any other, it's, it's gonna be one of my issues when we start talking about the thematics of it we're gonna have some huge issues i feel with how this was set up how it mm -hmm. was executed and even what it's trying to say uh to the point where this may be one of those movies where i just like vehemently disagree with what the movie's trying to say and i would i would add to that that the movie is concerned with the aliens. You could have an alternate version of this movie where they know even less, they encounter the aliens even less, and it's just about how people react to the prospect of the end of the world, right? You could you could make that movie, but this movie is very much concerned with having spooky scenes with the aliens. So what the aliens do, how they operate, and what they're after does matter quite a bit. The, the climax of this movie is like a home invasion, so it really matters why they're trying to invade the home. Um, I think it's really weird that if they simply had one guy in this house that had like two pistols and a shotgun, uh, all the aliens would have been dead. Well, I was waiting for that moment. I was waiting for that moment. It was like, oh, the the old the, the rural farmer in the when was this movie made? The late nineties or mid nineties? Two thousand two. Two thousand two. Okay. Um, I was like, okay, where where's the scene where he gets out the shotgun, but the but he doesn't have shells for it, or he drops it down the stairs. Or like where yeah, like because yeah. obviously that's coming right and they never do and like well, oh okay, you'd even well. expect a a comedy beat where he asks a friend to bring in some weapons for home defense and the guy says sure and he arrives in his pickup truck and it's just fucking stacked to the brim with with every weapon you could imagine he's like yeah I just brought a few for you to choose from you know that sort of thing yeah the whole <laughs> I've been waiting for this my whole life yeah the like a... <laughs> Ironsides character from <laughs> yes what was it? yeah extraterrestrial Super, uh, extraterrestrial yeah you know that character. Well, the crazy man who was right all along. Yeah. Well, and, and the fact that, like, it, it wasn't too difficult to chop off its fingers with a kitchen knife. Um, it was conspicuously easy, as if they don't have bones or and something. And then, of course, uh, the effectiveness of hitting it with a bat. Um, it's just like, it makes me think that, yeah, shotgun's gonna fuck these things up. Well, to be fair, it helps when they don't fight back in any way whatsoever, and they just stand there and allow you to beat them to death. So you know what? Helpful. You're right. <laughs> that does help. You know, they they didn't even need the weapon. Just get a stick and kill well, the no, aliens. Their plan they is so die. frustratingly shit that I think the film benefits greatly from trying to distract you from ever thinking about it, and instead focusing on some dialogue that I actually quite like. The way Mel Gibson tries to reassure his family as the house is basically coming apart. Um, yeah, it's it's good. The, like that stuff, I like character wise, but plot wise, just like what was your plan? You boarded up the doors, and then you're like, oh no, they got in. Well, well let's GG. Let's be, let's be fair. He boarded up all of the doors very well, except for the front door, which got a single board on. Yeah, that's funny. That's weird. Uh, that's not, a little. Well, strange. not to mention they they just they blanked the attic as an entrance. Like, how, why? Like, <laughs> why? why I, do you... And I the think coal I can... shoot? What? What is that? What that's, is... that's how the coal gets down into the basement. For the, no, the... I mean, I, I'm more focused on how they forgot about that entirely. I feel like if your I only sole I focus can... is any and all entrances into the house, uh, the attic should be accounted for. I think yes. so too. I'm on that point where it's like, I think I can believe they for didn't think about boarding up the attic door in the stress of it, but at the same time, I'm also thinking, but wouldn't the stress of it accentuate that you need to do it? It's I think the this only is, concern they had. Where... The, I know, the but... addressing of the attic was actually in a deleted scene. They push a bookcase underneath the door, and it stops it from opening. But then the door gets smashed so hard that the bookcase breaks, I think. Hmm. But that whole thing was uh, taken out. I think it was between the kitchen and the basement scenes. Maybe they were like, oh, we can't portray them smashing a door because then that would be the movie being... Well, like, let's put it this way, right? <laughs> the, 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 we've, we've got a lot of prep time for the aliens coming. What do we do? Board up the windows and doors. Okay, they do it. That gets defeated in the first, like, two minutes. And then Mel Gibson's already at the point of, like, I'm not ready to die. It's like, that was the plan. That was all we had. <laughs> it's already, like, yeah. fucked. Yeah. Kind of uh, undermines his character a bit for me, too, that he's not willing to go a bit further to try and protect his family. Well, if we've got an axe in the basement, let's go grab that. It'd be nice to have. There's clearly a baseball bat on the wall right there. Maybe we should have that handy. Yeah, like, it's uh, it's especially difficult to buy. I just feel like it, it, not only are these aliens very weak to being killed, um, <laughs> but, like, they had to nerf the American farming family hardcore in order to make this scary, or at least try to make it, like, have tension. 
because uh, the aliens are so easy to defeat, right? There's a lot of fiction with sci-fi where the aliens are immune to bullets, have suits, have technology, have make it so so that like we're just we're not able to stop them. But these yeah, aliens, super subversive or something like that, a body snatchers sort of thing going on. There, I think that's uh, that's something this movie was sorely lacking in the alien department. Other than basic logic, common sense, and believability, there was nothing clever, really, about kind of any of it. Um, you watch a lot of alien movies, and you watch a lot of monster movies, and I'm thinking there's the you, we it's got it's that opportunity cost for storytelling where we didn't we, we we've missed so much in terms of making a cool, interesting alien invasion type story, but nothing interesting happens. Like, oh, this one walked around in this outside of a birthday party. Like, oh, okay. I, I don't know why he was doing that. I do he enjoy it. fucking pants on. This is a kid's party. I do enjoy it in retrospect. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's just running around being like, what's going on? Oh, there's a little party they're having. He's walking oh. around. Oh, hey, look, kids. Uh, good thing I've, uh, I'm naked. Uh, but we also have, like, oh, I, they just, like, they hover over the cities. But then during the day, they turn invisible. Like, okay, um... Any, we're gonna do. Are we gonna do anything? No, it's just like what they did. They just did that. It's like okay, so they want us to know we're here. Um, all right. Uh, anything from the military? Is there anything like public service announcements on what you might maybe should do? Um, no, nothing like that. It's a very. It's, it gets very kind of skipped uh, over, like I said, for the sole intention I think of creating the tension of. Uh, my yeah. God, will we make it? I don't know because um, it's a farm. You're going to need. Certainly, uh, all kinds of shop items will be on a on a farm for all kinds of reasons. But of course, most farmers, as far as I'm aware of, need to have a gun for a hell of a lot more than home defense. Like that's not even necessarily yeah, why home they offense have one. for the farmers. Yeah, the other farmers that they compete with. They've got to protect their livestock. There's a lot of uh, reasons to have a gun that go beyond your yeah, interest. Yeah, coyotes in... and stuff yeah. like that out there, and and, uh... and just as a hobby. But one thing as well that this movie, I don't see, I don't think we gain much by having a really terrible, like, entire Earth civilization invasion when it could have just been some aliens fucking with his family in the middle of nowhere with their farm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that this film would have been much better if we completely cut out the fact that all of Earth is being invaded or whatever, and it was just this family dealing with, like, if you're, if you're in that scenario and you wake up one day and there's this elaborate massive crop circle out on your field you that would that would potentially be like oh shit what the hell's happening and then they investigate the crop circles it was done so quickly it was done without a sound there was no lights look at the way that the corn is bent over and how no, none of it's broken like people couldn't have done this um who would want to do this to you oh there's nobody it's like oh then you get all the, the the weird stuff with the signals on the baby monitor you get all the strange things like maybe animals are acting a little bit strange or maybe they're barking at nothing or you know things of that nature and you don't lose anything with a sort of sense of paranoia and apprehension that might come with this sort of thing you just remove a whole bunch of terrible plot baggage that could have been used for better things in this movie especially if you're trying to tell some yeah, story and it makes you want to as um, thematics as this one does as to moving sort of just parts of the movie around like uh they are for whatever reason discussing something relatively late at night and uh you know not maybe they have an argument but maybe it's also just for some kind of meme that they make a very loud noise in the house and they're silent after it and then you hear the scuttering at the top because they like freaked out the alien they, they were like worried that something was happening and but for, from their pov they're just like what the fuck is that what makes that kind of sound and um, all of these pieces of evidence being given to the police, if ever they filed a report, would be like, okay, like, <laughs> what are you saying? And yeah, then, you know, it's th some of the some of the beats will be a little bit standard, but it's because a lot of the times they just make sense and they work. First time they think, oh, it's maybe it's a prank. Then maybe it gets escalated a little bit, and they think, oh, there must be some animal. Maybe it's some wild boar or some hog, or maybe there's like a mountain lion or whatever is out there. And then it get, escalates a little bit more and a little bit more to the point where the family, like the dad, right, he gets really protective and really suspicious about things. And he starts, from the perception of other people, acting really strange and weird. And everyone's, uh, you know, Meryl's there and he's like, yo, like, I know weird stuff's going on, but you got to calm down. And, and you can have that sort of, mm -hmm. you know, the dynamic there. 
to um, the earlier point that because like one of the things i do quite like about the film and the way that it does build atmosphere is the fact that it is sort of world encompassing I, I like the 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 usual when you you put all the people watching the news and it's these strange unexpected and unexplained phenomena because like that compounds the crisis of faith like you know your entire world has been shattered on the personal level you have the death of the wife but then everyone's world is now being shattered and all their assumptions are being undermined by this completely unexplained and worldwide phenomena and it gives this massive sense of scale and then you get that sort of if you can keep your head while all around are losing theirs kind of beat I, to my mind the, the, the film goes wrong when it just makes them hostile i uh, keep the 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 worldwide consequences of the thing but make i think it, that's what like, all about people's responses to that i would be i'd sort of be loath to lose the worldwide aspect just to focus on the family because i think the family's reaction to the worldwideness of it is kind of pivotal to it i'm, I'm with you, you on that. that i assume that the, the the we're trying to fix the issue of how badly the aliens have been executed if they focus yeah. if the aliens were only interested in this family some of it like if, isn't that what extraterrestrial does actually they do family by family by family i think is the logic in that point. as i i think so i think a number of movies do that um where because because it expects to be like oh yeah the aliens wouldn't want to like reveal themselves to yeah. the civilization they would want to pick a family in the middle of nowhere where there aren't other, any other people around so they could do this kind of covertly and they'll do their little reconnaissance and scanning and that kind of thing. So it's, there's a reason why it's, it's, it's somewhat standard at least. Because I can buy the, the, there's plenty we can work with, with even having it be a worldwide event, but only having the POV of a family. I get that. I think that can work as well. Um, yeah. Now I, I will agree with Platoon that I will agree with you that the element of, in fact, I, while we were watching the movie, it was thinking, you know, in my head, I was kind of thinking about this idea of you have this family, this story similar to this, where there's some worldwide um, event slash catastrophe, not like apocalypse, but some something's going on in the world. And we never see that. We only see the effects that it has on our like our, our protagonist family. And that is the world building. Yeah. Um, so this would probably be this like this would be a good movie premise where you could have, oh, there's a bunch of aliens and stuff around all over the planet, but really it's just how does this family react to that sort of thing? What preparations are made? Which is another thing I felt this movie was sorely lacking in, is for all of this talk that the movie has about, is this the end of the world? Are things going to go to shit? Are we going to get invaded and whatnot? There is no sense of we need to stockpile some food. We need to get ourselves some weapons. We need to, you know, make some preparations. We need to do this, that, and the other thing. We need which toilet is paper. Kind of, we need toilet paper. <laughs> we have to have it. We can't just not have that. Um, but like an actual emergency where, you know, maybe the paranoia of other people, maybe some guy comes walking by and it's a scavenger and they're they're trying to like steal from other people and he's gotta be like, you know, I, I've got I bought my gun and his hands are trembling because he's an old priest and he doesn't want to have to shoot to protect his family but all oh, this guy is here but he just wants food and like what do you do in that scenario all the things that you could done I, I feel like we got a lot of wasted time here um and we could i don't know i don't, I don't want to just write a new story but i, I kind of want to write a new story <laughs> uh, yeah well, it's true a lot of screen time was wasted on comedy beats that don't work so yeah might as well be something like that well yeah i mean i would have liked more character for um Merrill, for example, and not in the sense of he walks into a store and someone declares what his whole history is. It's like oh, I God, was um yeah. we were getting really far into the movie and I was gonna ask you, man, remember when 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 the five star general in that rural recruiting office <laughs> uh, told him his history about the whole baseball batting and everything and the other guy was like, Yeah, but he struck out a lot too. And, and, and because he's like, oh, he just felt right to swing. He's like, what is this ever? Was that ever going to go anywhere? Or was that just wasting my time with being a weird scene? And hey man, it, swing it's away. Pay, I, yeah, it was just I, a setup for that thing. I yeah. don't even consider that like a. No, I, I agree with you. I, how is that a payoff? Like, like how, he, he always I swings. That we were going to get <laughs> character about because because in isolation, the idea of Meryl walking away from that saying like kind of semi under his breath, it all, you know, it it felt like it was right to swing you know it would felt wrong not to swing i'm like oh that's like an interesting kind of thing from him and how he maybe views life and in the world and opportunities and what he feels like his obligation should be to do and his his view on inaction and being passive but none of this happened because he had to be told to hit it with a bat the <laughs> alien yeah. so that's that all of that was a payoff to hit the ba to, to 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 be told to hit the alien with the bat 
Um, Which he shouldn't have needed to be prompted. People say he was, the he thing was with a staff, the stick. He was a staff sergeant, Rags. He's going to be very mad at I you know, if we I don't know, mention that. I know, He's joking. I know. Chat. Yes, I'm, I'm joking. He's not actually a five-star general because you only have five-star generals in wartime. But, right, it was just like he was so he was so he was pretty, adorned. And the way that he, he talked an was... He, he makes an impression. He, he makes it. He was... His performance like, is so odd. Some yeah. rural, like, army recruiting office. <laughs> and it's just like you have friggin' Douglas MacArthur in there. And I'm thinking, goodness, this seems like a waste of your talents. Uh, um, I like, I really, I really like the character because he was funny and silly. <laughs> and he talked in this weird way. You circle around on, uh, on Meryl with, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the theme, I suppose, or at least what I assumed was because it was made pretty explicit by the conversation they have on the uh, the sofa when they're, they're getting all spooked about what's happening. Um, there are two kinds of people. The the people who see signs, they think someone's looking out for you down, deep down, they feel someone's going to help them, they're filled with hope. Meanwhile, there's other people who see nothing, they're on their own, they're filled with fear, and uh, they don't think anyone's out there to truly help them. Who are you? What person are you? Which, which to Already, me was uniquely the, dissatisfying the to hear. Like, yeah, the yeah, I is uh, false. I think that this when I first watched it, it was one of those scenes where it felt really weird, but I couldn't put my fingers quite on why this scene felt weird. And a lot of it was more surface level stuff about it. it just felt really oddly written and acted a particular way. And I, I, I think that's down to the direction, a lot of the, you know, the acting and stuff. But uh. Um, it just, it doesn't, I don't think it works. It's not a, it's not how you would want to describe that, especially trying to be this thematic. You're like, you're very clearly trying to steer someone, someone towards a certain path thematically. And I don't think you're being fair to a side that wants to, it, like, if, if, if you talk about the side that doesn't believe in signs, that things are like maybe naturalistic, that there's an explanation for everything, that you can't rely on other people or otherworldly beings to save you or take care of you, and that yeah. you have to shore up in yourself this attitude of you need to take care of yourself and you need to take care of the people around you. You can't rely on external things to do that for you. That should be your responsibility. I, I think that framing that in such a negative light is... Um, well, obviously, I, I disagree with that immensely, but um, with what the character is saying, I would imagine that he would want to frame that in a very positive light. Seeing yeah, because he's, he's living that faith he's God. living that life, and then he yeah. describes it as you feel alone and you're filled with fear. It's like, well, there's nothing proactive about that. Like the the notion that there yeah. is nothing out there protecting us ultimately, but that doesn't mean we don't believe in certain things as as people who aren't of a particular religion, for example, or that I know it was mentioned earlier as a meme, but you can be somewhat spiritual without necessarily being fully religious. And then, of course, the uh, the faith you have in other people and the notion that you're not afraid of life because there's no overarching power that protects you. you you're, you're experiencing life and you expect those around you to uh, do what they can to help you and vice versa. You know, like, there's just no middle ground at all. It's you're alone and afraid, or you believe that there's no such thing as coincidence and that there is a higher power looking out for Everything you. Everything happens for a reason, yeah. Uh, like, which oh. I just don't... I... I, I depend... I'm not exactly certain with what M. Night is trying to more specifically say about this point of view, which is why, as we talk about it, as I said, I depending on how he wants to frame it and the direction he wants to go with it and why, I might legitimately really hate what this movie has to say. Um, I don't like the, like I don't want this to become some sort of like theological discussion. But I don't think it needs to be the way that because but a lot of the way that this stuff is framed is really unfair and kind of dishonest. I feel um, this. I mean, ultimately. The movie seems to be saying that, God, like, I don't know if it means to say this, but it, when I see this movie, I say like, oh, God killed your wife in a horrific, terrible, tragic accident so that when aliens invade, you'll think of some <laughs> things that will very strangely coincidentally allow you to get out of a scenario that some of those very problems put you in in the first place. And I think this is a mix of very bad writing and a very bad execution of a potential thematic. 
and I I really don't appreciate that uh, well, and, that kind of a message uh, to to try and get people engaged instead of automatically dismissing. Like, don't pull the oh you're you, you're like Reddit atheist. Yeah, like, no, no, your no, fedora. This... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, <laughs> as, but, as but a... the adults would like to talk about the thematics of this movie and its actual execution. So. Well, I, I don't think a, a person who has faith in any particular religion should find this story satisfying at all. It's um yeah. No, I I was just about to say that I feel like even if you loosely agree with what M Knight is trying to do, he still goes about it in a really terrible way. And the big the big problem for me is uh, the flashbacks to his wife, which a just ruin the momentum of the movie and they really suck. But b the implication that oh what she said that he thought was just you know neurons misfiring right before she died was actually uh, clues that were going to help him fight the aliens. That's so stupid. It's so that stupid. Is, so yeah, he, he, the, there's I, a lot of reasons why it's very, very stupid. Something that bothers me significantly about the scene is uh, it's visually very set up. The alien is holding the kid hostage. It's threatening the kid. And Mel Gibson's yeah. like, Meryl, don't move. Because any move toward it, it's going to act and more than likely kill the kid. We don't want that to happen. Poor Morgan. Okay. Then he has his flashback. And she says, tell Meryl to swing away. And so he looks over, <laughs> sees the bat. This film couldn't be more overt. It w like it will not yeah. allow you to misunderstand what is happening in this scene. And then he's like, "Hey, Meryl, swing away, Meryl, swing away." Which is so funny to me. Instead of just being like, uh, "Meryl, you know how we're not supposed to move because it might kill my child? Go hit it with the bat." It's like, yeah, what? And then of course, um, I think the enlightened take is, "Ah, but you're forgetting another layer, which is." She told him to do that because she was being told through God to deliver that message because God gave Morgan asthma in order to survive this encounter. That was the whole wow. reason he had asthma in the first place was to lock up the lungs so that the poison gas wouldn't reach them. You see, it's all intentional. And you can't help but be but like, I'm is... sorry, what the fuck are you been talking about? Well, Waller, that's, that specific point is I was thinking about it later. And that's kind of what really got my mind to rolling on this is that, oh, God gave your kid asthma because cause that's what he fucking does. All right. He <laughs> gives people asthma. All right. So he gave this kid asthma so that at this one particular time when he was grabbed by this one alien and it used its little wrist proboscis or whatever to spray poison at his face, his lungs had locked up because of the asthma. So it actually saved him. But the only reason that he was captured by the alien is because his asthma exactly. caused them to leave the basement prematurely so that he would get captured by the alien, right? right so the right, asthma yeah. is getting out of a situation that the asthma put him in. And we're not <laughs> even getting into the whole, if God didn't want him to get killed by the fucking aliens, then why did he not do one of the 10 trillion things that could have been done along the way yeah, to stop this from having happened at all? It's highly inefficient on the part of God, I think. There, there were probably slightly like more more direct means of getting there than having M. Night Shyamalan kill your wife so your yeah. wife can deliver a line. So your line can be remembered after a flashback in a scene which solves... Yeah, it's God could have done this a number of different ways, and he chose that one. And that's, um, that's an interesting one. I don't buy it as fulfilling his, like, his newfound faith in God again, forgiving God, understanding that God was there for him, that he shouldn't hate God, because... By killing his wife, he was able to save his like. Wh what I don't understand how this like makes God's plan uh easier to understand for Mel Gibson's character at like all. Like you had to kill my wife for that. My kids had to grow up motherless because of that. So uh, what? What? It's mysterious ways indeed. Yeah, like who are the aliens? God's fault as well, or no? Agents of God? <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Like, not had them invade. Could they have just? Well, gone what happened else, if the or... aliens, like when they came to a planet that is filled with a substance that melts them, if they wore like a spacesuit and had guns, then what? <laughs> yeah, there's there's it... so much about this that I get exactly what Shyamalan was trying to say, but I was like, holy fuck, dude, like. Swing away, Meryl. Like, what? Why wouldn't Meryl be inclined to do that anyway? He's like very. The, the bat the is bat. literally the only fucking weapon in this whole place, other than the axe they happen to find and don't take with them. Yeah. Well, like, like what he said at the recruiting office was, it felt wrong not to swing, and here he is at the end needing yeah, to you be know told what? that you should swing. If you cut out him saying "swing away, Meryl," and you cut out the flashback, and you just show Meryl 
looking over to the bat, knowing it's there, because of course he does, and then picks it up and it's uses his, it. Yeah. None of us would have been like, well, that didn't make sense. You no. know what I mean? <laughs> because why would you right, need the flashback yeah. to motivate You don't need them. any no. of it. Meryl would of course no. think I should get a weapon. It's a fucking alien trying to kill <laughs> my nephew. It's like, what? Yeah. yeah. It is, it, it's kind of a mark against them that he needs that weird prompting. When he should be so proactive in it, not just as a person, but with well, what and then what if the alien the didn't decide to poison Morgan, but instead just killed him, like scraped its claws yeah, well, that, into him? That's a that's the other version of this because when he says "swing away, Meryl," he might be like, "But he's holding him with exactly. like a knife to his throat." <laughs> I thought the whole reason we were staying away was so we wouldn't yeah, hit him. Had, you have to understand, I Mel. I'm not in your mind. I have not had the epiphany that you've had. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you are. <laughs> I don't know if you were losing your mind right now. And to be clear, if I could hear your epiphany, I really might not agree with it. So uh, maybe we should chill. So, what if the alien doesn't want to die and fights back? <laughs> like, I don't know, man. Well, this thing is what? Like nearly seven feet tall? And Meryl really hits big. it with the bat. But what if it actually had hit him and he just grabbed it or just fucked Meryl up? It'd be like, oh. Yeah, what if well... the alien did anything? But that's the thing. Cause... I think you can actually counter that with, well, God made Meryl win because this was what he was supposed to do. That's why he sent the signs to Mel Gibson. And it's just like, okay. This is all very strange well... to try and make sense of. Because obviously at this point, I'm treating God as a very much real entity in this world that. Well, because he's, he's implied the that film... he is. Yeah, the yeah. film is yeah. very, very deeply implying that a, a God is a real actual legitimate veritable agent that exists within the world that this is, is a setting literal deus ex machina i'm sorry to interrupt but it's no, no, the most right. literal no 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 of this isn't this isn't a deus ex machina this was set up years and years and years ago when he fucking killed Bill <laughs> i thought you were horrifically. gonna say it was set up absolute millennia ago <laughs> when god oh, made it he... <laughs> <laughs> well in genesis you see this is all set up it's all set no, up all right. i mean but but literally like it's god reaching in to be like oh no this all works this way because i said so and because i planned this all from the beginning like that's what's happening literally in the story yeah not even well, not even metaphorically yeah and you can you can make a case that it's actually n night Shyamalan is setting himself up as god which is well, so, so fucking ridiculous and maybe who... part of the meta humor that it's trying to do that it doesn't do so well Does like there's remember... that that scene where m night first gets introduced and they're all like that's him isn't it yeah. And at that point, the audience isn't given any context as to why they recognize him. So <laughs> the audience was... is going like, oh, what, what are we meant to see? Oh my God, it's like, M. Night. Oh, the director. That's the screenwriter. <laughs> it's the director. So in a way, it is sort of setting him up as the god of the movie. And then by the end, it's just like, oh, was, is that what he was doing? Like, It's ridiculous. Um, because it's very, it's very Does anyone remember the um, in Lady in the Water, his role in that film? M. Night? I am. I haven't no. seen the movie, but even I kind of know about how he has portrayed himself in that movie. A, a lot of people see Lady in the Water as his uh, opinion about movie critics coming up pretty embarrassingly. Correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, chat slash cast. Uh, there is a movie critic character who gets horribly killed in that film. Yes, <laughs> he, he sure does, pretty brutally. And then, of course, he was the. Uh, he's like. He's like the key to everything, uh, M. Night in that movie. He's the most important person in the world, right? I'm trying to remember exactly what his role is, but he's he's like super important. Um, yeah, I can't remember all the details. It's, uh, I, I just, just remember, all I remember it. Yeah, all I remember is being like, whoa. <laughs> like this, this is some cringe. We may very well do I a imagine... uh, Shyamalan I haven't arc seen someday. It. Sorry. I imagine I haven't seen it, but I imagine it's like the non-humorous version of like what Gremlins Two did with uh, the, the movie <laughs> critics getting eaten, or the one guy I can't remember which one. Indigo uh, says he's the um, he's the writing savior who will change the world with his works. Right, which yeah. he has in real life, sort of. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Getting back an to impression on many people. The the sort of themes of this movie where I, well, there's a moment that I actually felt were, was pretty strong in terms of, I don't know what you might call the message. And it's when they're having their last supper meal and Mel Gibson, like the kid is annoyed with him. He says, I hate you. I think even, and he's like, no, I'm not going to spend any more of my life praying or whatever. 
and it's this very sort of combative argument that they have and then he kind of breaks down and then they all kind of hug like that's nice i really like that moment and then the movie keeps going it's like no 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 actually god is an agent in the story and he killed your wife on purpose and gave your kid asthma on purpose and it's like what do we stop 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 well yeah you you kind of brought it up. If we could talk about it, I was very very confused as to why the son seemed to have like out of nowhere this hatred for his dad when that had never popped up before. Yeah, it didn't. It, I'm there still was not one... sure why he feels well, he, that way. He said was you let mom one die, which before. which uh, I thought was like yeah. she like he decided to take her off life support or something. But no, I was horribly wrong because mine would make sense. She was dead no matter. He had like nothing to do with. I have no idea how the kid could have even begun to think that. I agree. Um, could... the, on the only thing they did to quote unquote set that up was one brief scene where he says to Joaquin Phoenix, oh, I wish you were my dad. Yeah, I wish you were my dad. And the, the, oh, that's what I'm referring to. Like, where is this coming from? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. I only like, had a surface level no... sort of like because you... Meryl is invested in the alien stuff while the father has seemed a bit distant. That's all I've got. I, I don't really know. A yeah. little bit, but he's like doing stuff. And but remember, this was right after, you know, the dad was like, "Okay, I'm gonna go finish, you know, like boarding up the yeah. house, being proactive about your protection." Yeah, and, and he so sided the with their like, decision oh. too, which I don't think was yeah very fatherly of him to be like, you know, the family it's outvoted me on this one. Yeah, if he has, if if there were reasons for them sticking around there, like, well, we've got some weapons here, or. You know, we don't have da 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 transportation, or the roads are closed, or da, whatever, or we've got a safe spot in the basement, or what, something like that. But none of that's ever discussed. There's no discussion on which place would or wouldn't be better. So I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, you have no reason to think the water is safe. No. I well, and if you remember, so, there's like, a line there's, there's really... of like, I don't want to leave this house. This is where Mum lived. I think something like that, and it's like, um. We can come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unless the aliens are here to yeah. rob the house of her valuables. <laughs> oh my God. They're going to okay. take that dress on a mannequin. Um, it, yeah, so the you let mom die doesn't make any sense. It seems entirely unmotivated. But if they went more in the direction that ever since she died and he lost his faith and all that, he's kind of been a shittier dad or like more emotionally distant or whatever it is they don't like who he's mm. turned into but they liked who he was before that would be a stronger moment you'd have to do more setup yeah but it i don't take see a whole it lot. well yeah i so have no idea what a, they're referencing or what they're referring to i'd say a strong example of that being perme uh, permeated throughout the film is we have several references where i think Sh Shyamalan was like this is this is strong for like showing the audience the situation which is several people referring to him as father when he doesn't want them to and it's like that's yeah yeah that works but each of those scenes, we could have gotten more insight into, you know, the more the further details of what he offered the world and what he doesn't anymore. Instead, you get the comedy scene where she's like, how many swear words have I done? He's like, that's the douchebag is only a swear word if you use it to attack a person or whatever. There's even that comedy shot where the guy behind him leans because she's apparently been describing this for some time. <laughs> the one, I like that. Yeah. The one good joke, yeah. But of course, the point or is just that... It's, it's a very core cool part of his background, but a lot of the time you gain the same thing each time it is brought up, which is, yeah, he used to be religious, used to have faith, but now he does not. As opposed to, this scene is where you learn how much of his uh, parenting was like dependent on his faith in God, or how much of his interactions with the world was dependent on his belief that uh, someone was always there looking out for him. Because for the record... We're actually like, you know, you don't have to be of any particular religion to enjoy a well-written story about any particular religion or non-religious story, I don't think. I think we're all big fans of The Prince of Egypt, and uh, I find the story personally terrible, well, Rags, we were... biblically speaking, but we, I really love the movie in the way that it presents, you know, it, you know, in its artistry. We were all very big fans of Midnight Mass until that last episode That's right. happened. <laughs> we were very big fans of Midnight Mass until the fucking last episode. And I was really particularly, I was very interested, more than anything else, potentially. I, I really liked the Catholicism angle that the movie used. It was legitimate. First of all, I related to it. I was able to be like, oh, yeah, and his robes were this color because of ordinary time and because of the celebration yeah, yeah. and everything. And like the accuracies with that. I liked that. I was like, oh, that's really cool to kind of see that and to to have them take that very seriously and and to not just like go not to denigrate it in any stupid way. Um, 
but then the last episode happened, so we don't have to talk about it. Well, we good. Um, yeah, but it, so I guess getting back to what I was saying, I think it's not motivated very well, but the result of the scene around the dinner table is like a relatively nice moment. Yeah. Um, in terms of the themes. And then he kind of goes way too far, getting back to the main problem of making literally everything happen for a very specific reason in terms of how to fight the aliens in the end. I think that was really lame. And I feel like that would be very unsatisfying even for people who do believe that uh, everything happens for a reason, whatever that means to them. It, it It's not literally God giving you instructions for how to survive an alien apocalypse. You know what I mean? It's a bit more subtle yeah. than that for most of those people. I am okay with the idea of people who, if the story was about how one man, and this could or could not have a religious element to it, that's um, you, you could work that in, but you don't have to, but you can. There are ways to do this uh, that I think would be appropriate to take a religious angle. But if the idea was this concept of do you see everything that happens to you um, as being part of something bigger, not that something's manipulating your life, but in the idea of things happen, how we deal with them, and what they lead to, and you know the optimism that comes along with yes, this bad thing happened, but it did put us in a situation, and we can do things with where it led us. Then I think the story would be much, much stronger, um, because as it is, obviously there's there's an insane amount of problems to where the point I think it's basically fundamentally broken. But um, I would definitely re, you know, rejig the like the core concept into something that's based a lot more on, you know, silver linings, optimism. How do you see your place in the world? How do you contextualize the things that happen to you? How do you treat like how do you see your own level of maybe responsibility when it comes to these things happening? Your role in these events, not holding on to like guilt wrongly, like if he felt it was his. Like, oh, it's my fault that she was out there and he was being unfair to himself because he wanted to blame himself for what happened. Um, it, there's a lot of stuff that you could do. And they did not do it in this movie. No. Because this, but... is, this movie is telling me to believe in God. Um, I mean, Even you, can, beyond you, can, that, you can broaden I... it out to a faith in a higher being or higher power or a lack of coincidence. Yeah. It'd be deistic. I mean, I think Shyamalan would say that he wasn't telling you to believe in the one specific God, but rather that you this... believe that there is a higher power. I mean, the, the movie ending, for example, with that mention that uh, these yeah people somewhere in the Middle East found a primitive way to yeah. defeat them, I think is supposed to sort of parallel what they did to defeat them. In other words, say like anyone anywhere who has this faith that everything will come good uh, can use primitive means to defeat a, a thing that seems so much bigger and, and more dangerous than they are. Um, I don't think he's necessarily telling you believe in the Christian conception of, of the deity because he's, he's really just doing that because it's for an American market and that's what Americans like to hear. Um, but if the story had been set in the Middle East, the same point could theoretically be made. It's just that it will be Allah instead of God, although they are kind of the same. Well, yeah, being. I mean, God, like, yeah, supernatural deity guy, but I don't even, I don't see how you could even take the deistic approach because the God, God in this story is clearly a participant that's setting up events very, very specifically so that things can happen. Yes. God well, is I mean, very involved in the events of this story. It's yeah. still theoretically possible that, you know, to, uh, well, we're going to the theology thing now, but, you know, it's still possible for a deistic God to take an active part in the world. It's just not a specific theistic God which is doing so. Um, no, it's not I thought the, whole, no, the, the, whole, the God which is abandoned. Deism is well, the, that he doesn't involve himself in anything. The, it doesn't. You, I think you can. It's just like because there's a specific form of deism, which is like where this idea that you know God effectively sets the events in motion and then steps back and lets the universe carry on as it will according to laws that have been pre-established. I don't think that that's strictly that necessary for deism. That's that would, uh, that's well, that, like that wouldn't work here because the event that was set up very specifically was her dying a number of years ago, or what was it, six months ago? So. That's, I mean, that's like a very active her having visions that she conveyed to someone else that the god put there. So that's that was like six months ago. Um, I see a couple of things in chat saying something to the effect of you guys are giving the god part too much weight, and I really think we're maybe even underselling it because I think, so. I think they don't. If you check out M Knight's uh, perspective on having made this film, it was it was very much uh, in the core DNA, the ideas. Uh, some people have said, like, what would you expect? It's Mel Gibson. 
Um, I don't mind a faith-based film at all, or story. That's totally fine with me. I'm trying to point out that I don't think it's very well done. No, no, and, I mean, and like you know, you can even ignore the, his intentions behind the movie and just look at like the the big thing that changes Mel Gibson's perspective is learning that he his son got asthma for a reason so he could survive the alien poison, and that his wife was actually like when the moment she was dying, she was really trying to tell him that in the future there's going to be an alien and you're going to want to swing the bat at him to kill him. Like that's 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 the resolution. The story, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, whatever you decide to take away from the film in terms of theism or deism, I mean the 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 intention of the theme of um, the restoration of faith is pretty abundantly clear. Particularly with the book ending of images, you have like the crucifix that's obviously absent from the wall, a little mm -hmm. too obvious, and then <laughs> him at the very end in his priest outfit coming out of his room. Um, but it's just, it completely falls apart in execution because it's so heavy handed and clumsy and ridiculous to a degree where if I was Mel Gibson in that position near the end of the movie where he's outside with his son trying to revive him and like everything's sort of clicking in his head, like, oh, that's why, that's why this happened. It's like, I would be like, really, really, <laughs> this, yeah. this is how the fucking world works. Are you kidding me? And from that point on, my image of God would be like a clown with a big wig and <laughs> clown nose and clown shoes. Like, well, yeah, so you, fuck, this is the world you've orchestrated? Are you fucking kidding me, dude? Well, this, not this, to put on my fedora too much, but isn't the Bible just one long list of God's terrible failures and well, it's I'm, correct things? But I don't want to go there personally, but I care. Yeah. Fair. <laughs> I think that uh, one could argue the story of what happens to Mel Gibson's character in this movie by the end could be the reason someone loses their faith. Uh, to to mm. understand this yeah. as a series of events, and so that's where you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's not handled very well. But I'm going to say, in terms of broad topics about the film, if anyone's got any more, welcome to to share. But of course, we probably should move into having a look at some uh, some interpretations of the film soon. Well, do we uh, want to yeah. actually talk more about the like the aliens and the water thing? Um, <laughs> I, I really, oh, yeah, we we kind we not of go over I, it. I feel like we did. Well, we sort um, of did, but I think I know what Fringy means here. Um, just, I just, I for those who haven't seen the movie, uh, the alien's weakness is water, and by that I mean like when it touches their skin, it's like acid that kills them. Water, not a not a particular kind of water, um, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, in the appropriate parts. It's just just water. That's the alien's weakness. I guess what I was, uh, what I'm interested in talking about, I guess, is how that is like a particularly prominent um, aspect of the film that's talked about, right? As like a, as like one of its kind of major flaws, or is it, you know, question mark, right? Um, in, in terms of like, I guess, a uh, one of those instances of man seems like this uh, massively uh, uproots or or um, or breaks the the premise of the film. You know, the, the, the premise yes. being aliens are coming and they're, they're interstellar travelers and they're coming here to, you know, harvest humans. But that they, you know, in terms of the nature of their incompetence has been talked about, like, you know, they can't break down doors. They don't have any weapons of any kind. But that the big one is, man, of all the places you could go to, um, if, if the problem is water, damn, man. Uh, yeah, well, the planet for you. And the easy connection to humanity exploring the universe would be like, there's going to be plenty of planets we'll go to that are going to be hostile to us with 90% of the construction of the entire thing like, anyway. Well, and it's like, yes, well, and what do we do portion. when that happens? <laughs> yeah, yeah the, moon, the moon is a particularly hostile environment. That's why Neil Armstrong didn't run out. It is naked. He didn't jump yeah. around and do cartwheels. Because the, the moment they got out of their spaceship and went into the atmosphere, they should be going, oh, God, it's in the air. It's in the air. The air itself <laughs> has the, the demon molecule. And he runs inside. Um, <laughs> um, in but... Mexico, it's aqua. <laughs> <laughs> that is a deep cut. But if you know it, you know it. Like... <laughs> That's really funny. Whoever. Um, the uh, But yeah, the. The fact that this is their weakness, and well, um, and that they didn't they do anything to account them. for it is, um, it's just one of those things of like, damn, man, that that does seriously undermine the whole movie. I think it's, I think it's it how is, they win. It's, it's like yeah. it's important to mention that this was like the big thing 
that was kind of a, a thing of like, hmm, when people watch the movie, was this? You know, I feel like it's one of the most commonly talked about. You know, if you're talking about the old era of the internet talking about movies, right? This yeah. is one of the big things that people point to as a plot hole. Yeah, this, this would this would be on the classic top ten lists. The, the aliens and yes, signs were weak to water. Are they retarded? <laughs> and then based yes, on this, the, they are. Yes, they are. They yes, are. they are. Yeah, <laughs> the thing is, is that I guess that would be something to emphasize is that you can focus in on the water specifically, and it's fair too because it's major. But um, I mean, you think about like the basically the third act and the way that it plays out, right? With all of the encounters throughout the house. Um, it's already been talked about that the the humans could have been more prepared for that encounter, but the aliens don't have battering rams or like crowbars or any tools or equipment at all. Yeah, they don't have to, like pre like, medieval technology so, to just get past a door when like you could have just kicked it. My um, you know, it's not like that. My it, take on this is the uh, M Night Stephen references it in the film is a fan of War of the Worlds, and he thought, hey. It was like an average human sort of illness that kills the aliens. That was that was a really cool idea. What if it were water, as simple as water, a common, almost the life-giving source of what's on Earth is the very weakness to the aliens? Wouldn't that be an awesome twist? I mean, well, I can let's... understand why he would have thought that, but then you think that somebody around him would say like, okay, but, you know, here's the problem with yeah. that. Yeah, yeah the M. problem, right. yeah. Like, <laughs> the War of the Worlds gets somewhat of a pass, because it was written in 1895, and it's... I don't uh, even... I like, don't think... I, I like the uh, idea no, of someone. I think that the War of the Worlds thing of that they were killed by infections and diseases on Earth... Yeah, it was the bacteria, than, right? In, yeah. The, yeah, I think they, that's the water, water. Let oh, yeah, it's dry. way better. It's harder oh, to yeah, spot yeah, bacteria from better. Mars than it is to spot water from Mars. Yeah, I, I, I agree that it's way better. Um, I, I don't think it's great, but I think it's way better, and it's probably good. Um, but I, the, there is an element of like, you have Shyamalan has a lot of benefit to learn from the setups and what he's like taking inspiration and stuff from. So his, well, is, his decision to take a much, 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 much worse version of War of the Worlds is, it was, it was a really foolish decision to go mm -hmm. down that route. Well, cause I mean, you know, it's, it obviously, you know, if, if it's your own film universe, you can establish whatever you want. But I mean, the general attitude is that water is probably going to be, there's a reason it's why we look obvious. for water on other planet. No, I, I was more just going the angle of, from a world building perspective, you've got aliens that are very, like that they get melted by water. So in terms of like, if you were trying to figure out your, there's a reason why us as Started humans, believe. when we look for other planets that might have life, we're always looking for water because, as I understand yeah. it, it's the idea that water is a really good binding agent. Um, hence, the that it's, yeah. it, it has a lot of the quality, and and then of course the fact that <clears> this <throat> is the only planet that we know of, and every that has life and everything here relies on water. I suppose that's not as big of a deal, but it, it I guess it kind of contributes to the overall feeling that like a lot of the thought and consideration given to developing the aliens in this film feels like it wasn't even secondary, but that it was tertiary. Yeah. Um, to a lot of the other goals that they had in mind, um, which is unfortunate when so much of the film is about the aliens. The... It, it, mm -hmm. It's especially funny to me because if aliens ever did come to Earth, a big reason probably would be because we have so much liquid water. You know what I mean? That's probably sure, yeah. what would motivate alien life the, to come here. The premise of, is it the Oblivion, the Tom Cruise thing? They, they harvest all the water because they really need the water with their, their giant machine things. There's a few others where oh, they come I and saw harvest that all movie, the water as well. And it was terrible. Um, yeah. Let's see. I, <laughs> what was the... Yeah, it was something like that. That's an EFAP movie, potentially. Um, a little slow in some parts, but boy, that movie is really bad. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we can... Oh, uh, these subjects will come up again with the videos we're going to be checking out anyway. So if I you, had a feeling they uh, would. We have uh, a couple of things to go through. So if everyone is all right, we could move on to phase two of this cool. stream. Okay, mm -hmm. exciting. Yeah. Um, oh, I um, if, if, for, uh, kind of on the water thing. Um, H.G. Wells had when he, when he wrote War of the Worlds. One of the things that he had, you know done in the book and I, I forget if this was the narration or one of the characters specifically say it. i know there was like a doctor character that have been ages since i've read it but well, one of the ideas was the thing that had caused you know unimaginable human death and suffering and um and harm to us was was the thing that ended up saving us from you know the the existential threat of the aliens and in this to say that oh yeah water 
kills the aliens. Water actually is the thing that saves us. It's not it's not a like it's it's not the same kind of actually. It's an actually without anything that makes you go, hmm. It's an actually that says, Well, you know that thing that we love everywhere all the time, and unless you're like drowning in it, it's really awesome to have. Um, and you need it to survive. It's really good. Like, yeah. And oh, my, well, I that, figured that the other other angle is like holy water. That that would yeah. be the other. That's the other Silence. angle. Holy water. Okay. No, you didn't. You never <laughs> brought that up. You got that from chat. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, we will be getting to theories soon All enough. Right. Okay. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna try and just get the fucking friend invite here for a. Uh... Watch together. They've changed things around. Where's the? How do I get I people in? I don't know. Fucking I always every time lost. I go there on my desktop, I have to get the prompt that says, "Would you like to do the desktop version?" Like, yes, bitch. I'm here on a desktop. What there do you think? Go. They moved it all to the bottom left. It's terrifying. What am I supposed to I'll do? Be there. It's still. Every time they do Why this, too, it fucks up. Why can't you just leave up. things where they are? Yeah, See, I, I have to like switch the desktop version. That should be the default, considering I'm on a desktop. Also, Agreed. the other version is balls. Okay, so... First up, and this is partially why I figured, oh, this could be, actually be fun. Uh, for those who okay. don't know, Signs is the movie that inspired Chris Stuckman to become a filmmaker. He says it is one of his favorites of all time. He's very <laughs> oh, invested boy. in a lot of what was achieved with it. Considers it, uh, I think, somewhat of a, of a masterwork from... Um, Shyamalan. I don't know if his estimation of it has gone down since his the comments I've heard him make before, but um, he did have a video breaking down signs and uh, why it's so awesome, and he provides responses to some of the common criticisms that we can check out to see. Now, M. Night does? Uh, no, Chris. Uh, so I thought that oh, maybe okay. it would be interesting to check out the f one of the films that you would arguably say he's the most passionate about, considering... A primary issue we take with uh, with Chris is that he doesn't quite seem as invested. But to be passion. fair, this was made a decade ago. So even if this is particularly passionate, oh. uh, times have changed. However, I will be more than interested. I'm always interested to hear people's perspectives on uh, films when they adore them, you know, and they have so much, they're so ready to sort of dig in. So uh, that's the first one. Well, we'll I, was, well I was wondering if the reason he was inspired is if he saw the movie and he's like, well, that was a piece of shit. I can make a way better movie than that. that <laughs> then he <laughs> I do wonder how many people in our generation are going to be inspired in that way by a lot of what comes out. They're like, that was not only awful, yeah. but how dare you, you know? <laughs> yeah. we, we this is what origin. passes in Hollywood? Are you fucking kidding me? I can Good movies this. inspire a love of movies. Bad movies can inspire the feeling of, oh, fuck, I could do that. <laughs> well, at least they can't do any work. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, are y'all ready? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let me use the loop real quick. I'll be just a second. He, he, sa he says time. yes, and then clearly explains that he's not ready. Yeah, I don't even, I Yeah, I don't know. Just... <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose we can continue to discuss some things, like... Um, did you did any do any of you keep up to date somewhat with with M Knight's um, campaign to destroy his own reputation? <laughs> no, I haven't watched one of his in a in a long time. Uh, I saw a knock at the cabin door, and that was not very good. Hmm. I think the last one I saw was the visit, which I kind of liked. I didn't think it was great, but I kind of enjoyed it. There's something about him, like because he still managed to make all of. The ideas he's coming up with, and he gets funding here and there from different studios that are like, yeah, we'll take a chance on you, especially if he's able to make a strong return on some of them. Kind of like, he's kind of living the dream, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, if, if, I, mean, if I understand no, correctly, most of his movies make money. There's yeah. just a yeah, few big duds, but whether they're critically acclaimed or not, you know, if they're turning a yeah, profit... But but the thing is, he's got his cope for that. It's the the North American critics are the ones who don't understand his <laughs> movies because he's got a European sensibility to him. I remember that. Wait, quote. is that real? Yeah. Oh, do you not? Yeah. Oh, so it was, um, I think it was it was for the press tour. I think it was for Avatar: The Last Airbender. Um, oh. and it was uh, <laughs> like it was the Europeans under the bus for Avatar. Interesting. They were, they were talking about um, it was it was a conversation like, oh yeah, you know, critics of you know they're not they're not really liking your movies, and and they said something along the lines of, I don't know what's happening with me and the critics in North America. 
Um, and then he he says like, "Well, I've got a very European sensibility, like Stanley Kubrick and stuff." Oh, <laughs> oh god, god! It's it's, uh, it's it's just one of those. He's American, M Night. He's an American well, guy, Kubrick. Uh, Oh, well, maybe, oh, he might have said <laughs> Maybe Hitchcock, he had a European actually, sensibility. Um, I can't remember exactly. I think it might have been Hitch. I know uh, he's like, been compared to Hitchcock by other people, and I'm just well, like, he was saying, fucking like, hell. Oh, really? well, I, you know, my, my films have got a slow pace, and Americans might think that's stilted. Uh, it's like, mad. That's not the problem. Okay. Thanks, fuck. It's just, it's just uh, copium, you know? Yeah. Just people, people don't like your movies lately. In general, but well, I guess that's the thing. I'm not sure what his view would be on, um, like if he looked back, right, retrospectively, what he thinks about um that particular era of his career, basically from science to after. Earth. Um, it's funny to say that, especially promoting uh the Airbender, like <laughs> the last Airbender, because that's such a shitty, schlocky CGI nightmare. Like, what what about that feels like a Hitchcock or a Stanley Kubrick movie? Didn't he say um, when the hmm. Netflix one came out, he's like, it's not so easy, is it? Or something, comment like that. Like, That's uh, funny. I, <laughs> it is very funny. Remember the part in that movie when they, the, they were in like the Earth place and then like six guys did like a slow little dance to move a rock, just float it across the. <laughs> like, it was very slow. The, the rock was moving at like two kilometers per hour, <laughs> something like that. That's, I think very the most rock. rewatched part heavy. of that movie in clip form. I've seen it so many times in everyone's reviews of anything. Like, the, the, when it's brought it's up, so it's just funny. like that. And then the one guy who screams really loudly, he's really into it. Yeah, he's uh, he's 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 making it work. <laughs> that guy, you know, he's he's, he's getting into it. Because uh, well, has anyone here seen that movie? What the last Airbender? Because I never did. I have not. No, I, have I have. Yeah. I yeah, a long time ago. It's funny. It's bad. <laughs> is it is it really it's, bad? It's like as a film, anyway. Like if if Avatar didn't exist yes. at all. It's, yeah. It's it's awful. It's incoherent. Right? Yeah. Okay. Then yes, of course, the common bit of criticism is that it's a, uh, it's a uh, very unfaithful adaptation. Oh, it's bad it's... on its own terms as well. I think mm. it was famously zero percent on both fronts on Rotten Tomatoes audience and critic. I'm just like, well, I'm, <laughs> I have no interest in seeing this. I suppose one of the only questions I would have maybe is, did there did there seem to be hope with him being? The, the guy uh, making I that. that there, was a, there was a teaser trailer that I think people thought was pretty cool. I think so, right? Like there was a teaser trailer. I don't remember. A bunch of shit, and I, I think people I thought that remember. was kind of cool. I think I, I just and wonder I if people thought like, is he a good fit for that, or if were they like, what the fuck? Because uh, his reputation <laughs> at that point, that was that was the era where he starts to lose everyone's support, pretty much. That was the. Uh, mm -hmm. That was the end uh, of like, <laughs> yeah, any, really I was. guess, I think. Because uh, then after that was After Earth, which he didn't get marketed as being a part of, uh, which was reflective of essentially the spent stock uh, at that time. I, I agree he sort of became a joke at that point, but I wonder if it actually led him to, uh, fin to financially suffer because his name, I think, sort of became a punchline, but then... I figure a lot of people would still go to his movies for like the laughter value of it. Um, um. Well, it's like I, I said before, um, it was it was it was around that time. That was like the only point in his career where he was seriously at risk of like not being able to make films again. But then he right. made the video, which was like very low budget and did quite well. And then that kicked. And then it was I think Split came after that. I think. And right. ever since then, he seems to have been okay in terms of making films that generally make their money back and a little bit more. And they're yeah. back to advertising, like signs, for instance. They're back Sign to advertising signs. them with his name on them ah. now. Yes. Uh, Knock at the That's Cabin right. Door and the new one with Josh Hartnett. It hasn't come out yet, but those are both prominently displayed, his mm -hmm. name across them. So, and Yeah, I mean, cool. I want him to restore his status. I want another movie like The Sixth Sense. It would be I fucking great if like he made that. a great Shyamalan movie. Uh, I think people would argue, would, would Split be the closest thing we got um, of his newest stock? I remember liking that movie somewhat. Uh, that's, Probably. Mm -hmm. That's a movie that helped put uh, Anya Taylor-Joy somewhat on the map. Obviously, other things boosted oh, yeah. her further, but it's just a crazy thing. It's like, yeah, Shyamalan, you know, he created her career. <laughs> yeah. You should say that to her and be like, you should star in my next film because of this. You owe me. <laughs> we both have a very European sensibility. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I saw people did like Furiosa. It felt very European. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, all right, let us go. Like I said, context is uh, this is Chris Tuckman's uh, Signs Analyzed and Explained. Is a very special film for me. Some viewers may know it's the. Wait, sorry, I, I, the first sentence lacked a bit. Let me just bring it back. Okay. Signs is a very special film for me. Some viewers may know it's the film that made me who I am today. When it came out in 2002, I was only 14 years old, and I remember my first visit to see it very vividly. It was the first time I really. St Wait, this never happened in the movie. That's a big crop circle. <laughs> that would have been funnier, though. Um, also, some of this planet really... with a symbol, so they know this is the one to land on. Uh, a really small planet. <laughs> Someone mentioned the witch was bigger. So like, not only was that definitely bigger, um, but you have uh, I think Queen's Gambit was the thing that probably took her from. Like, what what would you say the most significant jump for Anya Taylor Joy? The witch was definitely significant, but I think the Queen's Gambit. I saw probably, that getting discussed probably everywhere. Queen's Gambit. Yeah, that was very successful. People like the menu a decent bit as well. Uh, saw some discussion about that, but that yeah, feels like it came, I guess, uh, later though. Yeah. No, yeah, I'd agree. It's, it's just that she had a couple of things in a row that were all discussed, and so she like it seemed mm -hmm. fast tracked to. Uh, is she is she, what, what, like 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 top of the top tier actor now? I don't well, know. I guess, I guess so. Oh yeah, she. I would say she's an A lister now. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's interesting though that A lister, but it doesn't like help. You know, Furiosa, right? That didn't do anything for it. Nope. Even sure though it's prominently marketed as her and yeah. Chris Hemsworth in it, that didn't save it, which was indicative of the nature of how, like, oh, actors in it doesn't, like, necessarily... I mean, you know, Ryan Gosling, Emily Blunt for The Fall Guy, that didn't help that movie either. No, it mm -hmm. did not. Uh, sure Star, Power seems to ha Star Power seems to have a big effect internationally still for American movies, uh, but not as much domestically. It kind of depends on the actor, but yeah. Like if it's a new crop of actors, that won't necessarily translate much internationally, but like an older actor that people recognize seems to help in movies internationally. Well, I mean, it didn't help with uh, Mission Impossible, right? Like <laughs> Dead Reckoning was not successful. That was Tom Cruise, the last one. And the right? next one won't be either. <laughs> it's, it's... No, the next, no. Well, the next one even costs a lot more money as well. What if well, the next one makes even help. less money? What are they going to do? Uh, I mean, well, I think they're just going to have to lose a lot of money and never make Mission Impossible movies again. It's kind of the same situation yeah. that the Fast and Furious series is in now. Yeah. Where uh, the last one, I think it had a budget of like $350 million, Jeez. made about $600 million. And they initially said that they were going to make two sequels. I think now they've they've brought it back to one, um, obviously. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, it's well, hard to justify um... spending... A yeah. good point in uh, in chat. Cruise coming off Top Gun, Coo Top Top Gun Two set up a lot of uh, unrealistic expectations, which is probably very true. Like, um, I yeah, suppose that they might have been great. unrealistic, but it, I mean, Fallout made like eight hundred million dollars, so I don't think that I don't think the expectation of that film being profitable was unreasonable. Um, yeah, the next one being profitable is probably unreasonable because of how much it costs now. Yeah, do we have a I name think... for it? Um, uh, what's the we next one called? It's oh, not no, part no, two anymore. Just not part yeah. two. Yeah. Red Deckening. Oh. Uh, well, all I was going to say oh. was uh, even 800 million <laughs> wouldn't have been what they wanted, right? They would have wanted more than that. Uh, probably with the amount of money that they were spending. I presume they thought, well, it's up and up and up and up. That's how it goes with Mission Impossible, and it did for a while. Also, I would uh, stand by what you've said previously on streams, Fringy. I completely agree with you. I do not agree that Dead Reckoning was directly competing with Barbenheimer in such a way that People no, were like, I, I really? gotta see, I gotta see either Dead Reckoning or Barbenheimer. I don't believe that's a real choice. It's totally no, different I, from other those I, two movies. Well, I think the more relevant the the argument I would make is that when Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, and Fallout made about eight hundred million dollars each, I think it is absurd to say that that film should have moved out of the way for a three hour biopic about Oppenheimer. There's also um, like th there is no justification for that beforehand. It's only retrospectively that people look back and go, "Hmm, yeah, that I guess that was kind of busy." Yeah, well, mm -hmm. it feels like a hindsight thing as well as the fact that uh, people seem to want to avoid yeah. talking about how badly written the film is. The film is bad, and I think that, that affects word of mouth, and that's yeah. arguably the most important thing. If everybody was saying how amazing that film was, people would have said, well, I guess I could go watch, like, Barbie and Oppenheimer next week, or alternatively, yeah. well, maybe I'll watch Barbie and Oppenheimer this week, but next week, when Mission Impossible was still playing in theaters on many, many screens, I'll go watch it too. That didn't happen. Exactly. 
Yeah. I mean, Top Gun Maverick wasn't doing amazing right out of the gate. It took word of mouth. Yeah, that was a slow burn. It stuck around for ages. Oh, yeah, like almost a year was in theaters. It was a long time. Yeah. Word of mouth's powerful. It reminds me of uh, how long The Last Wish was discussed, right? It came out. Oh, yeah. Just for ages, people kept saying, like, that movie's fucking good. And it was like, eh. It took me a while to see it, I think. But it was still on recommendation from basically everybody. It was like, all right, I'll see it started to think seriously about film. Up until that point, I hadn't really thought about the art of filmmaking. Mm. Signs was the film that sparked the desire that led to a purchase of a camera, many short films, and a love of movies that hasn't left me to this day. I firmly believe that if I hadn't seen Signs on that specific day, I wouldn't be talking to you guys right now. Strangely, the mm. film deals with a very, very some... similar message. It's oh, like so it's to to make that connection. I think it's totally fine for literally any fucking movie to spark your interest in filmmaking, right? Because it, it could be any Absolutely. set of anything. It's just yeah. so fascinating that it was signs of all films. Like, okay, all right. Yeah. School well, I mean, one that's... for God, right? It's another example of you know something has to happen in a really specific <laughs> way. And in this case, we, we, like, we were given Chris stuff. God needs to pull a win stuff out of this conversation. Well, I, I think that was why I was uh, when he said that. I was like, hmm, feels like it's almost it's poetic, Very right? On message, like... isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he took yeah, the sign. Partic- in particular, with a movie that's flawed, and you start thinking of ways how it could be improved, that could definitely oh, well, kickstart your. Well, that's not what he's saying. I, I don't think that's what this is, right? It's that this. No, no, no. I know. Yeah, but just to the mean, point where it, yeah. anything can be a starting point, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, so well, consider um, that it was basically the Last Jedi that did that for me. Like I was a very, very normy sort of moviegoer until I know, the Last I said, Jedi just kind of. Normal. I watched Toy Story two and I loved it. <laughs> And I was like, man, storytelling, huh? This is some good shit. Yeah. Yeah, everyone's got a different story. I don't remember not loving watching movies. I think uh, it's just been a yeah. staple. I always liked movies, but it changed the way that I like viewed them and thought about them and was critical of them and would kind of like just sort of saw them. And then EFAP happened. Yeah. The Well, because he, he, the way he described it, right? He's, he, I think he said the artistry of film. Um, I remember even being fascinated by, I'd mentioned Night Before Christmas is one of the most repeated films I've ever seen in my life. And I, even as a kid, I was just like, God, it's amazing how they did this. They must have spent so long, you know, because uh, it's yeah. not too difficult to understand how stop motion works. And once you do and you see it, you're like, holy shit. Obviously, Wallace and Gromit as well, especially. Uh, Lion King. Yeah. You know, yeah. all these mm-hmm. sort of things where it's like, man, this is so cool how they did that. Message on coincidence and fate. This will be my fifth installment in my series of analyzed movie reviews. In the past, I've covered Prometheus, Drop. Uh, that's okay, though. <laughs> a Good Day to Die Hard, and Only God Forgives. Wow, that's an well, interesting that one. Is, that is. Die Hard 4 specifically. Well, what an interesting selection, you know? Yeah, the yeah. whole thing is like, I feel like there's no through line at all, which is not a bad thing necessarily, no, no. by the way. That's kind of interesting. They all- they all feel like, mo- except for Drive, they all feel like movies that he's trying to argue have more merits than people often give them credit for. That mm. might be, that could be a yeah. thread, but everyone likes Drive. You know, I mean? or, you know, like I don't know if yeah. anyone. I don't have to. You don't have to save that movie's reputation. Oh, and yeah. as someone just pointed out, it could very well be that those were just what was coming out when he was like, "I should make an analyzed thing." Uh, the uh, timeline too. Yeah. might match up. <laughs> Signs is by far my most requested. So sit tight, grab some popcorn, and let's reminisce to a time when the name M. Night Shyamalan made people shiver with excitement. Now, it just makes people shiver. But I still love you, man. Never do that again, though. One of my goals with this video is to debunk many of the popular complaints that I constantly hear about the film's finale. I will get into that later. But just as a warning, spoilers everywhere for signs. So if you haven't seen the film, Check it out, and then that's watch right. We are the perfect demographic for this video. We've seen signs. I've seen <laughs> signs, so I don't have to worry about spoilers because I, I know what sign. happens at the end. This um, and I opened up my eyes. I saw the sign. This image is interesting because <laughs> it looks promotional, <laughs> and it's got the um, <laughs> that 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 uh, shed or whatever. It's like the roof's getting blown open, it's like and exploding, getting potentially yeah, hit with a UFO like beam or something. Up by a uh, yeah, by a tractor beam. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, view. Yeah. Signs yeah, opens with the movie. main title sequence that brings back memories of watching Psycho for the first time. The loud score by it James Dean Howard was utilized. Interesting opening. Feels like a it very much throwback type of one. Yeah. I enjoy yeah. it, 
Uh, but it does, uh, this sounds very critical, but it does take me out of the experiencing it and rather I start thinking about it and how it was made. You know what I mean? I'm like, I know. It's, yeah, it's very meta, you know? It's like, oh, this reminds me of the way that films used to present their, uh, yeah. their like, credits right at the beginning of the film. Because I, yeah, because when we were watching it, when Muller and I were watching, I was like, this music is really unusual. It's like kind of tense, but quirky and, and like, like peppy. And then, like, what are the visuals? Is this like a, a like, like, well, like, what are these visuals supposed to be? Why have it like this? Is, is this a flashlight looking for like an alien? Or is this like a, the, you're looking up at the spaceship and this is the blue light that comes down from it? Yeah, or, can, yeah, yeah. or what, what's, you know, like what's going on with the, these visuals here? What do they mean? And I can say now, at least after seeing the movie, I still don't know, but it's something to think about. It's probably the flashlight idea because of that, that has a prominent role in certain scenes. And then the looking for signs, it's kind of, you know, in the opening credits to hint at the intensity that was to come in the film. It was sort of like a warning, a promise that things would get pretty freaky. And the full arc of the music isn't felt until the finale. That's whatever I do. Whenever I have someone over, I play the sound <laughs> intro music because I just want to let them know. Just, hey, just letting you know, things are going to get pretty freaky. You know that? So <laughs> we've got the signs intro music playing. All right. You know that, that face, the, the whole fucking episode was, I just like the idea that you play the sound, sign soundtrack <laughs> and the person's looking at you like, what the fuck? And you just make that face. That's just the <laughs> only face except my cock's out. Like, yeah. It's just that <laughs> face. <laughs> you you know what's about to happen. We're in the you we're know, in the mood now. Know. We're in the freaky mood. No words need exchanging. <laughs> finale of the film where that promise is kept. When the credits end, our first shot booms on the screen without much weight, and we see a pristine booms on the screen without much I, weight I, is I an odd way that. to. Uh, normally, when something booms on screen, that implies that it has a a, a weight or a, this this dramatic impact to it. So, an, an odd way to phrase it. The film does uh, open and end on, or at least close to enough, the, this shot. What, uh, this what did shot, everyone yeah. take away from that? Um, things carry on regardless of the negative stuff that happens in your life. I guess unless you fucking die, then it doesn't carry on. But, like, you know, life goes on, sort of. Um, you know, they, how things began is how they might become, and the days go by, and you could look back and be like oh things sort of are how they used to be maybe i don't know um that's um, a key difference between the opening shot and the ending shot is the window is smashed open and um i got an impression maybe that it's supposed oh, to yeah, be right. somewhat symbolic of uh the i don't know the the sort of wall between uh mel gibson and his his connection with god is like behind a, a glass you know barrier easily breakable and by the end of the film it's uh it's broken open i don't know if that maybe that was something they were going for like yeah like uh, the, the world's broken now or you can't you can't look at out the world in the same way because that 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 film that thing between you and the real world is maybe broken and maybe you see the world for what it really is yeah or... the glass barrier has been broken and now a man yeah, previously now... devoid of faith has is now unified with god and all his manifestations out there <laughs> maybe Probably. yeah and it's also we're going to have ants yeah it's kind of weird he didn't fix the window well, yeah, some time. It, 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 it well, have just you seen happened, the door, right? oh, the per, the front door? He's got. Well, he's used to having bugs in. You can just reach well, yeah, your how, hand right under the front door. How long has so, it been? He's a priest again, and he's put the cross back on the wall. No, um, and it's I think winter. the shot that I think it comes before the transition. when it tracks in. Yeah. It, oh, you're right. The camera pans, right. and we transition to the future. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We do. <laughs> it's like, like ten fun. minutes later, he comes up with his priest. Hard. One that should emote feelings of comfort and warmth, but instantly we sense yeah, something okay. isn't right. This is confirmed when Graham Hess, okay. played excellently by Mel Gibson, in my favorite. Well, that's actually something I wanted to mention. I did like the performances generally, and Mel I Gibson like... had a couple of specific moments where I was like, man, he's good at his best. Yeah, um, I liked him. I think my none of my issues with were with the acting. I think when everyone was acting and behaving bizarrely in like weird androids from another planet. I think that was just like the direction and they were kind of doing the stuff that M. Night was kind of directing them to do. But yeah, I was pretty, pretty close. 
Yeah, I was pleased with the the, the actors and actresses throughout the movie. Um, M- it was M- a good really, cast, yeah. Yeah, sorry. M. Night really likes to have people behave in very strange, mm-hmm. robotic ways. It's consistent across all of his movies, even the good ones to some degree. Very odd. And I, yeah, and while I, I, I very much disagree with that um, being a, a wise decision or a good decision for some of the scenes in this movie, and I think they cause issues, I think they were, it was executed well by all of the actors involved. Um, yeah. The other happening is just the best ever for performances. It's so funny. Favorite performance of his wakes up and immediately feels off. From this shot until the final moments in the film, an unwavering sense of dread permeates this movie. I definitely don't agree with that. Um, I mean, only in the I sense that there's plenty of moments that don't have an unwavering sense of dread. There's a lot of really there's, chill. There's a lot of comic relief. Um, yeah, there's a lot of yeah, yeah. scenes. I laughed in some of this movie, and they a lot of it's very mundane to the point of it being almost like it, it ends up being pointless. Uh, but like him, like there's no overarching sense of dread when Merrill's in the recruiting office, and we're learning about him playing being baseball player. Or when, yeah, when Mel Gibson goes to the pharmacy, like all these scenes, they're not an unwavering sense of dread. They're just kind of, they can be kind of weird slash funny slash unusual, but not because they're dreadful or tense. And I would argue you know? that a lot of it, I feel, is contextualized specifically just by the investigation, quote unquote, from the family about the alien stuff. The weird alien references, like, like who was running across around the house? I don't know. It's like, you can argue there's a, there's a sense of tension in those scenes, but nothing that I, I think that implies something more is happening than what is happening, which is there's some weird shit going on. Ain't that weird? And I would even say that some of the scenes were made to be far less tense than I feel like they should have been or could have been. Yeah, sure. That was the idea. Yeah. I think the them in the car with a baby monitor, that was a really weird way to execute that scene. And I feel like it could have been done better in a, in a shorter, more effective fashion. Um, but... I guess he wanted to have the tone that he wanted to have, and I just, it didn't, it mostly just did not resonate with me at all. Oh, and I think it got in the way, but. Has anyone here seen Scary Movie 3? <gasps> yeah. No. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, are you, I think, I know what you're going to refer to. Well, if you know I anything about know Scary about Movie this. 3, you should probably know what I'm going to refer to. It's uh... <laughs> I think, I think you told me about this a long time ago. Well, I, I wasn't actually going to make any particular reference. I was just going to say that um, oh, okay. I really love Scary Movie 3. I think it's hilarious. And uh, having seen Signs makes that movie funny as hell. Like, it's already funny, I think. But knowing exactly what they're making fun of, which Signs occupies, I want to say, like a significant portion of the jokes in that film. Um, Isn't it kind of the frame they hang all the jokes on? In that yeah, movie? it's like the core story, yeah. and then everything else gets referenced around it. Um, yeah, there's there's so many fucking good jokes. I was just thinking about referencing one, but I was like, you know what? We're probably gonna do an EFAP movies on it someday. So you know, what? instead we'll just uh, we'll just carry on. The thing about this opening, which Knight movie. himself it's a hilarious or... ending too, because oh, yeah. like a deleted ending rather involving the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend checking out. We gotta see these movies. I haven't seen any of the scary movies. Well, th- that's the thing. Before seeing a scary movie, should one see the movies it's referencing? Because if you want to see one, you need to see uh, Scream and I Know What You yeah. Did Last Summer. A few I'm others. I'm fine on going on a little adventure. It would mm-hmm. be a. I'm, total, I'm down for it. First Second one is The Haunting, I think. Yes. Yeah. And then the fourth one is War of the Worlds, funnily enough. <gasps> the Tom Cruise one. Of dread permeates this movie. The thing about this opening, which Knight himself refers to as his James Bond opening action scene, that impresses me so much, um, is how much... What he prefers to go by is Knight or M. Knight. I have no idea. I'm surprised you were more invested in saying this was the James <laughs> Bond opening action scene. No, I, 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 was, I think I was, I, it took a while for my mind to process. It's like, Knight, is that his name? <laughs> like, is that what you would call him? What would you call yeah. him, M. Knight? Or no, M. He wakes up from M. his bed and he leans up and you hear the da 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 da. Like, yeah, <laughs> yes. It gave me a lot of like the parkour <laughs> sequence and Casino Royale kind of vibes. <laughs> oh yeah, the, when there was the train heist in, in Signs here, when they had to steal the documents from the Russian supercomputer. Yeah, yeah. that was really. I really like yeah. that. And the aliens tried to stop him. Yeah. He used it would be funny if the aliens were Russian. The signal for the, 
learn about Graham in just a few shots. You really get all the essentials within a minute. It's really remarkable. The photo on his end table shows his wife and children, as well as himself in his priest uniform. A faded stain where a cross was once... I wonder what what is that called? Priest uniform. It's not. Frock, it's not right? the, uh, I was more wondering how much credit frock, I wanted to give the right? film for that because I don't think that's. For me, it was it was okay. Difficult. It's just an no, okay. It's intro. fine. It's just there. Yeah. It is. That's the that's the picture. You know, and subtle so, but serviceable. Yeah. Yeah. Like so, I I, yeah, I don't think it was. It, it's just that I don't know how many people miss that when it's like kind of the most important part of that frame. That's all. Well, and so it's it funny that he brought this up because like John a... brought it up not too long ago. The faded cross being so obvious. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, well. exactly. I really, I do not like that. That's there. I obviously get it, but like, it's so dirty and ugly looking. And like, if you're him, who wants to be reminded of the cross? You know what I mean? Like, he would probably scrub that off. But no, we, the audience, need or to see. Or hang a painting there, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so I. Yeah. My understanding is that, and I'm, I'm checking some of the things, a frock is the one where it's got, like, the drape shoulders. The shoulders that kind of have the... They're, they're a bit thicker on the shoulders. They have, like, an almost like a cowl sort of shoulder covering. I think that's a frock, I think. Because you have the, the normal clothing that they use are just, I think, generally called liturgical vestments, which are a chasuble, an albastole, and a cincture. And that's the Catholic one. And they also have cassocks, which are the foot. It's like one piece that's buttoned down the middle. And it's like sort of like a dress kind of thing where it goes all the way to the floor. But they use a surplus and tippet when it's a when, when you have like the white over it. And then they wear the stuff with a collar underneath that. With all the so, words you just said, it's no wonder he said priest uniform. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. <laughs> I'm fine with priest uniform in hindsight. Well, it's it the you know the the um it's informally called a dog collar the uh, right the, yeah. the, you know the, the little thing but it's a I think a Roman collar is what it sort of goes by, uh, I guess more formally, but um I don't. What were we talking about? This tongue is clearly seen on the wall as well. Within a few shots, a sharp eye can tell that he's had faith a and sharp lost eye. it. Uh, I know, a sharp eye. <laughs> Fuck off, oh, fair enough. <laughs> okay, it's just, like, if, I, if Chris were here, I'd be like, you understand that um, the way this is framed, your eyes are going to be drawn to anything of interest, which, if you remember, Mel Gibson's not even in frame at this point. He, when the scene starts, he steps into frame when he hears the scream. So what do your eyes look for? And it's like, well... If you missed that, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you missed that, yeah. what were you looking at? I don't, I don't. Maybe you, you just missed it. I guess it's just calling it a sharp eyes. Like, okay. it's not bad. It's not bad. Right. Like, it's, no, it, I don't think this, it's bad. It's this, just it, this is normal. It's a bit yeah. conspicuous. I would, I think, I would have preferred something more subtle, especially because you've already kind of clued me in with him having a, you know, having the the dog collar and the cassock vestment since your chin you'll stolen. Well, so we've got that, and so I'm already kind of, like, not primed in a bad way, but I'm already like, oh, okay, he's, so he's like a priest? I think maybe if That's he had um, Faithless tattooed on his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to go with Damaged. I think that it, because his faith has been damaged, and, and because of what happened, and also his wife was very damaged in the, in the crash that killed her. See, what I prefer so, about your vision is the subtlety. I, 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 felt I like the subtlety, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> Your, uh, yours is a bit too subtle. They might not quite exactly. you'll be able to grasp the raw emotion. When screams from his crops send him and his brother Merrill, Joaquin Phoenix, I, I do I, I, from yeah. the <laughs> I know, Everyone it's, pictured it's the Chris's screaming fault. crops. <laughs> Everyone pictured it. Oh, God, it hurts! Don't harvest me! <laughs> oh, Father. When you're in the, the fucking harvester oh. running over them, you just hear screaming. <laughs> <It's Yeah. all> <laughs> <laughs> No, what did we do? <laughs> Running into the horn. They got him. Oh god, they're gonna get me on the. <laughs> they, they go run, on the run! Turn. We can't. We're blind. It's my favorite bit of Clarkson's farm. Is like the the masked screams of the grain and the crops as he just kills them all <laughs> like a genocide. Yeah. Yeah, and I like his his, his smile as he's running oh. him over. We meet Graham's children. Bo, played by Abigail Breslin in her first role, and Morgan, played by Rory Culkin. Our first lines from both of the children are very important. Bo seems to think she's still in a dream. The fact that she has odd, possibly prophetic dreams is constantly brought up in the film. Morgan thinks God made what lies ahead of him, 
It's clear now that Morgan hasn't lost his faith. This will bring up a consistent struggle between himself and his father throughout the film. Isn't I wouldn't it say it's consistent. No, no, no it is not. I don't agree that it is. I think that's why when he says like the stuff that we talked about about him like hating his dad, I'm like, where the fuck did this come from? Yeah, they mm-hmm. they certainly needed to do more work for that one. Uh... And also, it, depending on um, kind of how you view the word, which by the way, probably. I mean, depending on how deep into the analysis you want to go, like defining what actually faith is, like you could have faith in God and just like hate him. You could think he's real and be angry at him. Like it's, plenty of people are like that. Um, well, yeah, Mel Gibson gets that so, point, right? Where he's, he explicitly yeah. says, I hate you over and over again. It's like yeah. he's having a bad time. I don't know. It's a rough day. It's been a rough day. Those Don aliens. They didn't After eat the, the French has- toast, you know. Family discovers the giant crop circle in the field. We now have our movie. Can I just add that this is real? This isn't CGI. I really, really respect that. And I, uh, yeah. no. I think it would have been more reasonable for it to be uh, physical than CGI in 2000. When was this made? Two? 2002, yeah. Especially being that they're shooting on the crop circles as well. I don't know. Like you will probably you... use it at least twice in the film to go out there into it. Because, uh, yeah, I, I just I think that if they had opted for a CG crop circle, which they, I suppose they could have, I just think it would have been Should've. noticeably looking worse and caused them extra problems in terms of filming. And because it's and because it's so early into the movie, you're already like, oh, this is the big kind of like stinging like plot starter thing. And it, all I can think about is how terrible it looks. Not a great thing. You you want to really hook me in with that kind of stuff. Um, to be honest with you, because uh, this sounds a little bit unfair to science, but if this film had come out today and they had done it for real, I'd be much more inclined to celebrate that fact. Um, but I think this probably yeah. would have been a pretty normal decision in 2002. It would have been like, well, yeah. Well. I think so, yeah. It makes sense that, yeah, because the alternative just would have been a, just pretty clearly a bad choice. But nowadays, when you can get away with yeah. so much more, opting to actually do the real thing has a bit more like, oh, hey. In the next scene, we see that their German shepherd, Houdini, peed on the floor. The kids think he's sick, and this little exchange happens. Houdini peed. I think he's sick. Why don't you take... Gonna be careful here. Just be a little careful. Just be a little careful. A little care. He had some music playing earlier. I assume it's copyright free. I don't know. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> I, uh, well, I hope so. Take him outside. I'll call Dr. Crawford. He doesn't treat animals. Well, he'll know what to do. This is actually a real. He's kept the clip going, so I just want to be careful. I know he's speaking. Yeah, no, it's still. fair. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Don it, Chris. You, didn't you know yeah. that people ten years from now would be streaming this video? <laughs> Gosh, don't you know? Really cool little tidbit that I'll explain later. It's something I didn't notice about the film for a long time. Soon we okay. meet Caroline, a local police right. officer who's arrived to hopefully give some answers. She didn't come from out of state or from Mexico. She's just she's a local police officer. What if she was an alien? She's based, she's based in the area. Oh, I actually, from, I know. think I was talking to Fringy about this, but I, it would have been super tempting because you get all kinds of ideas about other possible alien stories, right? And it's just like there's always something so enticing about um, a story where you realize maybe in in the latter portions of the film, maybe even the third act, that the aliens can shape shift to a point of appearing as human. And that a character throughout the whole film. They were doing that. Yes. Well, it would have been cool. Yeah. Um, and and if it been interesting, yeah. take for example, she was an alien the whole time, or in her first two three scenes, she behaves a very specific way, and then every scene after those two three, there's something off about her. Just just subtle, you know. Mm-hmm. It would have been. Uh, I'm always thinking about like, oh, it would be fun to have all these different premises because I I'm I I kind of like alien, uh, or rather sci-fi, I guess at that point, which. Uh, I, I was going to break the mold here and say sci-fi is a cool uh, uh, genre. I don't know if you guys agree. <laughs> I think it's really neat. Mm-hmm. I'm not the only one. All right. It's pretty cool. Wow, three. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we soon learn that many animals around the county have been acting odd. The look on Gibson's face always sends shivers down my spine when she says other dogs have been peeing on themselves, like when they smell a predator. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just a funny sentence. I know. I, for the record, his scripts, the ideas he's putting forward, I totally get them. It's the words he's choosing. <laughs> like, the, the, look of, yeah. the look of terror on Mel Gibson's face when he realizes all those dogs are peeing on themselves. Yeah. 
<laughs> like, oh, it's going to be such a mess to clean up. <laughs> He's just thinking about the sheer amount of dog urine. It's not <laughs> <gonna be famous. laughs> He's like, hey, I, when, when he grabs the sheriff by the shoulders and shakes her and he said, who's going to clean it up? Who's going to clean it up? <laughs> it won't be me. I don't have enough paper towels. Around. It's also during this scene that Graham asks Caroline to please stop. Sorry, that's the other wide angle shot I was yeah, thinking of. Yeah. Referring to him as father. We also get our first hint that Bo has a thing about her drinking water and a pretty suspenseful scene involving the family dog. This scene also includes some pretty good humor, something I think Knight really nailed in this. Again, an example of an isolation of, a, of a, a capturing a thing that was like, ooh, when uh, the two of them are talking about the water or whatever else, and then the dog barks quite aggressively at them. I remember being like, oh shit. Like it, yeah, 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 that made me like, oh, I jumped a little. Mm -hmm. oh. Uh, I quite like the the up. framing of it as well, because we don't see the dog's expression, but we hear what it's, you know, the noises it's making, mm -hmm. and we can see their reaction to it. And I was like, uh, yeah, I like this. It's cool it's sound design. Yeah, they make it really loud, the barking. After a few moments of silence, Graham becomes unnerved by the fact that he can't hear his children anymore, which leads to a scene my sister couldn't even watch. The doggy dies. Knight broke a rule of screenwriting here. Never kill the dog. Kill as many people what? as you want. Uh, that's like a save um, the cat type thing, I'm guessing. Like, don't kill a dog. Well, I would assume you only kill the dog. The, the purpose of killing the dog is to... Generally, it's used to show... Like, it is usually an oh shit moment, or it is usually used as well, it, a very important. I mean, even the thing does it right. I think the first no, there's loads of films that do. I, yeah, I would, I, I, like, we could list them more all. A trope, like, the, the trope. The movies kill the dog. Yeah. It's, it's it is a lower stakes version. It's, it's building up oftentimes to a human being killed, and it shows that there is something that is capable of killing a dog and is willing well, to I, kill a dog. I think so, he's referring to yeah. general rules of thumb that people because it, like that's why I said like save it. the cat. No, I don't like it either. Our show is about not liking those sorts of fucking writing rules. To be honest with you, it's uh yeah. when it's like you know make sure your protagonist is always the one pushing the plot forward. It's like well you don't have to do that. It depends. Yeah, yeah. I I don't like seeing dogs die, but I don't like seeing like characters I like die. And I would never say never have a character you like. Well, I, I, well, that, still, right. So. But the the point being that nobody likes to see the dog die. So I think even Chris would agree. If you were to do that in your story, the idea is that the audience hates whatever character killed the dog, and wants the main character or somebody to kill them. Yeah, it's not a That's never why... kill the dog moment, right? It's just a be careful how you're killing the dog and make sure that you're using it in the right purposes. So like, yeah, the, there's a way to kill a dog properly which serves you dramatically, and then there's forgetting the dog because you left it outside and then the alien got it. That's like that's not killing the dog properly. But the more the longer you think about it, the more examples of killing dogs in media come up, isn't it? Like the Lost World, Jurassic Park, the T Rex eats the dog. And that's dumb and silly, but it happens. It happens all the time. It's not a rule. It, well, yeah, and, and to sort of bolster, I think, what you're implying there as well, it's if you want to get to the technical, like, on, uh, analytical part of the audience, you could have a suit being like, don't kill a dog. That's going to make the audience uncomfortable. You could have, like, a cynical approach to storytelling in that way. But I think this one works in the sense that uh, the dog is terrified. It's getting angry. It's lashing out. And to defend his sister, he got the barbecue fork and skewered it, and and that already yeah. captures the seriousness of what's happening here. Is is and the inexplicable nature of it. It's like what what is this? What's well, happening? I, I would say what in, in the film. I think he says uh, the dog fell on it, which I'm thinking like, hmm, is that does that mean the dog like tried to pounce on you, and you yeah. kind of are interpreting that as like the dog was trying to fucking get you, but you interpreted that as it it, it fell on it. Like, hmm, mm -hmm. okay, all right, all right, maybe, you know? Was... It doesn't have to be explicit, but it's one of those things that did make me go when I watched the movie, like, hmm, interesting. It's a nice moment in isolation. I was frustrated that there seemed to be no consequences for it, like no fallout from this emotionally for the kids. I was, I was really actually about interested. to bring that up, too. Uh, they have a shot yeah, I, I quite like of Bo staring at the event itself, but there's nothing afterwards at all. Yeah. It's kind of gone. Mm -hmm. The dogs are props in this movie. I don't quite care for that. Yeah. No, I it don't use it. It's more like it's, it's a means really... to establish the asthma thing, right? Because that's the first time I think we see the kid using it. So, like, the dog being scary, he gets scared, he uses the asthma thing. And that seems to be what the movie thinks is the most important thing to establish with the dog's death. Um, is there any mitigating factor by the fact that they live on a farm and they're more working dogs than pets? Or are we... No, no, that, no. no, they, <laughs> uh, no, we can't. Don't run for, <laughs> don't run for the Republican also, Party here in the U.S. I will <laughs> say, um... 
because we were bringing up how they're farmers, I will say they don't really capture the nature of these people being farmers outside of them having a oh. field of crops. That is they it. They just have corn. Yeah. yeah. Which, to be honest with they you, just, it starts to it be like, are you actually farmers? Is this even your corn? <laughs> like, this is an Airbnb. They're are you renting it out? Yeah, it kind of feels that way sometimes. It's just, just cousins for the crop circle. Yeah, yep, yep, 100%. Yeah. Because like, mm -hmm. like, if you're a priest, like you don't have time to farm. You are like doing stuff with your congregation and taking care of a church and maintaining it. And, well, your maybe flock, maybe the wife was the more the farmer about that rags. Oh yeah, yeah. This movie's yeah. woke. She wore the overalls in this family. Like, <laughs> goodness. <laughs> Knight broke a rule of screenwriting here: never kill the dog. Kill as many people as you want, just never kill the dog. He breaks that rule twice in this movie. We learn of Morgan's asthma here. That's that's, that's it. really it. Okay, that's a bit disappointing. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just thinking funny. about how, in terms of like, oh, the dog dies and it reveals asthma. It feels like the dog uh, got fridged, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I honestly I thought, by the way, that it. he was gonna say it jokingly and then explain what it meant in the scene. You know what I mean? But, I thought uh, so too. But, yeah. I thought but he so. seems to he seems to think it's bold for doing it twice when it's a rule you don't do. It's like no, it's more the trope that everyone does. Which is why people are sick of it these if days. If anything, it's a particularly frequent trope of the dog exactly. dying. It's a particularly sad moment well, and, um, and when uh, was... has a massive impact on the main character. I feel like that came to a head with... Um, when was I Am Legend out? Was that 2005? That was two, yeah, and that was that was definitely a case of people going like, ah, right, that's like kind of the quintessential example of the way that dogs have often been uh, used oh, seven. in stories, which is that they are the sad second act low point. Yeah, well, because... Right. I haven't seen that movie in a long time, so I don't want to be too critical or celebratory of how they handled it. Um, but I do remember at that point, we it felt like, okay, stop with the... And that was only a few years after this came out. Yeah. yeah well, that's what I mean. It, it, was, it was over the course of a long time of just killing dogs all the time. It's just like, stop trying that shit. Uh, and it's funny because people are like, what about John Wick? And it's like, well, yeah, John Wick is... Um, that, that, that's much more modern, but the, we, it was well entrenched by then. As like a thing. But if use. anything, it, it does it does seem like now, uh, people people almost expect that if a main character has a dog companion, that the dog's not going to make it. To where it's surprising when the dog makes it to the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it is interesting to frame it as like, well, he broke the rule of killing dogs. It's like dogs die a lot in movies. They do. Um, yeah. They're yeah, often remembered yeah, more so the ones that kill them because uh, the ones that don't kill them, oftentimes the dogs are like they can be superfluous in the story. Sort of, they're just there. Yeah. But they'll have a it's... scene in which they are horribly killed, you remember that. I mean, it's derived just simply from a misinterpretation of the uh, the fact that audiences will typically be upset by seeing a dog die. But you can utilize that. That's the whole Yeah, thing. no, you're right, because this goes for everything. It's like, try not to kill a kid in your movie because it makes audiences uncomfortable. And it's like, well, I mean, yes, but also, <laughs> right. you know. Not this... me. Kill that child! Stop the child. I'm gonna, this is the thing. Them. You could almost flip reverse all of these rules and be like, the one way to really tell an audience your film is free from the limitations of typical storytelling tropes is to kill a kid pretty early on. If you do that, you're like, oh well, shit, alright. This does oh, not include we killing watching... John Connor and Dark Fate. <laughs> when we were watching when evil lurks and that thing happens we were oh just yeah like, yeah i was like oh that was like an oh <laughs> oh this is the oh yeah everything's on the table now everything is on the yeah, we feel like pretty much everything's on the table corruptible so. is that movie good i haven't seen it yet it is worth watching i think okay I think, yeah i uh, yeah i would rather movie. simply tell you to check it out and then tell us how you feel about it yeah sounds good and discover that the relationship between Graham and his brother Merrill is a bit strained. Soon we cut to nighttime. The farm is. Um, to be fair, all that happens in that moment is he says, "Where were you?" And he's clearly holding, um, I think, food, or he's he's holding something that implies he, he was came doing out something. of the house. Yeah, he came out of the house with like more food. Like he he went inside to get more food and stuff. I wouldn't I wouldn't but argue that was a moment to show their relationship is strained. It was literally almost like logistical. Like why weren't you yeah. in the scene that the kids att were attacked by the dog? It's like oh because he was busy. Yeah, and also like do you expect me to think that the dog will randomly attack the kids? But, yeah, like, no, no, no one expects like, that. Mel... No, no. <laughs> yeah, so uh, like at the same time, I would expect Mel to maybe be a bit irrational in terms of. Like something crazy just happened. Why weren't you there to make sure that this crazy thing 
you know, was accounted yeah. for. And he's like, dude, like I, how could I, that, <laughs> this is wild. <laughs> all right. I could have never possibly sure. imagined this. Yeah. Cause happen. he doesn't even fully understand what has even happened. Right. Cause he's just come out and then he says, yeah, he, he just came to, out. Uh, take Isabella behind the shed or whatever. And he's like, uh, okay. Fire up. Yeah. It's quiet. Nothing is moving. All we hear is crickets, but suddenly they stop chirping. I didn't even notice this the first time I saw it, but that subtle sound effects work terrifies me. It's like, holy crap, a freaking alien just walked on the scene and the crickets were like, hell no. Bo wakes up. Uh, so the. All right. The so whole, like, that whole um, thing was kind of just awkward, right? Like, I, I'm talking about the way that he's explaining it. That was a bit. Oh, okay. I don't know, it's a bit awkward. Um, this, almost, yeah, he says it like a jokey kind of way, but I think it's just weird in the movie. Like, that all the crickets stopped together. This is what I was talking about, what we were talking about earlier, right? If there's a radius that you give off that would make a cricket stop making sounds, sure, I understand that, but to the point where we don't hear any? I If if I see that in the movie, I'm thinking like a demon or magic or something well, yeah, like yeah, that. Uh, I don't you, think, you, you oh, think just maybe like a normal, they put out not, some a, kind not of, a um, secular creature that just like steps out and it's an alien it's like I, I don't think crickets care what planet you're from if you're big <laughs> and walking around they just don't want to be well, around and you the implication of course could be that they did something alien to make all the crickets stop but I don't exactly right, know was... what they, that would be like do they maybe or, yeah. have a, a pheromone or something that goes Pew. all of the crickets die like they, they've landed they're around they secrete something and so all of a sudden they notice you know, well, how comes it's so quiet? And everyone's like, oh, I just realized there's no crickets anymore. And then they know it's like, interesting. And we never hear crickets ever again for the rest of the movie. And they think, oh, shit, are all the crickets just like fucking dead? That's weird. Did something happen? Is there something in the crops when the circles happened? Is there a, yeah. did they spray a pesticide on the corn? And then they're like, oh, shit, if they sprayed a pesticide on the corn, is our crop like, is it bad? It, it, do we have an entire wasted crop? Did someone destroy our like livelihood? And that creates tension and stress and... Someone in chat said As is. apparently there are ninjas who train crickets to stop to not stop making noise so they don't get detected by pockets of crickets. Is that true? I don't believe that. I don't know. I'm I'm fifty fifty on it. Maybe I could believe that. <laughs> I'll believe the exploding bat thing, but I don't think I'm I don't think I'm I, I don't know. Cork in that bat. Training crickets to chirp thing. I don't know. Weaponized that. crickets just seems really like specific. <laughs> how many? How many situations what if there was do you that, really use that in? There's just that one passionate ninja that's like, no one's gonna see this coming. I'm gonna kill everyone. How many ninja plots were foiled when somebody realized, oh, that cricket over there stopped chirping. I should be on alert for ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was ninjas in this movie the whole time. They just look weird. Maybe it was. And they hate water, and they... And they hate crickets, because they ruined their everything. Their clothes. Crickets gave it away, man. Uh, also, I think, Cap, are you saying something? I was just going to say, as is, you know, in terms of praising that subtle detail, he's so jazzed up about it, and I don't quite understand what's so remarkably good about it. I mean, also, it's okay. Um, I'll it's say fine. that I feel like he's missed out on a lot of what could be praised so far already. That is true as well. The crickets thing kind of reminds me of the uh, Halo games. If you have uh, active camouflage, you're near a player who has that, and it Amo powers fun. on. Well, you yeah, you, the cloaking you said device. Word. It, you, said sort... re, you said like revelation earlier, and I didn't say anything. But now that you've said camouflage, we might have to. We might have to re start. Talking. We might have to put him down. Revelation? I don't. I don't think I said that. <laughs> All right. Maybe I uh, <laughs> must spoke. <laughs> But my point being that if you engage your cloaking device in the game, it sort of creates this muffling effect within a certain radius, like if whether you do it or you're in the radius of, some, of somebody who's done it. So that's why I was thinking, like, maybe it has something to do with... I thought with, it only like, accounted for you, the camouflaged person. It only works for the camouflaged person. It, it, it dulls everything, makes everything quieter. Um, well, I do know if you're in theater mode and you have the free-roaming camera and you're within the radius of a player that's using active camouflage, it has that effect. So I'm, I figure it applies to players that are not them using it. Maybe, but anyway, maybe it does. And it's just one of those little like halo factoids that I've, that I've not remembered, hmm. but interesting. Right. I wonder if that's the case. I'll, well, I'll, yeah, I'll well, ask I'm... my friend who is big into halo. If that's, uh, Look, if that's, it got me thinking. Cause we know in the movie that they have active camouflage on their ships. So like, maybe there's something about that energy being emitted where it's just like, Oh, there must be a ship like right over the house. That's why all the crickets are shutting up. Perhaps, perhaps. 
Graham, saying there is a monster outside her room. Graham kindly tries to put his daughter back to bed, and we get a really great scene where Bo asks Graham why he talks to mom when he's by himself. We sense that she's since passed away. This nice moment quickly ends when Graham spots an alien on the frickin' roof. Whoa! <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I thought... He's talking I... like that girl from fucking um, the game. What's that game? The one that everyone... Oh, I just lost the game. I was making fun of. Oh, it's fourth barker. That's it. Is an alien. <laughs> I just saw an alien roof. on my freaking roof. <laughs> <laughs> that I, also, I remember um, rewatching the film. I was I uh, I kind of wondered if that was a bit too early to uh, yeah. to show the alien that clearly. I wondered if it would be better to wait more than because I feel like that was like ten minutes in, ten fifteen minutes in. That was uh, something I, I was um, talking about with the theater going experience of most audience members will be like, "What the fuck was that? What did he see? What was that something? You know, like because it was so quick." But, I um, think the problem was with the sound effect because yeah. had it, that one was accompanied by the very loud. It's like, okay, yep, all right, I, I see it. I think there's a point in the middle that would have been really good. If that was like the super inciting incident for Mel Gibson when he sees this, no sting. It's just like a really flat, totally played straight, which I just think they need to do in movies more anyway. But he just like looks up and happens to notice this thing looking at, at him through the window. Oh. But he's the only one who sees it. Can we and reference... he starts like freaking out. The goat, uh, that might might be unbeatable because it's just the perfect version of what we're talking about, but can be done in other ways. It's just that there's no way to improve the way it was done in the uh, the descent. The descent. Well, yeah, the the light passes I mean, it's kind over. Kind of the king of the cave, and there is something clearly there, and the light goes back to it, and it's gone. Yep, that's yeah, it's a really really good one. I there should be more, and it actually happened uh, later when she goes down the tunnel too. Mm -hmm. And she she sees the thing in the distance. Much more overt uh, that one, but yes. Yeah, a lot more overt. But it's like to it, it in in terms of being a, a comparison to this, where it is very overt, but it doesn't have that that sting, you know, um, that 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 musical cue that happens. I really kind of wish that they would rely on the visuals and put me more in the mood of the the character, who it was just like yeah, just the visual of something like that happening. I feel yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, just, um... it's much more immersive for me. I'm totally in agreement that uh, removing the musical cue would, would possibly help a lot, and uh, the idea of a flatter shot, or rather a shot that it's in view of us for a decent amount of time, but only becomes clear as to there's actually something there. Like, if it were crouched behind something, and then slowly stands up, sort of, uh, with enough of a... Uh, like, it could totally become a part of something that was like, oh, that was there? What the fuck? He actually does it with um, the alien hand later on in the with the cold yeah, or whatever. Yeah, in the... It was there the whole yeah, time, yeah, yeah. and it only moves when you know you're gonna grab him. It's actually uh, camouflaged right. with the material of the the coal ship. Yes, as well. it's kind of neat. It does that. Yeah, they show a few scenes where when it when it touches things or when it's around things, it'll sort of like camouflage a bit with it. Um, the the I I think that maybe having yeah like similar to the descent where he sees it and he it, it's kind of subtle, so he squints at it, and then when it cuts to him squinting. You know, he's he's looking at it, and then when it shows back to what he's looking at, it's gone. So we don't have, like, a super clear understanding of what everything he saw from his perspective was. We just see the sort of before and after, and we yeah. piece together, like, there might have been subtle movements in the middle that he was looking at. I think um, the other way you can do I, it is mm -hmm. to sort of place it in a position where it can easily be mistaken for something that is just completely normal. Um, so for some reason, like for some reason, my mind is going to that. There's that bit in Shaun of the Dead when um, like he's on the bus and the woman is like grasping after a pigeon, but before she grabs the pigeon, the bus goes in front of him, so he loses his view and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, it's that like you can mistake that for a, a different thing or something that actually is sort of it's odd but normal. There's another interpretation other than oh my goodness, there is an actual strange, probably alien monster thing standing on the roof of a barn. If uh, he looks over into the darkness and there's like a bundle of fucking brooms or something. Um, and like, it looks like there might be a person there, but there's also not a person there. And you can kind of see why the kid would think it's a monster, but at the moment he can still rationalize it away as being, no, that's just a trick of the light. There's nothing actually standing there. Just a well, subtler way of doing it would be nice. It would be really cool if you took the Hill House route and you just sort of had in the movie really subtle, very like, like you wouldn't even potentially even notice them but like aliens that were there in the very back of some scenes maybe through a window maybe standing halfway obscured camoed by up. the corn maybe around yeah sort of camoed up 
Maybe they're sort of ones peering around the barn or whatever at night, and no attention is ever drawn to it, but they are there in the background. And I think that would be a really good route to go as well. Shyamalan was clever in the ways he chose to reveal the creature. He doesn't just show you it, you get a little glimpse, which keeps you curious. On the DVD, Knight said that the killer coming at you with a bloody knife isn't necessarily scary, but having the knowledge that a killer is in your house, just not being able to see him, that's terrifying. I mean, it's about yeah, how you it execute both. Yeah, um, A lot of it, yeah, a lot yeah. of it is execution. <laughs> it's, there's definitely, it's, it's easier for you to, I think it's easier for you to, what, which one would be easier? I don't know. Um, but yeah, well, the execution is kind of key. Is, you know? that, is that sometimes not seeing something as scarier? Like, yeah, sometimes. Just yeah. Can. But even but a slasher can... movie is going to do both of those things. True. Yeah, I think well, so. And, so um, like, you... makes me think about it's like it's like yeah, you know, like a movie where a creature that you know is going to kill you is slowly moving toward you. That's just not going to be scary. And it's like, oh, yeah, it follows is pretty creepy. <laughs> like the, the well, we get. We get this in games all the time, where a good horror game will have, like, oh shit, I know something's around here, but I don't know where it is. And then you get the oh shit, oh shit moment, where, like, you know it's coming to get you, and you have you to remember, run. Um... I think Amnesia the Dark Descent is oh, yeah, a really yeah. good well, example of this, too. Uh, I was thinking of all the times back in the day when when everyone was first jumping into Left 4 Dead and getting to understand it, when the tank would spawn, and it you're, say, for example, running through an area, and it's you know it's behind you because the screen is rocking, and it's screaming at you, and you're like, oh god, if it hits me, if it hits me, and then it does, and it sends you flinging, and you're just hoping that it actually like benefits you in some ways so you could escape. But point being, of course, there's a huge balance going on here about... Uh, how you'd execute. These are just two different styles, almost, of, of uh, creating an experience with the audience. You could do them both badly. I used to... The kind of thing used to freak me out as a kid playing Resident Evil, like, beyond the range of a fixed camera shot. Like, you would hear, the, like, there's a zombie somewhere in the room shuffling around, or, like, multiple of them, and it's just like, oh, I don't want to walk forward and engage the new perspective, and then I'll see the enemies. It's so scary. Like, I mean, I was a kid, right? But, like, I just thought that was spooky. Yeah. Hitchcock said something similar, and I'm paraphrasing here. A that. bomb going off is not rising. suspenseful. That's the release. A bomb underneath the table, and you don't know when it's going to go off. Now that's suspense. So well, that makes more sense because he's talking about suspense. Yeah. Not yeah, suspense. Scariness. Yeah. I mean, it's suspense is like yeah, it's it's like that. I mean, suspense is essentially like the, the feeling of anxiety, right? Feeling nervous, so... Yeah. Anticipation, yeah, kinda... somewhat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I also uh, think oh. if you were to cut to a bomb under the table and you saw that it had a timer, and then you cut back to the conversation, that would still be kind of suspenseful, because you'd be like, oh, they oh, yeah. don't know. Yeah. You know, but it is going to go off. Well, I, I mean, think there's, there's loads of... It's all well and good to say, like, oh, it's scarier when you don't know exactly what it is. And, like, there's a lot of truth to that. But also, it still needs to be scary once you do see it. And this is, Signs is a movie that utterly fails in that regard. It gets I think worse, it, yeah. Exactly. There well, are I mean, movies where, like, once you see it or once the killer is in the room running at you, it, it can actually be just as scary or even I, scarier. The thing, you know. Like, yeah, I was immediately, like, yeah, I was going to say uh, that, yeah. the thing. Like, oh shit, that's what it is. The situation is not better now that I know what's going no, on. Oh god, no. Yeah, I think it's one of the few improved. examples. It's one of the few examples where you get the full reveal of what it is, and it's even more crazy yeah. and scary. Yeah. Not yeah, everyone thing... would agree, but I would put alien in that regard, uh, in that category. You know, like right. seeing the full alien monster, like, oh my god, that's worse. <laughs> I think yeah. I think I agree with you. The the reason why the thing comes to mind, at least for me, is because of the I'm. I'd be terror. If you had like a selection of monsters that can kill you, I would pick Alien over the Thing because I don't exactly know what it, what the experience of being enveloped by the Thing is, and I don't want to know. Yeah. 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 So anyway, Graham wakes Meryl, and they try to chase this thing down outside, still assuming it's just some neighboring kids. This scene is pretty hilarious, especially the dialogue involving the fact that Graham doesn't feel comfortable cursing. Soon enough, the brothers start to sense that this may not be pesky kids. The next day, Caroline has returned. Through conversation with Meryl, we get more hints at what happened to Graham's wife. And through a conversation with Bo, we learn that she's really got a problem with water. She even leaves tons of glasses all around the house half full. 
then yes, I, I think glasses are half full. I'm an optimist. Uh, not much to say. He's, uh, he's saying what happens in the film. Yes. Caroline interviews Graham and Merrill about their experience the previous night in another scene that keeps the audience chuckling. But the subtle humor is always quickly replaced with an air of dread or worry as Caroline brings up the fact that Graham left. I'm sorry, I'm still stuck on the last <laughs> couple of things. This is funny. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> I like the way he phrased this just now. I would flip it around the other way, where it's just like it keeps trying to set up these horrific scenes, but it quickly gets usurped by a forced comedic moment and kind of ruins it. Well, this is one of the comedic moments that really didn't work for me. Like the hyper fixation about like, oh, well, maybe it was a female gymnast. Like, what are we doing? That, yeah, why, I know. why are you saying that? Yeah, and I um, think this immediately follows them running around the house and doing that. I am crazy right now. I'm super angry and pissed off. Like, okay, we're doing overt comedy now, right? Like, what the fuck even it is this? It kind of needed to go in either direction, you know? Because right now it's kind of splitting the baby a little bit in terms of tone, you know, where I'm watching it and there's not a lot I remember being redeeming about the alien. So I'm like, fuck it, let's push more into the comedy. Yeah, you know, I get it's, that. It's somewhere um, in a weird middle ground. Because I did feel like uh, the joke with the the gymnast is very stilted. That she says, um, you know, uh, could it, you know how are you ruling out that it's not it's not a woman? It's like I don't know any girl that can do that. And it's like there are Olympic athletes that can do what you're talking about. Like, well, she jumped really high. There are Olympic athletes that can jump very high, jump clean over me. And then eventually says like, okay, so excluding a Scandinavian Olympic athlete, what do you think happened here? And then, like, cut back to her, and she's like, "I don't appreciate the sarcasm." <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, oh, that that was that took a while to do the joke that I think we could see coming. Yeah. The church, and someone might possibly have a grudge against them. Soon, Bo says that every station is playing the same show, and we see news reports from all around the world indicating that the crop circles are happening everywhere. One of the things I love about this movie is that it truly captures what it might feel like if a group of hostile aliens attempted to take over the planet. Some no, really <laughs> does it? No, does it? That's not what because... they do, though. Also, <laughs> that's all also this wouldn't like the biggest one of the biggest criticisms about this is that obviously these aliens are retarded. <laughs> There's no yeah. way this is how it would happen. Yeah. Also, uh, just bef before the chat. Planet, not pissing around in cornfields, like graffitiing them, basically. That's just a waste of everybody's time. And may the aliens <laughs> strike me down <laughs> if they do. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, just f fair warning. I feel like we have to do this once per app now. Uh, Discord is still busted to the point where people who leave for like even two minutes, when they come back, they're super loud temporarily. Nothing we can do about it. Uh, sorry about that. It just happened to Rags, so I'm just trying to get ahead of people being like, why haven't you turned Rags down? It's like, don't worry, it'll level out. It always does. Turn me up, baby. Alien invasion movies show worldwide destruction and people from other lands running and fleeing from big CGI. Ooh, question for the whole panel. What's better, Signs or Independence Day? <laughs> I, uh, I certainly enjoy Independence Day more than Signs. Yes, do I. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, also, it's really awkward as well to say, like, oh, big CGI ships. It's like, a lot of this is practical and miniatures, so... Oh, I love yeah, some kind of the work in the original Independence Day, yeah, yeah, for the special effects. It's cool as fuck. I'm not sure why he used this as an example, um, when there is a good mix of practical effects in here, too. I think Independence Day is a, a tongue-in-cheek disaster crowd-pleaser movie, and it's easier to get on board um, with, like... I don't mean this insultingly, though it's 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 impossible to make it not sound insulting. Uh, Independence Day comes across as the first uh, very opening idea a person has about aliens invading. It's a bunch of ships, and they have spaceships, and they shoot lasers, and that's that's an alien invasion. Yeah, and it's like we are here to blow up your buildings. Yeah, <laughs> at, least got, the ones you... at least they've got lasers, Mom. Well, no, th th this is what them. I mean. Signs feels like a step forward and then five steps back. It's like, well, it's more complicated because the aliens are sneaky, you see. They're doing blah, 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 and then, and then you make them retards. And it's like, oh, well, that's, that's oh. not satisfying. <laughs> oh. um, there are other films that do alien invasions that are much more subtle slash complicated in terms of what their ultimate goals are and stuff. And and I feel like Signs like Mars wants... Attacks? Absolutely yeah, I was just going to say Mars Attacks. <laughs> 
That bat, 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 bat. I fucking love that movie. Unapologetically, yeah, it's, it's such a goofball oh, movie. Great. Ships. To me, despite the fact that these movies actually show worldwide invasion and devastation, no. it wasn't until Signs that I legitimately understood what it might feel like, because it's totally... Okay, I guess. Why would Signs be... Why would the way that they do it in Signs be the way that they do it? It's, it's really, really stupid. So, like, so they park all of their ships above the major cities of the world, and then... What, well, and, and Rags, they remember, they camouflage and the ships. And try and grab people? They camo the ships, and they're undetectable by uh, any particular waves, I think they make clear, but they can be seen by the naked eye because of their lights at night. It's like, well, yeah. Oh. So, like, well. Well, you fuck that all up. All right. <laughs> well, see, here's the thing that works really, really well if it's like a stealth bomber that you can't see with your naked eyes anyway. But if you're just hovering over cities in mass, and people are like, oh, look, look, up there, ships. And it doesn't do you much that good. It's also, why uh, would you let's... park over city? Why? Why would you? Oh, we I think the implication was like that. The they were literally moving into place, ready to attack. That's as simple as it was. They, they were just getting and everybody. And their attack was them jumping down naked and grabbing people. <laughs> I'm gonna get you. <laughs> We're gonna get you. That's it. I, no, I was like, really, I can, I can imagine them going <laughs> with their arms up and everything, be like, oh, "We're gonna get you, spooky." Well, it makes you. Yeah, you never makes see you them do anything, like to actually show them what the actual attack on humans is going to be from the aliens' perspective. We don't get that big picture stuff at all in Signs. They scare a Mexican child, and that's <laughs> kind of it. Me hey, several, hey, give credit, several many Mexican, Mexican children. children. Yeah. Several Mexican children. Okay. So yeah, and it's like crouching in the bushes. And then it's just like, oh, I'll just be on my way now. It just, I'm just going to walk away. It just well. feels weird that uh, with the information we have, it feels like it's to the point where the peak human person for strength and fighting capability on Earth, absolutely naked as well, might actually be able to take one of these things on. And it's like, oh, that's strange. Oh, definitely. You know, because you'd be like, well, there's other movies where that's the case. Like, yeah, Mars Attacks, where it's goof bullshit. Like, <laughs> where they can punch the... Where he, doesn't he punch out one of them and it breaks their uh, helmet? In a moment where they're having like a boxing reference, because I forget the actor's name, but he so. was a boxer, right? I think, or something like that. In, in any case, the um, the nature of the aliens is very much not at all capturing what I think it would feel like to have a hyper high tech alien race decide to hostily attack, rather just attack Earth, or even yeah. harvest us. Uh, however, they uh, put it at the end. Told from the perspective I would love of... if the movie in like the basement scene entertained the scenario of one of the aliens busting down the door and then it's just like, okay, now what? What like what does the fight look like? Like the alien tries to get them in a headlock to like do the poison thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, you make me think now. It's like wouldn't it have been cool if it bursts open and it's just dark and then you hear the noises <laughs> and they're like, Oh geez, what's gonna happen? Because yeah, I uh the thing is the film can't really work, can it? You can't have them actually get through that door because it's kind of like well what's going to happen then it's, well there has know. to be resolution to this yeah like as cool as it would be to have the door get busted down and when Mer squirrel Merrell Mer when, when the emperor raises his axe into you know like to defend himself he accidentally hits the light it goes out and then it's quiet that's really cool as an idea but it means that we've got to have a resolution to to what occurs at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, you make me think of like how that could be a fun way to they somewhat they're visible in the dark as opposed to uh, the light or they something because of their camouflage. They're a little okay, maybe, oh, yeah. and then and little then it gives, it gives all the humans in the room the advantage to somewhat because they can see it, but it can't see them. Yeah, something I don't know. We'd yeah. have to tool around a lot to treatment. fix up this uh, this script Rooney, I think, because. <laughs> I I have a fondness for it uh, conceptually, I think, signs. I almost want it to be fixed up because uh, I like the, the idea of trying to get this really creepy atmosphere throughout the whole movie of aliens invading Earth, but having such little information. It's just so disappointing that the aliens were such retards. What else can you say? Yeah, I mean, I, I also like the idea of telling an alien story purely from the perspective of a family, which I imagine what Chris is getting at here. Like, he's describing this feeling. I can't remember what he said exactly. But, like, yeah. knowing what it would be like to experience an alien invasion. And I get, I think what he's getting at is the fact that you are just, it's told solely from the family's perspective, mm -hmm. ignoring all the poor execution that goes along with that.
I like a woman who knows how to open a pomegranate. Exactly. Family, so it's vastly easier to relate to as a viewer. Graham decides to take his family into town to help get their minds off things, and through some comical scenes we learn extremely important details about each character. Morgan is extremely interested in this whole UFO thing and gets a book about it. Bose had a thing about her drinking water her whole life. People still really feel the need to confess their sins to Graham, and in what is perhaps the most important character info scene, we learn. Okay. I, I just all right. These aren't like what the, I would call. Like these aren't things really. Like the, but let's let we can start at the beginning. Like with the kid at the bookstore. There's a lot of potential weird alien stuff happening. Do you have a book on aliens that I can read about? Maybe <laughs> see what people think about them. It's like okay, that's that's almost not even like a character thing. It is of course, but it, it's almost like that's just intuitively what a lot of people would just do. That tells me virtually nothing about their character other than they're kind of interested to some degree in the events around them. And then you um, have... Yeah? My, it just feels... What else is there to grasp from the scene? He's, he's pointing out things about the scenes that are extremely important for future detail, but, like, that is the scene, you know? It, it, well, yeah, like, it, like with the chick in the water, the little... Um, not the lady in the water, uh, but the, the, the girl, Bo, and her... Or is she just weird about the water she drinks? He's really picky about her water because sometimes kids are weird about stuff like that. What did we learn in that scene? That that trait has persisted since the first time we learned about it. Like, okay, she's still weird about water. All right, what's what's the next part? Well, I guess, I guess what I'm um, pointing out is just that um, I feel like there's more analysis to actually be had. He's he's sort not of not getting much insight here. He, it's much more of a just a description of the events playing out on screen. And for reference, this video is those thoughts. this video is titled "Analyzed and Explained." This feels <laughs> like we could be doing a little more. I don't know. Learn that Meryl... all... Well, I, I, I mean, the... he he just sorry he just said that the that these scenes are all really important for character stuff. And to piggyback on what Rags was saying with Bo. All that we learn new is that, oh, she's been like this since she was a kid. That's not important. That's not extremely important. We already knew she was weird about water. All we learn here is that she's been like this forever. That doesn't... What does that matter? I'm uh, yeah, I'm actually it trying doesn't... to think of like how that would be relevant to anything in particular. Because it, doesn't, it could have started yesterday. It doesn't have to have been for years for it to, you know... No. Unless, not, unless we didn't learn anything, sign, really. That's a, her having always felt that way about water was a sign from God that she will be needing to put water glasses but everywhere. It, so that that would be the same them. if she just started it recently, you know. She should, God stuff. should have just made Mel Gibson really lazy and irresponsible by allowing her to continue to fill the entire house with Fuck half it, rags. full glasses. You just made it rain. Make it rain. Let them happen. I know that. The distaste for water is one thing, but then she has this inexplicable compulsion to leave half full glasses around the house in like, large quantities instead of just fucking well, emptying a glass part. out that's into the like, sink and putting a glass away. Yeah, that's like, like Liz, what the fuck are you doing? Like, if you're going to be weird about your water, fine, be weird about your water, whatever, you'll get thirsty sometime. But like, you can't be leaving this stuff around all over the place. Where's the fucking parenting? going on well there Even is your Meryl it's like dude what are you what are you doing you're leaving shit around we're running out of cups he, he, <laughs> says, he says you're too old to be doing this so he's trying rags he's trying he's trying to get through to it not very hard no well to be honest with you the the significant moments of his parenting are kind of he's he's a bit pushover -y. he's like you know the whole we should probably do something to protect ourselves though his fucking suggestion was going to the lake so whatever I don't know <laughs> that's not Let's I don't think that's lake. better and we'll ski them to death. I don't know. Like, let's I don't, just I don't go. Know what the, what's the plan here? Let's go see Great Uncle, you know, Flim Flam, and get all of his guns and hold up in his crazy, you know, conspiracy shelter. That's probably the thing to do. Like the character in Extraterrestrial, we referenced him before, Michael Ironside. And he he gets his scene where he's shooting the aliens. I think he kills one, right? I can't remember. Or at least he. I ooh I I. Think you that, did, don't they see blood or something? Or I'm trying to remember. I like, flushed ooh, that movie out of my head. Was that a goofball movie in terms of like? Was it at yes. times comedic? I think so, right? Unintentionally, yes. I thought like it was intentional as well. Sometimes I thought the Michael Ironside character was supposed to be funny. I can't remember. He's just the crazy old weirdo guy who turns out to be right about the conspiracies, and then he dies. And like, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, you know, he, it I falls was into thinking... the pool, but it lives. Okay. Yeah. I've fallen into pools and lived.
I need to go rewatch us watching that movie so I can remember it. <laughs> I've forgotten Close Encounters. Sorry, not Close Encounters. You know, uh, the extraterrestrial. Bo's weirdness with water and her, like they're, you know, you know, Evian backwards, right? Ooh, well, yeah. Well, well. It spells naive. <gasps> right. So I'm thinking, like, is there some kind of like connection with the water and the parenting and leaving it out? Like, you is, fool. what's the connection? You've now reminded me of the Doctor Who episode I watched today. Uh, unfortunately, Fringy saw it as well. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. I don't really want to stay on it for long. I just want to say it's basically the tweet I put out, which is that uh, they're all okay. worried about this big spooky monster that's arriving. They don't know anything about it. There's all kinds of information that's not really making any sense. They don't know what it means. And then Oh, it's like, it's like signs. Kinda. And then one person in their big facility, uh, important computer room, starts... She's been possessed. They do stay. They're like, oh my god, she's, she's possessed. She's saying weird things. She's like, the arrival of yeah. my dark master, blah blah blah. Yeah, all kind of creepy things. <laughs> Assuming and, um, direct control. <laughs> yeah, and, and so uh, one of the characters is like, oh no, Harriet, what's, wh wh what's happening? Harriet, are you okay? And then the doctor, who's like, you know, able to talk to them through little uh, communication devices, is like, wait, Harriet? Who is that? And then she says, Harriet, Harriet, you met her. And he goes, yeah, what, what's her full name? And then they pull it up on the file and it says Harriet Arbinger. And, uh, the Arbinger? Oh my god. And the, and the doctor goes, Harriet Arbinger. Harbinger. The, har oh, the god said Harbinger's ahead of their arrival. She's a Harbinger. <laughs> That's awful. It that actually um, happens. Yes. yes. <laughs> I was losing it watching yeah, it. I couldn't I, fucking it, believe oh, it. Oh, uh, I, I, in, I accidentally made a Mass Effect reference when I said assuming direct control, Harbinger is a did, reaper. That's right, yeah, <laughs> oh, I did. had it, the dots, they connect. Rags, it's acknowledge the insanity of what I just said, please. <laughs> I, I, thinking, why would that be on their mind? It's like, well, because there was an anagram earlier, so they concluded <laughs> that her name must be an anagram, which I guess it is. It's just. It's it's not an anagram so much as we're just gonna take the H in Harriet and then just the weird last name Arbinger. Arbinger. Is that a real name? Yeah. I Arbinger. Know. And then, and then, and then the best part as well, Rags, is the letters disappear and it puts them together yes. and it says Harbinger, and then the doctor says Harbinger <laughs> in case you didn't get it. Is so oh, there is an Arbinger Institute. It is so unbelievably clever. Harriet Arbinger. Yeah, I, I know it's not an anagram. That's why I'm. Se that's they think that there's a connection. <laughs> they like, think oh, it's clever. Know. They think that was clever. Yeah. Why? That's when the letters are jumbled up, hidden. right? Yes. This but, is like but, all but, the conspiracy theories about the Illuminati and the Freemasons and stuff. And it's like they they left all the symbols and the signs and our money <laughs> and everything, man. It's like, well, gosh, like, do they not want to be discovered, or are they leaving signs everywhere for you goofballs to find? Like, which one is it? Um, that is that is one of the explanations for Harriet Arbinger that I've heard that the god in question made sure to have that lady before he possessed her have her name be Harriet Arbinger, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he so can funny. only possess people who are named H something. H Arbinger, yeah. Um, so the so, chat just like said, Harry, um, right? Didn't say Harold. Didn't say you. Said Hugh. That's another classic. Oh, Hugh. Mm -hmm. Hugh did this. You, you did this. Did this. My they high fived God. each other in the writers' room when they came up with that Harriet shit. That's probably <laughs> good. It's fucking clever because it did. sounds like a thing. <laughs> it's just I'm I'm also amused by the doctors. Like she's saying weird things. Well, what's her full name? We might be able to figure out <laughs> like what. <once. laughs> yeah. It might be a woman's. So, so who knows? It's like, what are we talking about? What's going on here? You see, the what's doctor the saw the signs, and he he. They get it all out. His eyes. That's so bad, though. It's like, say, oh, my name is Mr. Edward Vilman. Edward Vilman? It's Eve Vilma. Oh. Evil man. He's the baddie. <laughs> I actually feel like Ruella was, Deville. was more subtle. <laughs> than... The problem is, it's such a... Uh, I think Gary captured it because he, he put a tweet on by saying, uh, hello, my name is Al. Alpocalypse. Like, it's, it's so, like, <laughs> the word is practically complete. Harriet Arbinger. You're like, oh. <laughs> if Al was there the whole good. time, how could we I not like see this? How could we be so blind? I know. I am murderoso rape lord. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. Like, oh my goodness. Are you a good guy? He's like, no, no, no. It's just, it's, you it's have a that, like, Peepo sus face. Sense. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> you say that name again. <laughs>
the need to confess their sins to Graham, and in what is perhaps the most important character info scene, we learn that Merrill almost went pro as a baseball player, but wasn't able to make it because it felt wrong not to swing. I is actually super no, I actually what? think if that you if the... you remove this scene, the film doesn't actually lose any integrity. Doesn't change at no. all. Also, he didn't yeah. he didn't not make it to the major leagues because he felt like he needed to swing. It's because he struck out a lot. If he felt but... the need to swing and hit a lot of really good hits. Yeah, but it's because he never wanted to not swing. He yeah. Never, it's because know, of the even if it was... It's really well, semantic at that point. I, I guess, it... but yeah. Well, if he how... really wanted to swing and he was a really good at doing that, then he'd be in the middle. Well, my guess would be that it also, like, when it's a ball, he would swing as well when he didn't I... need to miss and then get a strike. I feel sure. so yeah, forced, sometimes. and there's no sense of, like, of personal I don't, I don't turmoil. Like, like, he's... Right. Like you could you could at least have a scene where he's sitting alone at a baseball field or something, just looking out at the the park and going, "Ah, oh, wow, uh, the good old days when I was a baseball player." player <laughs> well, yeah, because this Let me explain it to you in the most theatrical way possible. This is not only <laughs> very kinda... explicit, but it's also not even that helpful. Like as information, it just isn't. He always wants yeah. to swing the bat. That doesn't necessarily help him with an alien. Like, I don't understand. Well, yeah, like... we talked about it earlier. Like, hey, you would think that that's thematically setting up that he doesn't want to be passive and that he'd rather do something than nothing and that he's yeah. like a go-getter and he's like, he's really affirmative about things, but that never pops up. If anything, it categorizes him as just sort of passively watching the news all the time and like not yeah. like being an active participant in the goings on of the house until Mel gets him to do something. If anything, when it creates all... confusion having him having that scene. When they all meet up for yeah. pizza. We get another very important scene. They spot the director, Shyamalan himself. Actually... <laughs> <laughs> Is that him? Is that a very important scene? Um, <laughs> no. no it is. is that I'm... capital H so... him? This is the. I'm trying to be really fair here. It's like, what is an important scene? It's like, well, if you can cut it and the film remains completely intact, was it that important? Like, I, I, don't, I don't. I think that's a fair way to categorize it. If you can get rid of something and nothing changes, is that it important? Wasn't that crucial, yeah. I don't think it's like, so. It's like it's the difference between yeah. It's like, is chaff important? No, because you can get rid of it all, and you're left with you know the good stuff. Um, I, I, I wouldn't call this important. If anything, I was legitimately kind of confused as to why the scene existed and what it wanted me to think. Um, He's running I away was... from responsibility, I guess, and trying to think how that links. Yeah, into I don't, the, I don't think there's kind of... nothing to gain from it. I just don't know that I would call it an important scene. Because if the only time he met Ray, this guy's Ray, right? Or Hugh? No, he's Ray. Ray, Ray. okay. I don't know why I was thinking Hugh. It wasn't because of the Hugh did this. I was just, <laughs> I was thinking something. That was com completely coincidental. It's like the Harbinger thing. Um, not your Harbinger thing, my Harbinger thing with a Mass Effect reference. What was I talking about? <laughs> Whether or not you oh, gained right. anything from I remember, the scene. Yeah, if, if the first time that he met Ray, um, it was in the truck at his house, and in, in that incredible sequence, um, then I don't, what would change because i think it'd be, yeah because it because we'd still get the idea that ray wasn't like he didn't want to call because he'd say i had that number sitting by my phone for six months and then you know i called it this time and he came over and he chomped off that alien. by well, the way there's an alien in the pantry what i suppose um, this does is that they all harbor a distinct it's feeling toward him and that he's he's kind of trying to avoid dealing with it himself that gets bolstered though as you pointed out by the scene we see him later like there's no information in this scene that we don't also get at other points which is why again like a, i'm trying to be fair there are scenes that you can't cut from this in terms of not doing any damage to the continuity of the film but the two that he's referenced is extremely important i think can be cut it's an arc of a kind isn't it i mean we, we introduce him here he looks at them he sees them he runs away then he traps an alien in his basement, and this makes him think, right, now I have to own up to my sins. Um, so, like, it, it's, it's silly, so, it's so the reason why, course, but it is, it is a direction of travel. The reason why I brought up the, the this, we don't learn anything here that we don't get in the other scene is he, he says the reason he called the father specifically is because he had his number next to the phone for six months. And I think that that's yeah. actually a pretty good line to tell us he's been thinking about calling him the whole time. Yeah. 
I think that, seen... and that that to me already captures what this scene is trying to capture, which is that he's... I think it, no, I, I agree that it does the same thing. I'm just wondering whether or not, like, if we had skipped this and we just had that and he popped into the scene and said, I've been thinking about doing it for six months and now I finally have, whether that would seem too abrupt for it, maybe. I don't know. I'm... Um... It's a bit well, so wait, you know, uh, like, I, I'm actually not arguing. Says, oh, by the way, I'm not arguing to cut this scene. I think it's fine to keep it. I just don't consider it important uh, compared uh -huh. to other scenes. That's all. Still, I, why I, can I cannot get over the self-insert aspect of this scene? It it really yeah. bugs me. <laughs> like, is that him? It M. does kind of. It does kind of draw me out of it. Too. Famous movie director. <laughs> yeah. To be like, oh, it's you, and not like screenwriter an, oh, extraordinaire. Yeah. Well, what's funny is uh, you get with Peter Jackson in Lord of the Rings. It's a very much a Where's Waldo type situation for some people. It's like, oh, that was him. Hey, there he was. Okay, because it's already gone by the time you pointed out. But with Shabalad, you ain't gonna miss it. <laughs> like, it's, it's like, oh, oh, he's still here. Yeah. He's still he hadn't he hadn't left yet. Oh, he's a character. We're gonna. Oh, okay. He hasn't. All right. Oh. Okay. See you later, I guess. Yeah, Lady of the Water, I'm pretty sure, is the worst that anyone has ever done it. I don't think he'll be top for that one. Or maybe not at the level of, you know, like the budget. I don't, I don't think. Because I was about to say, like, I guess you could count Neil Breen, but <laughs> we all know that's hot. No, so. that's, yeah, that's way better. <laughs> I mean, just, just so it's clear oh. for the chat who hasn't seen the scene, the dialogue on his entry is actually, is that him? With no other context. And so, like... Yeah, I, I just totally have forgotten ridiculous. what his role in the story was. So when I was watching this again, I'm like, wait, are they all just like, oh my God, is that the Arab? Like, because this is just after 9 <laughs> 11. So I thought maybe that's what they were going with. <laughs> oh my God. But... Wait, he's in the movie? Dang, he gave himself a big role. He's the guy who killed Graham's wife and started all the characters on their fateful journey towards redemption? No, that was God. That but, was I mean, God. <laughs> God, it might Shyamalan. I don't know the different. I mean, the splitting hairs, right? Yep. I'm the um, director. not that familiar with like American law enforcement, but if you've fallen asleep at the wheel and you've killed someone, are you let out and driving again within six months, or are you no having your license taken away and putting in prison? No way he's driving. Whether or not he'd go to jail, I think it's that's. Depends. It might depend, it's yeah, a, it might depend on what the judge does, but... Certainly a possibility would be something to emphasize. The fact he that he would have driving, no probably admitted to his mistake, immediately shown immense regret, have a full, clean history, that would have helped him a lot in the case, right? For, like, he doesn't necessarily need to go to prison, but, yeah, I don't see how they would or let him be driving so quickly. It looks like that, but no way he's driving. Well, it says here from roadwise.co.uk, at least, that a driving ban for a minimum of two years. So let me see. And if, that's for uh, vehicular manslaughter, I assume? Uh, yeah, it says if you cause death by dangerous driving, you could face four, you could face 14 years imprisonment, a driving ban from a minimum of two years. But I think that's the UK. So let me okay. uh, see here. Uh, uh, for the record, I am aware that he's Indian. I thought what the scene was saying was that they were giving him like shifty looks because this was like post 9-11. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It was like right, the, yeah, it was like right that's, after the yeah. It's like right after. That's that's what I disaster. thought was happening in the scene because there was no actual information in the scene. Uh, I'm aware that he's Indian. Yes. <laughs> M Night Shyamalan. Yes, indeed. Writer, director, storyteller extraordinaire. Started all the characters on their fateful journey towards redemption. Yep, the director, the guy who created these characters is also the character in the movie who made the first step that leads them all to the finale. I, I, I No, mean, because that was God. The film says it was basically God. Mm. Um, yeah, how, why I, is he... Why wouldn't he treat him the same way he's treating all the other characters as they are pawns of... Uh, well, within the universe, yeah. Like, uh, I guess we're supposed to believe that God kind of... But him to oh he does have a line he says it's like it was meant to be that had I fallen asleep for just those ten any seconds at any other time yeah it wouldn't have happened it's almost like it was supposed to happen I think the film's point of view is that God definitely put his thumb on the scales for that one he was like let's uh, let's make you fall asleep now and then it made mm. it happen what happened but yeah I would definitely say it's definitely not he's not the one in control in this at all interesting. Here's why it doesn't bother me. I saw this movie in theaters in 2002, before I knew who Shyamalan was. Because as I said, this was the movie that really made me want to analyze film and learn more about them. 
Speaking of analyzing film, his analysis of that was interesting. I think that, this that is was... a part of that, but so far I know what you mean. He did just basically say interesting to all of that. Yeah, in I, a I, signs analyzed and explained movie review video. So, so I, watched I hope. We yeah, I think he's getting up. a little bit more on this, right? I, I, the thing is, I'm not sure I where he's so. going with this because if he's countering yeah. the idea that people found it immersion breaking to just see him doing things, which is a common criticism for seeing. The same thing will be said of celebrities in movies, which I understand people saying, but I, all you can really say back is it didn't do that for me. It's like, meh, okay. You know, which he's saying because he didn't even know who Shyamalan was or rather what he looked like. Because as I said, this was the movie that really made me want to analyze film and learn more about them. So I watched his performance as if it was just another actor, and it didn't bother me. In fact, I remember thinking, this supporting guy is pretty good. So there are two cool things I take I actually don't think he was that. He was, he was no, I, I don't he was, either. I was fine. He was fine, I guess. He's fine. But I ain't going more than fine. He was no Quentin Tarantino in Pulp Fiction, I'll tell you I'll tell you that. I'd tell That's I'd say that he I'm belongs <laughs> the most say he belongs behind the camera, but I was like, ah, oh, maybe not. Um I, it, mm. Quentin's, Quentin's cameo in Pulp Fiction is fucking hilarious and iconic. His cameo in uh, in Django Unchained is so fucking cringy. It's awful, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Australian accent. What was he thinking? Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, every Show time it comes fate. up, I'm I, just like, oh, he's trying, I guess. Maybe, maybe Shyamalan in his head is going through like the the emotions that are demanded by the scene, but I am just not seeing it in his face or his eyes. Like, I just don't see anything there to grab onto. Away from this scene. For one, everyone recognizes him except Bo, who says, who is he? This is probably due to how young she is. She probably wouldn't recognize him. And when Shyamalan drives off, Graham is the only one who starts eating, taking a huge bite, trying to forget and move on. This shows a pretty normal sized bite. I right? think I'll I'll give it to him though. This is analysis. That's a bit of a, yeah, yeah. This, this he's, is him analysis. being the only one him being the only one who takes a bite. Like he's ready to like he wants to do something. He didn't want to sit there and linger and think yeah. about it. He wants to get back to well, life. One bearing in mind the yeah. later scene, right, where he's like, Well I don't care about what all you guys are talking about. I'm gonna eat my food. Yeah. yeah. So like, we can say yeah. that that's something Let's... he's done multiple times. So I would agree. This is analysis, which I feel it's been light so far in this video. If he it's... says why, if he explains why he thinks it's meaningful that he's the only person who eats, I'll well, be Well, he there. just did. I also find it kind of funny that typically, like, with movie food, you would want to take small bites so you can preserve the amount of food the that's there on the plate if you need yeah. to do, like, additional takes. And you know what takes, happens yeah. when people do that? No one ends up eating the fucking food. It sits there <laughs> the whole time. The people in the show or the people in the movie, they make this delicious bounty, and it doesn't get eaten. You need to be like Viserys. Fuck up that chicken. Go, go, go. You mean yeah. Denethor? No. Because he fucked up that food. He did fuck up that tomato yeah. and that chicken, but Viserys also did as well. He was like, oh yeah, it's chicken. I don't know, I'm not going to say chicken fucking time. It's, it's, oh yeah, it's time to eat this chicken. And boy, he was eating that chicken. And you know what? I would too, because that looked like a fine piece of chicken. You know, it's funny. I think the first time I've even seen that happen, uh, I think Discord actually lowered your volume after you did your little outburst. It was like... It, 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 I think I think that's the intention of the whatever the fuck they've done, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah, they need I, to can, undo but it. But you have a setting. You have a setting for yourself where you can have it automatically adjust. I don't because it. By the way, it has never been done well by any program ever. The raising and lowering volume automatically in these sorts of things never been done well. But you think they would have done it, it by now? Always. We got fucking AI Pixar films. Can't you fix the audio and? <laughs> Well, you well, it gives you the option to do it to do it to yourself. It gives you the option to manually choose how loud every other person is for you. At that point, I have all of these controls for volume. It's like stop fucking with my shit. I have my own yeah. settings. I will put them where I please. Shove it up your ass. Just how tortured he is. In the next scene, Bo. Oh, we can we can roll him back to make sure he got his, his full thought out there. Taking a huge bite, trying to forget and move on. This shows just how tortured he is. 
And then- there you go, Rags. He nailed um, it, right? Yeah. Great analysis. Yeah. Give him a little medal. That's a, yeah. Yeah, it's something. The next scene, Bo's old baby monitor starts to pick up signals from something. But what I always took away from this scene was that the signal doesn't become clear until the entire family is connected. To me, this was a hint that the only way they're all going to get out of this is by working together. That each member of the family has something special. Also, we get the first hint of Meryl's future obsession with the whole of. I don't. Know, I feel like, I feel. I feel like Mel and Meryl do like all the heavy lifting when it comes to working as a team here, and I don't. Is there a reason in universe for why if they all touch it? No, I don't it think gets... so. Okay. Because that doesn't, I don't think like technologically that makes any sense that the more people holding on to it, the clearer the signal gets. Um, and by working together, does he mean the Bo's con- contribution to that is leaving the glasses, like glasses of water everywhere, I guess? And I, it, his, I don't know. Yeah, and then the son's contribution is having asthma. I guess so. I don't know. <laughs> it, because, it, I mean, like, good good job, I guess. You did it. They didn't really need to do a whole lot to come together as a family. They had, like, one fight at dinner. That's about it. Yeah. I mean, that that is an interesting observation, because it does seem like yes. the director intended to do that. But, like, the reason it didn't register with me is because it makes no sense in regard to amplifying the signal. Like, why would that play a role? I think it creates the confusion because I can believe one. I, I'll totally buy that a baby monitor or maybe like a radio antenna can pick up alien communications because it's just all it does is it just receives the radio waves and, you know, the, in the atmosphere. It's like, yeah, it's it, it doesn't have to be in the atmosphere, but it just it senses the radio waves it's like, OK, I can buy that. So we, we've used a, a believable scientific sort of basis for what this technology can do. Now we're kind of getting into the... And then magically, the more people who touch it who need to work together in the future make the sound clearer. And doesn't it work pretty well throughout the rest of the movie? They don't need to be on top of anything. They just... Well, they don't have to touch it. Remember at the dinner scene when it's sitting at the edge of the table and it's really clear and bright and loud? Wasn't anybody yeah. touching it. That's correct. Um, and then there's also the... Uh... Don't don't let go. We'll lose the signal, and then he immediately lets go. Um, well, he because, takes it from him, and then yeah, the, it's very um. It, it feels like there's a couple of different things happening. Was I've seen some people reference how um the human body can act as somewhat of a of a boost electromagnetically, I think, or something in in some way to radio waves. There's probably something there that might be able to be taken advantage of, but simultaneously he is lifting it higher, which I think gives the audience that a I can sense. Believe. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like the the audience right. believes at this point it's the height that's making it happen, and then perhaps you're supposed to read into the subtext that they are together in this moment. But I think the film doesn't do a fantastic job of of binding this family and making them all seem like they have different components that make them strong together. It's more. I agree. It's also it's more, it's more generic incompetence for the aliens, right? Because like the the aliens are super secretive. The aliens have arrived. The aliens presumably don't necessarily want everybody to know that they're there or what they're doing, and yet all their communications can be intercepted by a child holding a baby monitor. In which case, they can be intercepted by pretty much anybody. In which case, we've got no business being as ignorant of them well, as we are. But there is a similar beat in Independence Day, isn't there? When they actually use the satellites to bounce the signal around the world, and then it's only by tapping into their own satellites that the humans can decode the aliens' transmissions. Then, of course, it turns out that the aliens all run on Windows 97, so they can be hacked. But up until that point, the actual communication discovery part makes more sense than this one does. I will... I think I'm... Because... I think it depends on what they hear as to the whole, should the aliens be aware of or care about if human um like radio transceiver receiver thingies can pick up sounds that they make if it's just weird noises i uh, think on the list they do say the they're, things... they're talking to each other there's two of them that's well, here, i actually don't like my ones. issue is yeah that my issue is that there's no way that they should arrive at that conclusion i think that this whole scene is really weird and it would be much much better and shorter if they were talking in the car about whatever it is they're talking about. Could be anything. And he just has the monitor. Uh, or the, he has the baby monitor. And then as they're talking, it starts making the really weird, creepy noises. And everyone just sort of pauses and looks at it. And that's just kind of the scene. 
without the whole don't touch it you touch it stop listen wait <laughs> climb on the car lift it up i don't know Array, i keep, the, I keep the going up part i think that's fine i would lose i, I would, would lose the don't touch don't let go thing because they clearly do at several points so i don't know what relevance that really has um and i also kind of think that holding it up to the sky and then hearing these noises there's something there in terms of uh the direct like the the, the connection of them it coming from aliens um the, that's to be taken use of i just i really don't like the line there's two of them talking it's like how, shut the fuck up yeah how did you decide <laughs> that and isn't it enough that there's weird creepy noises in this alien movie like yeah well, and, uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I think the sounds work better without that context, because yeah. we're all wondering, what Leave the fuck? Leave it to me. And is that the sound Let of the aliens? Is that the sound of it. their technology running? Or is that, the, is that interference? Is it a garbled version of something? It's like, who knows? It's like, no, it's two of them talking. You're like, oh. All right. And someone could say, like, well, he could be wrong. It's like, well, we know he's not wrong by the end of the movie. They, uh, they definitely right. speak that way. And that could have been something that we got instead of having him say it. It, it. I think he's off screen when it's said as well. It might be like a a bit of a, we better yeah. have that he in there. He didn't even otherwise. ask. It would have been better if he said like, are they talking? Is like, is, 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 uh, maybe, maybe Bo was like, is that the aliens? And then he's like, maybe they're talking. Again, I just, or something like that. surely so no comment that. from any of them just listening to it is more I effective, agree. No right? comment yeah. is best. Mo no comment is best. Maybe, it, maybe it's a very temporary thing when they hear it and they stop and listen to it. It only lasts for just a little bit, and then it goes away. And everyone's got that, like, that was creepy kind of moment. Event. The next scene is honestly one of the most suspenseful scenes I've ever seen in my life. Graham decides to investigate his crops at night. This might be my favorite from the film, I think. It's my favorite from the film, but I don't know if I'd describe it as one of the most suspenseful no. scenes I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, that's uh, that's a stretch. It's, that's, it's good. Uh, I liked it. Praise, but I, yeah, I don't think it soars that high. What? Here, let me ask you you this. Um, what would it? I imagine it would take all of us quite a lot to get us to, if we believe there's something creepy out there, to get a flashlight and walk out alone at night into the middle of a cornfield. Like that's. Like, I wouldn't do that, like, not even, like, I wouldn't do that, like, tonight, if I just, I, I just wouldn't do that on a whim. Well, to be so fair, I imagine... he's doing this because he wants to prove to himself there's nothing out there, right? Yeah, I'm, it... I mean, I'm just, like, saying, like, curious, there's gotta be, like, I don't know what it would take for me to do that in my own life. Would you do it with a gun like, in your hand? Just, no, I've seen, no, there's no way. That's creep central. There's a lot of things that I've learned in my life. I'm a repository of wisdom. And one of those things, one of my pearls, bloop, 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 look at them go, is you don't walk into a cornfield at night, right? Because that's where monsters are in Velociraptors. You don't fucking do that. All I right? knew You're Velociraptors were still around. Those people that's how they long. get you, all right? Don't go into cornfields at night alone. Just don't do it. You're asking for trouble. And if you go out and do it and say, nothing happened to me, it's like, oh, oh, did nothing happen to you? All right, keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Test your luck. <laughs> you Try it. What, what, what did you gain? What did you gain? Right? Oh, you live to see another morning, another sunrise. Good for you. I'm glad you're still around. But uh, don't count your chickens. Farmer's greatest enemy. All the raptors running around the corner. That's why he would have had a shotgun. Movie sucks. <laughs> the sound design for this scene is perfect. The dog barking. Wait, right, someone said, would you do it for your kids? Listen, they knew what they were getting into going out into the corner. Yeah, Rags, Rags would have kids, learned them well to never go never... in there. So if they're gone, they're That's done. how I know. That's how I know that they're like doppelgangers or it's like the Wendigo imitating voices is because I know my kids would never go out into a cornfield at night. I taught them from an early age. Listen, don't ever do it. If you hear my voice in the cornfield at night, it's a Wendigo. It's trying to lure you out there so it can <laughs> suck your blood or whatever. It's the Chupacabra. Don't do it, all right? I'm not going to put myself in that situation. And let's be honest, if they survive the night and they come back in the house, you're going to be like, yeah, you're Skrulls. You're, you're, you're whatever. You're, you're... Yeah, you're Skrulls. I saw you go out there and now you've come back and now you're two little Wendigos. And then that would be that. Boom, yeah, justice. Yeah, there you go, boom. And then I'd shoot him and you'd see all the tentacles and everything come out. And you're like, see, I knew it. I knew it. I told you about the cornfield thing. I do need to find my kids, though. Right, if, if Snyder made signs, the aliens would have been here for the corn. I mean... 
That's pretty funny. We need no. corn to fuel our intergalactic army. They Empire. feed the corn to we the to corn. the cosmic god. They feed him a little bit of corn. They're like, come on, let's go. In the background. Ooh, that's the an interesting idea. We need the water of your planet to sate the thirst of this demonic god that that we worship. That he will destroy the like entire universe thing. if we don't get him the water. Yeah. So we need your water. But no rags. Aliens would only ever come to us for exploration or to attack us. Our wheat. To gather our wheat. Our it is perfect. The dog barking in the background, the crickets, and the sounds coming from the alien all lend to that warm feeling of suspense I get from a well-directed film. A My warm, favorite warm shot. Feeling, feeling of suspense? Of, yeah, sorry. There's been a lot of really like awkward um, phrases in this in this video. It's it's kind of like taking me out of it a lot. Just like warm these suspense. weird ways of describing. You uh, have a warm, direction. moist, creamy feeling of suspense. <laughs> hey, listen, creamy it's suspense. nothing wrong with feeling warm, moist, and creamy. But if I was gonna like say suspense, I don't. Yeah, not warm. Like because when you're suspense, best. people normally oh, chill, equate that with right? chill. Oh, yeah, chill. chilly goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you get the shivers. Um, it's Your like blood that, runs yeah, cold. Yeah, it's yeah. like a Berenstain Bear book. Um, Maybe we're just not operating on Stuckman's level. He is a published author, remember? So. <laughs> we're not operating at this level. <laughs> suspense warms me. Yeah. It makes the blood rush to my skin, so it you know makes me feel warmer. I've I've heard suspense described as like a like a blanket, but in an uncomfortable way, like it's oppressive. Well, warm, I think yeah. like warm is more frequently associated with comfort. Comfort, you know, yeah. yeah. You know, like nice and warm and toasty. You know, beneath mm -hmm. the, the the sheets. Yeah. Suspense yeah. is like a, a touching a bag of sand. <laughs> <laughs> the only time that I, yeah, the only time I like wouldn't want to feel toasty is if I was in a toaster. I think. Yeah, but um, then you wouldn't be. That wouldn't be toasty. That'd be beyond that. I think. Well, um, you know what, Frangy, you're right. That's true. Why don't you say mm -hmm. that to Zod's wet and creamy neck? <laughs> Why do you say that to Zod's warm suspense? <laughs> <laughs> in this scene is the angle below Gibson before he kneels down. The shot and Gibson's performance really sell his desperation in that moment. They finally. I think that's fair. Oh, I, I would have liked oh, more on that it, scene, it, but uh, okay, yeah, we're moving on. I mean, if, it's, if, it's, if it is like one of the best uh, instances of suspense ever, I figured you'd talk well, about it for it's more the than best 30 for him. It's what, what, yeah. At the time, that was the best. What we talked about. Best. A few hours ago, what I really liked about the scene was that he managed to make each scenario scary, as in a complete lack of vision on anything beyond the corn in front of you, the long Very stretch of, of walkway, that was creepy yeah. too, it's not reassuring. The crop circle itself offering full view, that wasn't reassuring either. It's, a, it's an interesting scene for clarity increasing. And somehow that almost that almost reflects his uh, his interest in proving there's no alien, proving like you fuckers trying to do this to my crops, you're not going to get on t t TV, looking around and being like this isn't this isn't people, this is something else. I'm leaving. Like I I really like the way that happens. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think I think it is the best scene in the film. I see that. I, when if, when I see a character in a situation like that, especially like a horror movie, a horror comedy, or whatever he wants to call this, and they're like, "Yep." He's doing exactly what I do, and I'd fucking just bolt. I'd be out of there, like, I like a tree. Then, boy, I, I it really helps me to connect with the movie a lot. And that was a moment where I was totally on like the movie side. I was like, yeah, that's what I'd be doing in his situation. I even like the thing that he calls out when he goes out to the crop circle, and he's like, listen, if you're out here and you're doing this, I'm not gonna tell the news station. I'm not gonna call the police. You're not getting any attention, so don't even bother. Which is like, yeah, that would make that makes sense. If you believe that it was a bunch of, you know, you know, wacky pranksters, that's the kind of thing that you might say so that they'd stop. He's like, we're not gonna give you attention, so just don't even bother. Sometimes it makes me wonder, like, this is his analyzed and explained, very passionate film of all time that set him on his path to becoming a filmmaker. Um, I wonder if like he would really appreciate that point of view then because that's all he seemed to have to say about that scene i wonder if he thought about the nature of the different ways that m night makes it terrifying despite all forms of uh information gathering which was the core reason he went into the cornfield in the first place was to prove as the dog is is almost representative of his uh 
I guess, mental state, right? Like, he's trying to push away from that. But, you know, just saying all this stuff, I wonder if he would be like, oh, yeah, that is also good about this scene, and I, I knew that, I just didn't put it in the video. Or if you would say, like, oh, shit, I didn't think about that. Because I have no idea. Mm -hmm. mm. I think it's worth putting I it. I don't know... I don't know why this is one of his most suspenseful, favorite suspense scenes of all time. Like, what what about it? What Like, what specifically? Because, well, like, you know, there's so many scenes that do something comparable. What's so special about it? Is it that one low-angle shot? Is, that, do, um, is that it? Can we do a thing? Uh, nobody say it, but I, uh, everyone type out what you think is the first movie that comes to your mind for suspense. And then everyone press enter at the same time. I just want to see what happens. All right. A whole movie or like a moment or a scene? Um, the movie that the scene is from, if, even if it is just a scene. You put me on the spot. Now I'm blanking. Uh, so the reason why I said it is because I'm curious what uh, answers everyone's going to... Well, I mean, you guess that's obvious. Um, you said the first one that comes to our mind? First movie comes to mind for like top tier masterful suspense. Okay. Is everyone ready? Uh... Yes. Uh, sure. All right. Three, two, one, enter. Shit. Interesting. So we got. Uh, mine was Inglorious Bastards. Caps was Sicario. Rags was the thing. Fringy was the thing. And John was Uncut Gems. Where's yours, Platoon? I have completely blanked. <laughs> it just, it's just gone. Well. Well, I mean, why not? You could have, have just said signs. You could have just yeah, said you could signs. Have said signs. <laughs> it's, it's the I didn't same thing. I want to bet. agree with Stuckman. Why would I want to do that? Listen, a broken Stuckman is right. <laughs> Once a decade. <laughs> uh, chat have had many great examples. Um, I feel like. Hands. As as good as I as as much as I like the cornfield scene, and I would argue suspense is pretty strong in it. I feel like the uh, the opening scene and the uh, bar scene in Inglorious Bastards like destroy this in terms of sort of masterful oh, yeah. direction. Yeah. Um, I think so. Yeah, I think it's. I like if if I can think about a scene and remember how I felt watching it, like the unease and the tension, and being like, "Oh shit! Oh shit! Like what's gonna happen?" Then yeah. you know it's good. And for me, like the reason I say Sicario is not necessarily the whole movie, but it's the border crossing scene. I figured like, it would be that, that one, yeah. Yeah, that for me. And I think part of the reason that it, this one in Signs just feels like falls flat for me is like what, like what is the threat here exactly? You know, with Inglorious Bastards, Gibson might die in the middle of the movie. <laughs> I, 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 I semi joke, but oh, like, yeah, it, it is a tenseful scene, and I like it. I mean, but... it's not bad. I'm just wondering, like. Okay, if it's one of the most masterful ones he's ever seen, I'm like, the alien is just kind of doinking around in a cornfield. Like, what is, what is happening? What is it doing? What does it want? What is the threat here? I thoroughly enjoy the use of the word doink gig. That's the, uh, I'm gonna try to use that. In aliens, future. yeah, that's what aliens do. They, they doink, doink around doink in cornfields in the middle. That's of the what the aliens movie. do in this movie. They just doink around for half the film. They decide anyway. to turn on the TV after Gibson spots a freaking alien leg. Stop. Stop saying that. <laughs> I'm also being a little bit taken out of it by constantly going back and forth between calling him Graham and Mel Gibson. I don't know why that's kind of odd. I've committed to Mel Gibson. Yeah, I decided I, well, to say I think we've all committed to Mel Gibson, but he's been going back and forth. And when it comes to his uh, brother, Meryl, I, I, I've committed to Meryl. And That's for Bo, it's Bo. And for Sun, it's Sun. So. That's kind of funny. Again, it's crops and decides, you know what? There may be something to this. When they watch the news, they learn that ships have been spotted around the entire Earth. Do you think that he should have been, like, a lot more overt with what he told well, to so everyone? Rags, I, like, I would listen, leave. I would be like, we're going. I, I would be, there is a fucking creature out there. In the fucking cornfield at night, and you know how I feel about cornfields at night. We've been over this, <laughs> and they got the crop circles. We got spaceships. We got creepy shit out there. We are going to the lake. No, not fuck the lake. The ski. <laughs> we're, we're, no, going... we're going to ski at the lake because everyone likes to ski. We're going to wherever these ships aren't, and wherever the crop circles aren't. Earth. I love that they're just these little tiny dots on the screen and not some overblown CGI creation. See, for Why me, do you like uh, it? before Why? we hear his explanation, I just want to make clear, like, I actually, I want one or the other. I don't want a weird middle ground. I want them to be 
intelligent and subtle and knowing of what humans detect, or I want them to be like, fuck you, we're going to get you, Mars Attacks and uh, in, in, yeah, in like Ben's Day style. Care. And I think I'm starting to get more and more annoyed with, ah, yeah, they're not like the big CGI ships. It's like, what's your problem? <laughs> like, why <laughs> did you come up with the idea of a big CGI well, spaceship? Uh, that's the thing about it. Like, I almost want to go to bat for Independence Day somewhat. It, it's incredible and, and imposing when the ship first, uh, like, breaches the atmosphere. It's, so um, it's just like, it's so grand. And just yep. like holy fuck, that is a that is a different species coming here to fuck us up. While this is is, I agree. It's like oh, this is very curious, but um, I can't help but be in the back of my head being like, why did the aliens do this? Well, well why did they I will do make this? an uh, I will make an appeal to the first half of Arrival, which I really like. Um, the the fact that they're not there for various reasons, uh, or are they? But like the just the the sudden like matter of factness of their arrival and their the the manner at which they just sort of yeah do arrive. things or don't do things yeah arrive yeah that's the name yeah. um I really liked that um this is like yeah I you're right it's this weird sort of like do they care do they not and then you learn about what they want and you're like why are you stupid and it it, it like I said takes you out of the movie it really hurts. It's so much more realistic that way. No, what? Well, okay, so not... it's not necessarily... So there is no realism, because aliens have never come here yet. Um, I don't even know why you would conclude, well, it would be more realistic that if aliens showed up, they'd do this. It's like, oh, would it? Would it be more <laughs> realistic that they would do this rather than announce themselves or otherwise be invisible? There are um, and about 100,000 really reasons important. they could come. And that would then determine their approach and their technological prowess, their current status. This, there could be anything. Anything could happen. I, I, I think I'm just annoyed by like, yeah, this is better than the big CGI ships because it's realistic. It's like a disconnect in logic and like even taken as individual statements that don't make sense to me. Maybe the cre because this like with the current technology and someone's camera, like yeah, I guess. This looks like this looks realistic, but then everything surrounding why are we looking at it like this, the behavior of the aliens, everything else, it kind of ruins that sort of realistic tint that it has in certain contexts, like here. Any form. Just looking at these l lights in the sky, I feel like it's just one of those dumb movie things where it's like. Like they they have cloaking technology for their ships, so they don't want to be seen. But then, why have the glowing lights? But then, from a production standpoint, you don't want to have a shot of just an empty sky. <laughs> like, oh no, look, there's nothing. <laughs> like, you gotta have something well, there it, um, for the audience to be like, oh my god, aliens. Somewhat of an implication that this is not necessarily intended. They are fully camouflaged in day. It's at night that you can see this. The implication, of course, being okay. that like it's this might have been a flaw in the aliens' uh, camouflage. I mean, the level I of stupidity is on brand for them, isn't it? I mean, they, they are very, very stupid aliens. <laughs> they are very stupid. I assumed it was just that they, like, they were camouflaged, and then they decided to turn that off for some scenes. But no, that, that could be true as well. I don't why. know. It's just the remember, Meryl is like, oh, a bird flew into the ship and got killed. They are still there. You can't see them at all at daytime. That should I remember, be. That I should be that. This this is why it's easy to have or, or really useful to have like the one guy who's really into this and has a vested interest in finding this stuff out because you could have him say no 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 look 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 here and then he has this one video that he has on the internet or whatever of the bird that just suddenly hits nothing and then you know, dies and falls down to the ground and he's like see see look like and he puts way more credit or stock into that than anyone else everyone else thinks that's just a silly nonsense video and that starts to get the it's part of that escalation of what might be happening, this idea that, oh, they've been here the whole time kind of deal. There's a, there's a joke in My... chat that I think it would totally be accurate. There's two aliens at a console, and one of them is like, yeah, the humans still don't know we're here. And then the other one goes like, wait, are the fucking front lights on? And he's like, what? what? They're like, you left the fucking front light? And he goes, oh. Oh, and he reaches over and he grabs it. He's like, oh, shit, 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 shit. Like, flip, yeah. flips yeah, like the, the switch, and he's thing, like, yeah. did they, how long has that been on? And he's like, I... Oh, uh, probably, probably <laughs> didn't see it. I don't, honestly, I don't they think... probably thought I was a is a star. Or it's something. fine. You, know I think I'm, I think you had still... one job. Don't leave the fucking lights on. <laughs> I'm oh, still annoyed by the way that he said this. Like, ah, yeah, this is better than if there was a big ship there. Why do you, you know... say that? Why? Why would? It, why is this better He's, than he, that? He, he was clear with you. For he said it's more realistic. I, I don't even know why he said that though. Is it? Why, is it because? 
I mean, I'm trying to give him a lot of credit here, but if is it because this looks more like supposed UFO sightings that people do have, you know? Well, like, we should have said that, I guess. Yeah, yes, of course. <laughs> and even then, I don't know if that's re- like that's necessarily an argument for why that's better than a big CGI ship. No, so it isn't. It's just a personal like, preference that he likes yeah. the sort of like, oh, you only see it from grainy footage on TV. He likes that better. It doesn't yeah. really offer a good reason why either. Mm-hmm. And then, Something... of course, as we've talked about, this kind of doesn't make sense. Not really. Yeah. Well, my impression from watching the movie was that, like, there's a certain point where they go, oh my gosh, now they've gone dark. Now they've gone camouflaged. So that means bad things are going to happen. But then later they sh- they arrive in full force, in full view. I don't I don't understand when they do and don't go camouflage. I don't, like what what are they what are they after? What are they aiming towards? They're silly. They're silly. They're They're, goofy, they are some silly gooses. Now, well, like someone I said, pretty sure they were announcing their arrival, and it's like maybe, but again, it just makes you ask more questions. Um, there was a part because we actually brought up um extraterrestrial was that the movie the fun yeah. one or was that oh yeah so the the the, the, the shitty movie the, the bad yeah, one yeah, that we did yeah. EPAP on yeah so there's actually a part of that movie that i really quite liked and i thought it was i've never seen it before and that's when they're running away from the alien uh the, the aliens and they're in the woods and it's raining and as they're like backing away and trying to get around the road to get away from the aliens all of a sudden, they like walk underneath it, and there's no rain anymore. Oh, I remember but that. Yeah. we don't see that. Yeah, I thought that was really cool because, like, all of a sudden it's not raining, and you can, you know, they were it became super overt afterwards. But it's like a cool little like, oh yeah, they've just they've inadvertently walked underneath the ship, and the no rain is because the ship's blocking the rain. So you had like the screen where it was half rain, half not rain, and. And then she walked underneath it. And I was like, oh, like, that's cool. That's the kind of stuff that you would sort of expect. Like, okay, it makes sense that if they had, like, cloaking technology and stuff like that, I I could buy that they would have that. But, like, it would block the rain. That's pretty, you know, decently intuitive for a movie experience and aliens and stuff. So it's one of those little things that you could have done that's really clever and neat and kind of creepy, especially if you play it slow and straight, let tension build a little bit as to, oh, like, how come it's not raining anymore? Um, But I just... This so this discussion made me think you. about that. And then right, maybe, I think about the rest of that movie, and I stop. Unless I'm mistaken, like so, I guess there is a movie called Extraterrestrial that I wasn't aware of, and I assumed anytime you mentioned, I thought you were talking about ET. No, you had mentioned like a <laughs> a scene, and I'm like, I didn't remember that scene in the movie, but whatever, I haven't seen it in a while. Maybe I just forgot about it. I mean, a, a guy. So I think there gets... is another movie called Extraterrestrial. What yeah. year was that? A guy gets anal probed in it. I'm pretty sure at the end. So it's definitely not ET. Yeah. <laughs> it's, okay. I think that would be. It's like movie. a violent, terrible movie. And the government's in on it, and it's all like aliens want to kill yeah. and kidnap and this sort of thing. What, so watch it's... the EFAP movies on it. That'll be better yeah. than watching the movie, because you'll have us laughing oh, okay. at it with you. Um, hey. We also watched, what was the cool, other alien cool. movie we watched semi-recently? The one with um, Carrie Russell. Um, oh, was that the, um, was that, that on our little body snatchers? That, that was, I said semi-recently. Was, uh... It's all relative for me. Okay, I can't remember was, what it was called. That movie sucked. The Body Snatchers remake, or are you? T- no, oh, was it, was it Dark I know Sky? what you're talking about. Yeah, it was something, something like that. that. Yeah, yeah, that was a dumb one too. Mm. Where all the birds die, or something. They all the birds like kamikaze into the house. Right? Yeah, we got very disappointed because there's a, I think a few scenes in that that we were like, oh, that was cool, couple, and then yeah. Yeah, yeah. a couple ones. Did you guys see fire in the sky? No, that's the that's... sun. Probably one of the most harrowing abduction scenes I've ever seen. Hmm. Oh, uh, I'm not. It's I'm worth not checking out. Just... Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let me see. Green and not some overblown CGI creation. It's so much more realistic that way. Eventually, the kids fall asleep, and we get what is possibly the most important scene in the entire movie. Mer- He's probably right about that. This scene is designed yeah, to I'm bind the point of the theme. film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Carol is feeling very worried and quietly begs Graham to be like he used to be just for a little bit. Graham reluctantly tells him a story about consequence, coincidence, and fate, breaking your average person down into two groups, those who believe things happen for a reason and those who believe in random chance. The conversation turns from light-hearted to dark when Graham mentions the last words his wife said before she died. 
He says she said, see, then swing away. Graham believes her brain was failing her as she died, letting random thoughts escape her mouth without meaning. He admits he no longer believes in God. This is when we get our first dream. Graham is dreaming about the night his wife died. When he wakes, he finds Meryl has taken the TV into the closet, saying the kids were getting too obsessed. We're back to sort of just saying what happens. Yeah, like, yeah, this yeah. is what You're going to analyze that scene? I mean, it's, it's really weird like, that he just went over what is one of the most important scenes, like, actually, and he didn't really say much about it at all. Well, yeah, it took us, like, 15 seconds and we're done. He just I guess maybe, what he said. maybe you'll talk about it later. But, I mean, you know... It, talk about it now, but... Yeah. You know. <laughs> He thinks the aliens are using the crop circles as a mapping system and talks about how their ships might be cloaked during the daytime due to a bird flying into what appeared to be a wall in the sky. Interestingly, Those two there was a... shouldn't go together. If aliens have cloaking devices, they don't need to draw fucking maps in corn. No, like, no, they don't. You're not... right. It's not. I don't like that. I'm sorry. The core conceit of this fucking movie being the ball about the crop circles doesn't work. Why would they need that to navigate? That's nonsense. Craziness. Oh, but it's more realistic, you see. No. Also, do you have that one alien that's like, hey, if we do that, it kind of, it'll put the humans on, on guard, you know? Maybe we shouldn't do that. And also, you left the lights on. <laughs> in the sky. Interestingly, there was a deleted scene in the film where the family drove by a dead bird, which would have linked up Wouldn't in our minds. Wouldn't it be funny when if, uh, if, you know, you remember the scene of Breaking Bad where, like, because I left the key in the, uh, in the ignition? It like drank yeah. the battery. Can you imagine if when they're about to leave, it's like, all right, I think we're done here. Let's leave. And then one of them <laughs> this like doesn't work. <laughs> Makes a revving sound, like yeah. repeated <laughs> failures. <laughs> yeah. Stop, you're gonna flood it. <laughs> you won't believe what I just did. Shit. Like, no, right. <laughs> I'm just picturing a, a like a dinky little UFO ship and the alien pokes his head out the window with Mel Gibson chasing him and he's like, No, and he's trying to start the ship up. Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna give me <laughs> a dead bird, which would have linked up in our minds when Meryl said this. Next, Graham observes his family falling more and more into obsession and worry. Knight wisely plays a lot of this for comedy, rather than make it all too serious. When he wise? gets a phone Why is that wisely wise? is not the word I would use. I also, I, I, got, I got confused when they looked at the image of the house being burned apart, the dead people that being like, <laughs> we're looking a little too much. It's just like, okay, this we're doing funny, I guess call from who we eventually learn is Ray Reddy, Shyamalan's character, we hear him say, Father, then what sounds like claws scampering on wood in the background. The phone goes dead and Graham looks into a room revealing an incomplete dress, still hanging up. The box in the corner has his wife's name, Colleen, written on it. It's clear he knows he has just spoken to his wife's accidental killer. Graham decides to go to Ray's house to check on him, but before this scene starts, Bo tells Morgan she doesn't want him to die. Who said I was going to die? He continues to repeat. Now, earlier I talked about the exchange Graham had with his... Hey, all right. That... Well, he stopped, yeah, I mean, he stopped talking kinda... about scenes as much now. He's just... Not... Uh... Yeah, like, I think this movie's not good, but, like, there's things to analyze and talk about, as yeah. we've been doing for the last however many... How much however long... Come on, been. Chris. Get yeah, passionately into it, man. We're Saturday, uh, so. a reference chat. We are halfway through, pretty much. I mean, if there He's might also, be some... It's like... It's kind of interesting how much this film is just obviously a play on, say, like close, something like Close Encounters in particular, because like so many of the beats are basically the same. Uh, this, like, the scenes he's just been describing are sort of like with a different perspective. They are the scenes in Close Encounters when he's getting more and more obsessed, um, and he's seeing this sort of vision, and he keeps, you know, he creates this mountain out of clay and all the rest of that shit. Before he really knows what it is, he gets more obsessed about it, but the perspective is different, and so like his obsession is is the thing that he believes and we kind of know to be correct, but it causes his family to abandon him because they think he's gone mad and then he's proven to be correct. And in this situation, it's basically the same thing, just the other way around. The family are getting more obsessed. He's refusing to see it until he can no longer refuse to see it, in which case he joins the obsession, which happens to be the truth. But like in terms of basic plot structure, even the like individual scenes, the family dynamic, the thematic messaging, it's basically is just close encounters. The main difference is that in this movie, he's decided that the aliens are hostile, which has created this massive array of incompetence that close encounters doesn't have to deal with. Yeah, it's like a cascading effect right. on every decision we see them make, whether subtle, passive, or active. It's, it's very uh, hard not to think about. And I think 
we saw it earlier, but some people are like, you're not supposed to really care about that. It's more about the notion of family, togetherness, faith, that all. And it's like, um, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of what the whole <laughs> Again, thing of the film is you're built You're only going to be able to extrapolate the subtext through the text. There's no text. There's nothing. Like, it, all of the meaning has to be derived from what is happening in the film, which means you have to grapple with what happens in the film, mm -hmm. like the plot. Yeah. You can't Children. ignore the text just because it's in service of the subtext. Well, and, and well, sure. the, the suggestion is almost that if it were coherent, that would be worse or something. Like, like why wouldn't you want that? Surely that would be better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The conversation about taking Houdini to see Dr. Crawford. The kid said he doesn't treat animals. It actually took me a few viewings to realize something kind of cool Knight put in the script that was very... You're playing this clip for too long, Chris. This is spooky. You're gonna get hit with uh, all the bots. They're gonna come get you in your sleep. Very subtle. We get one wide shot this of is Ray's not house. Subtle. Seeing well, wait, hang on. What's he saying? That he all? is a veterinarian. Now that earlier scene makes sense. Graham didn't want to take their dog to see the actual vet, since that's the guy responsible for his wife's death. I think this is fantastic writing. I love when a director I, slash. It's not fantastic. I'd say it's okay. I could be pushed to good. It's not fantastic. I think I'll settle for good, but that um, it's very minor. As in, like this doesn't really tip the scale at all in any particular way. In fact, I wish the whole film were filled with these sorts of details. Mm -hmm. So I would much rather the the scene with the initial seeing of Reddy was cut. And the decision on Mel Gibson's part was instead to begrudgingly take the animal to the vet. And then you, through his interaction with the vet, you see that he's sort of callous towards him. And that's where you get a sense that there's some bad blood there. You know what I mean? I, I think that would, that would have been preferable. I also think Especially because you could probably draw some, you could draw some like parallels between the idea that this is the guy who ended up you know, essentially leaving his children motherless. And yet, in order to comfort them and to help them by, you know, getting the animal the treatment it needs for their sake, he has to go to the same person to help his children. So mm. that's like a thing. The, I think you're absolutely right, because the, the vision of this movie where he actually does take the dog to him when we get that scene early on, this, imagine the work you can do in a scene where they need to communicate the problems with the dog between the two men yeah. who have that history. Like the I'm not I'm not saying that that makes it better or worse necessarily. I'm just saying that it should be entertained surely um as an option that uh, M Night did not go with because like I said I don't particularly I'm not hugely fond of the scene where we see him briefly in the in the town. I don't I don't think it adds that much but there's some other options you could do. This this note of why why did Mel Gibson suggest that they should take the dog to a a doctor that's not familiar with uh, animals versus a veterinarian, and then finding out that Ray Reddy is the veterinarian likely local to this area is like, sure, yeah, that's cool. That's that's what we call subtle too. You wouldn't expect from um, a, a movie like this doesn't leave a lot to the uh, to the viewer to pick up in terms of like uh, pieces. But I, I I guess what you know what's interesting. This is his favorite film of all time. If there's any others, Chris, please highlight them because. Uh, it would it would make me feel better about the you know the quality of the script in this film, but I don't like this. This is one I can't think I'm of. Not, you know, and I'm not feeling the like it it. I'm not feeling the passion here for this, like how important this movie is to him and how meaningful it is to him. Yet, I mean, obviously we're halfway through. So far, I'm not. I'm not yeah, we're probably gonna it. get a. I'm um, not feeling it. You know, like once the summary is complete, you'll get your. Uh, or rather, once the I was about to say once the analysis is complete, you'll get the explained part. But this isn't even analysis. This is more so summary. I, I don't know. It, it, we'll just we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Can we can me. we call, can we call it good if veterinarian is just written on his mailbox? <laughs> the thing, I I think it is just a matter of how far removed the scenes are. It's quite a while away, right? Yeah, As and, opposed to if it was yeah. the scene before, that's got to be worth something. I mean, if he works from home, it'd be fine to have a sign that says licensed veterinarian, but I wouldn't put that think, on the mailbox. Well, I, I guess it's, it it's is, just this look is at house. how prominent it is on the scene. Like, look at this shot. No, I, know? I, I mean, I know it's his house, but I mean, like, if he is working from home, like, he expects people to bring their animals straight to his house to work. 
I don't Couldn't know. Couldn't be on that's... the side of his van that we saw him driving away earlier. I mean, would that be mm. subtler? I think mm. that would be subtler if it was, just... you know, kind of a blink and you miss it. Sort I still, of I still think Fringy, what you said it is might be completely that, but... right. The distance and the, there's no expect. We were never in a position of. I wonder who the veterinarian is because it's so quick and so not interesting in terms of the overall story yeah, of get does, him to a doctor that you're not thinking about it. I don't think it doesn't do the thing that bad movies tend to do, where so much emphasis is put on it it's kind of like actually decently blended into the broader conversation so it's why mm -hmm. i'd be i think the floor is okay i think it could be pushed to good but this is not like fantastic that's, well, like, uh, that's my main thing here excessive. is he sounded somewhat passionate about this detail this is the, probably the most interesting thing that he said about the movie to me and i wish i wish the video were with that well, we're mostly. halfway through the video we're yeah. halfway through like if you had a bunch of these like in a row i feel like it would be pretty cool but We'll see. We'll see what else yeah, we Yeah, considering what he skipped over, I mean, we're doing the heavy lifting, if anything. So, Writer respects the audience and doesn't spoon-feed them all the little details like this. Um, They're talking. Uh, I would also argue it spoon-feeds a hell of a lot in this film. There's very yeah, little room to misinterpret. It feeds a lot. All the most People consequential through, stuff, yeah. People go through some really crazy... They, they jump to a lot of conclusions in order for the film to tell me what's going on and even the film that he said or the part of the film that was really excellent which is Marilyn the recruiting office the way that that sort of just sort of happened at explaining everything and it felt like oh this is really expositiony um there was all the details and specifics and everything mm. with the goofy characters i i felt like i was not at all being uh, allowed to explore the movie and discover things for myself i was being clumsily told what i need to know Next, we get a very emotional scene that is played with remarkable subtlety on the part of Gibson. And Knight honestly isn't too bad here. No, As I, I said, I'd say I'd say all of the praise is on Mel Gibson. And well, I would actually argue, um, unfortunately Mad. for yeah. M. Knight, Gibson's fucking talent as an actor highlights his sort of like that he shouldn't uh, be here. He probably he shouldn't be in this scene. No, in the movie. Yeah. Um, yeah Do you want to have there's... a scene with Mel Gibson? Is that it? Well, no, I think it is just, is like, he, I don't know, just interested in the idea of, I'm going to put myself in the movie. Wouldn't that be, like, a cool thing? He often does. But it's, it's yeah. like, yeah, it's, uh, this, this in particular is a scene that highlights that it should have been, like, an actor, <laughs> you know? It feels, yeah, it, it's different when I watch a Star Trek film, and it's directed by, you know, Leonard Nimoy, when it's directed by William well, Shatner, course, and these are, like, yeah. their characters, it's very much them, and it's a very prominent role that they do, and they have a vested interest in all of this. That feels distinctly different from this. I, I hate to criticize your performance here, because apparently like, you? His, you? His, his real grandfather died the previous day in real life. Oh, geez. And supposedly, really? yeah, in this scene, he's like channeling that grief, but I just don't really oh, see well. it. Well, I mean, I wouldn't uh, hold it again. Like, he's not an actor. That's the thing. He's not an actor. Yeah. Yeah, so his talent it, is right. elsewhere. Like, I, I wouldn't deny at all that he's like grieving. It's, but I just, yeah, he, he. I don't How think he can convey that is. on camera. Yeah, I, th I think it would. That feels like a, an illustration of the nature of um, acting. Is you know, it's it's the ability to translate uh, whatever feelings that you can manifest in yourself in a way that's uh, like you know readable by an audience that they I can grasp that it's conveyed strongly. Yeah, it's worthy of probably making that you know sort of distinction, perhaps. Whereas, like, I can believe one hundred percent that M Night is really like real is like actually sad um, when he's doing this. But when an actor is acting sad, that that's like what like acting is. It's not actually being sad. It's conveying that the character you're playing is sad. And you, someone can be very very sad in real life, and someone can be in deep sorrow, and someone can be having all kinds of emotions in real life, but it just doesn't show. It doesn't fit a film in, you know, in, in, in a manner of speaking. But the way that people truly express emotion isn't often dramatic. It isn't often readable. Um, so it's, it's just, it's different. Just because you might be, you know, sad in real life because of a tragedy, that doesn't mean that that just is, it, it's not easy mode for getting into character. It's still like acting is a skill. Being able to use that and channel that stuff, it is a skill, it takes practice and it takes talent. And there's a reason yeah. why the best of the best who do it are, you know, very revered for that ability. Well, there's a, um, a high correlation of the greatest actors of all time having, like, theatrical training from a young age. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
the thespians, right? And um, and that's not to say at all. It's like, well, this, you're asking a lot of M. Night. He just wanted to start his own movie somewhat. It's like, yeah, no, I, I, I just mean that this scene, I think, would have been stronger with an actor who's better suited for uh, the weight of it. I think Mel Gibson nails it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's just noticeable with who he's acting across from. And it's also like, know you know, this one thing to say, I want to star in my own movie, and it's another thing to say, and I'm going to put myself in technically one of the most pivotal roles in that movie for one of the most emotionally impacting scenes. Yeah. Uh, and have to convey a performance that is way beyond a cameo. Like, this is kind of vital, I think, to convey. Uh, that's yeah. a sort of hubris, which is not really forgivable. I would, I would, if I was writing something and I, I was making stories and stuff, I would want to put myself in the movie as a cameo, a little background mm. character. I'd want to, oh, yummy carrot, I'm going to throw this spear and then quick cut away and then I'm gone. But and it, when it starts to get to more than that, I'm like, eh, you know, like maybe a line, a side character. I'm the clerk that says, have a good day, Mr. Johnson. There's something like that. But that's that's like it. I, once well, it starts getting past that. It's I'm always like, a case eh, by case because if Andy Serkis was turned out to have directed like uh, all of... I don't know. One of the, the Lord of the, of the Rings. Apes. I mean, I, I was trying to stay within, the, like, because everyone knows the he film. didn't. The, he did direct pieces of Lord of the Rings, actually. But um, if he had directed all of hey, it, it, I actually do think that we would all be like, yeah, but he was so fucking good as Gollum, though. Yeah, a lot. Well, it's Which, like many things. It 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 comes down to the whole like, well, did you execute it well? Did you do a good job? Like, it might be hubristic, it might come across as, you know, being, like, too me, 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 but, hey, if you nail it, then you nail it, and that's what kind of counts. The cameo thing was just making me think of Peter Serafinowicz doing Michael Cade giving an acting class. How, like, he's in the background of every shot. <laughs> just imagine that would be, like, the self-insert, just like M. Night Shyamalan that would be is fun. just in the yeah. background of every being shot in a movie, for no reason. Including movie, a shot that already has... Act. Including a shot that already has Shamblin in it. Shamblin that is also standing funny. in the back. Yeah, that would be pretty funny. I was just thinking, by the way. If um, it was like that would be a legitimately funny thing in a comedy, especially, yeah. It was like this doubling up on the cameos of the same <laughs> shot. Uh, didn't Clint Eastwood he directed Million Dollar Baby and uh, Unforgiven, right? Unforgiven. Yes. As far as I know, he did direct those it and he also yeah, stars the, in them. What's yeah. funny is like I would never want him replaced as both of the roles he plays in those movies ever. Well, <laughs> hey, he's a, he's, a, a, he's an actor. He's, an he's actor a great actor director. and a great director. Yeah. So, Well, that's what I, I was mean, saying. Go it's it's, it, it's going to be case by case as well. Execution. Because if, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess uh, what I'm thinking about is you're A Million Ways to Die in the West. You guys remember uh, that movie? Yeah. No. I, never saw saw that one. I, I just didn't like the movie in general, not just Seth MacFarlane in it, to be fair. Not... I mean, it's a bad movie, um, but it's more so that Seth MacFarlane felt like particularly. I feel like he should have gotten someone else to to, to to play the leading man in that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, he is. Uh, he is. I think a quite talented voice actor. I don't know if I would say that that translates as well to just you know like a live action performance. No, exactly. I could not take him seriously in a live action role, but when it comes to animated vo like voices in animation. Like, he's suited for that. Oh, wait. It's not working for me. Um, oh, it's, it's working, working for us, me. so just give a... Yeah, just give it a reload, and uh, it should... Yeah, be what you need Everyone... to do is you hit refresh, and then get on the ground and, and go in a circle like a worm. Go... Okay. And then when you get back up, it'll have reset. Are you sure you have to about all around that? on the right? Yeah, you gotta doink around on the rug. Oh, I no, don't want to doink. You don't, no, you gotta, you gotta just get on the ground like a little worm and go... Yeah, go that's what the, the aliens are doing, right? In the cornfield? Well, they were on the ground like were, a worm, yeah, right? But you, gotta, you gotta have, like, your arms by your side. You gotta pin them to your side and, yeah. and, and go around Feed in a circle. Feel the worm. Feel the worm. The worm. You are yeah, a head and, and a tail. Whoa. Well, the thing is, is that you, I, it's more like you gotta try and, you know, you gotta lay on your side and do it and, and, and wriggle. You gotta, which is difficult, actually, to, uh, on your side with your arms together to just, you know, move. It's hard, because not much leverage, but still. You gotta give it your best shot if you want to refresh. I presume that Waller is doing it while I'm explaining it, so when he's back. Yeah. Yep, I, uh, uh, we'll well, I gotta, I gotta go refresh my beverage, so let me do that on the way over there. Well, I can't, because I'll have to have the... I'll have to transport the the adventure will have to continue without you, Rags. Well, all right then.
That's fine. That's all right. <laughs> you could tell he was very hurt by that. That went straight to I don't have heart. to. Listen, <laughs> I know there are some, some scandalous rumors about me out there, but it's not all about me, you know? It really isn't. He's now considering killing all of us. No. Oh God. He's going to ask us like all Batman. to... He's going to no. tell us all to go to the cornfield at night. He's going to be like, yeah, 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 no, there's a cake in there. Go for it. No, for... for I'm not, I not, I'm not considering killing all of you, but I am like Batman, <laughs> where just in case one of you turns evil... I have a way of dealing with you. Ah, oh my God! But I'm not. I'm not considering it. Is that, I'm not I don't considering it. it. I'm planning for it. No, no. I, I wasn't even thinking. I, I had forgot that I even had done all of that years ago. But now, now that you've brought it up, so protocols are in place. All right, everything's working again. Just listen. Don't <laughs> worry the event about rise. it. Just don't worry about it. Okay. Anyway, bye, Rags. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Very emotional scene that is played with remarkable subtlety. Just to be clear, I'm not like leaving, leaving. <laughs> I, I, I was just gonna go get a drink. Oh, get out of here! Not like, I'm not go. leaving this drink. Go I was doing. just saying, I was just gonna go to the other side of the, this this abode and just grab something and refill something and then be. You would have been back by now. You said it. No, but but you said it like you were expecting me to leave, leave. Which you because you don't typically say goodbye when I go to get a beverage or when I visit the loo as I do many times on account of my hydration intake. Rags, have you? I was a bit uncertain what just, was happening. If if Sorry. you just disappeared in silence briefly and then came back, you would have been back by now. Mm -hmm. Have you considered that if I was gone without warning and you had a really important question or an important life anecdote or you had some some inquiry for me and you ask and I wasn't there to answer you you might feel hurt that I was ignoring you well no and my conclusion would be, would be oh I guess he didn't hear it slash he wasn't there I'll just wait until he's back and then ask him again that's fair that's fair you know, rather, rags. Than, rather than abandoning that line <laughs> of inquiry but yeah no, anyway get your, get your drink rags all right I'll do that um, I'm gonna go do go that, do and then I'll be right back. So, I'll tell you what, I'll use the turn off microphone thing, so when it pops back down like normal, then you'll be like, oh, he must be back. Someone press that button. Bye, Rex. Go. All right, I'm going. I'm going over there. Yes. Next, we get a very emotional scene that is played with remarkable subtlety on the part of Gibson. And Knight honestly isn't too bad here. As I said earlier, he felt I didn't know he was to say a... that is interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. It was a f sort of framing of the analysis of of Shia. You know, like isn't acting. that bad. It's like, hmm, <laughs> why'd you say that? I feel like I'm in a time loop, and I just want to get past this one short clip where he says the same <laughs> thing. And we directed the first time I saw this ahead. movie, and the scene worked for me. The two men have a bit of a recompense when Ray acknowledges that he's caused Graham to question his faith. He also mentions that he's heading for the lake because some have theorized that the aliens have been avoiding water before driving. Again, based on I like how what? quickly we move past that. Yeah, they theorize that they don't like water. Oh, how? What gave you that? It, it was a joke that people made. It's like they are, we also theorized they don't like lava. We also theorized they don't like literally anything that they're not technically in proximity to. Like. <laughs> Yeah, because that's the. Ex it, doesn't he say something like, "Well, we haven't seen any crop signs near water, so we guess they don't like water very much." It's like, okay, but well, like, there are lots of things that you haven't seen crop signs near. Yeah, it's not just water. Well, and also, isn't it just likely that if crop circles are appearing in pastures, I mean, yeah, that's probably going to be, you know, not on the coast <laughs> typically, like right on the coast. <laughs> well, and, and, and what many, counts? What many crop counts? circles what if inside, like inner cities? Does yeah. a stream count? Does a lake count? Well, and also because he says no, I, but like uh, I don't I, know, I just don't buy it. I think something else, like because uh, I was thinking about it, but then I realized, oh, they probably wouldn't want to do that because it just creates problem with the film. Like if they noticed that the crop circles were appearing in more arid, um, or not not necessarily arid, but drier locations, right? That there weren't as many crop circles in um like near rainforests or around rainforests or the tropics or things like that. But all that does is invite those questions of oh yeah, because water hurts them so it'd be really 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 weird <laughs> that they would show up on this planet where it rains with a good degree of frequency in most places off he tells graham he locked one of them in his pantry next we get what for some myself included was the scariest scene in the film most just refer to it as the disturbing footage scene this scene was actually listed number 77 in bravo's 100 scariest movie moments 
77. All right. <laughs> I guess it's on the list. That's uh, uh, that's cool. I, uh, the thing for me with this one is uh, I've always found it distracting as to what the fuck is the alien doing? Why? Yes. Why? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, I feel like there's just no good answer to that question. Moments. It's the first time we get a good look at the creatures, but at the same time, it isn't. The first time we see the aliens is not in some beautiful wide shot with sparks flying everywhere and big CGI creations. It's on a hand. <laughs> well, I mean, it is what? CGI. Uh, yes. So, and I also just I don't like the way it's presented. Yeah, we didn't see the aliens with sparks flying in the CGI. What What is that? As an observation. Well, I think specifically it's a guy in a mocap suit, and they put a CGI skin. Over time. Well, I mean, I, I guess that's what I'm saying is like his critic, like it's CG. The aliens yeah. are CGI. They're not practical. And contextually, right. like a very sparky, flashy CGI introduction to an alien might make more sense than an alien creeping out of a bush next to a children's party. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it could actually just be better. Well, I and I mean, I'm again reminded, it's kind of interesting that he used Independence Day as an example of like, oh, look at this CGI. The aliens in that were practical. They were amazing looking, those things. And yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. Is uh is the first time we see them properly when Will Smith uh opens up the ship and punches him in the face? Well, just the yeah, it says, it's like screaming. There's oh, yeah, thing smoke, the tentacles going everywhere. It's like you could argue it's like oh look at this crazy thing. It's like yeah, but I mean it's achieving what it's achieving. Like why are we what are we exactly. doing here? Why can't you celebrate this for what it is as opposed to what it isn't? I, I think I, I'm just, I'm getting tired of all of this like, ah, yeah, but, like it's not CGI, it's not CGI, and that's good. It's, uh, it's annoying because it's not an observation really at all, and it downplays the accomplishments of times when the use of CGI in these sorts of stories works. And it also just doesn't even make sense. These are CGI aliens. They're not yeah. people in suits. There's another tiny little thing about this scene that sort of bugs me as well, which is that the, the main Volkswagen kid... Volkswagen Beagle? Beetle? It's not the Volkswagen, no, though I'm not a huge fan of that car. It's that the kid is, is actually really aware of his international audience. So this is in Brazil, right? So that they're all speaking Portuguese, um, and it's found footage, basically. So, like, you know, the, everyone there is presumably from the local area, or at least the same country. But at one point, the kid just breaks out of his native tongue completely and says, it's behind in English, just in case, okay. I guess, the audience hadn't picked up on that. And it's a tiny thing, but it kind of bugs me, because I don't understand why he's doing it's that. It's so unnecessary, yeah, too. Yeah, that little break. Yeah, it's that break in the illusion of the movie, you know? Well, and also, I just I feel like too many it's people like, have yeah, the same like take on this, which is like, wait, what? I know, and for the record, I know people found this, like, scary in the cinema. I, I remember that being a thing, but I also remember everybody once, you know, calming down, being like, wait, why did that happen? And it's, it's just, yeah. your brain fucks with you on that. It's it's like, it's hard for me to find this scary because now I'm thinking about this this guy doinking. I, I don't want to be thinking about him doinking. Why did he do yeah. this? Yeah. Why was he just walking around out in broad daylight? What's yeah. he up to? I just checked it I mean, out. This... Scoping out the He's place. walking the dog. Yeah. <laughs> the alien dog. I just He's wanted walking. to check out this child's birthday party. Yeah. I mean, this, this scene does strike me as silly, period. But I mean, a lot of people did find this scary and there must be like something to that. And if I, if I were to give this scene anything as there is something there about suddenly seeing the alien and it's just walking around like a dude there's something like unexpected about it also well, my but, praise like, would be in the um the way they format this is to deliberately distort as much as possible that's within reason and then uh, the alien is right. blurry when they pause the screen to have it be like this is the first ever sighting that's very clear and that we recognize now that the danger for the world it feels like mm -hmm. it may have a more of an impact, the fact that this is being shown on the news. The whole world sees this. What does it mean? Where right. is it going? And precisely, like, a lot of that intrigue and suspense is going to be damaged when we find out what the answer is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, on a rewatch, how well does this uh, stack up in terms of making them look spooky? And I, I also have some respect for the fact that this was shot with, like, a consumer grade camcorder sure. I like think i that... hate when i hate when something like this is shot with an expensive movie camera and then in post it's made to look like they shitty just put and a staticky. layer over it instead yeah. of lowering the resolution a whole bunch and adding that little offset cut because there's you can just look up guides on youtube on how to make your sony vegas video look like a 90s camcorder it has all the steps and it's like wow that's really impressive that you could just do that and then normally what they do in these massive productions is you're right they'll just put a 
shitty yeah, filters. It'll be like super high resolution, and they'll make it black and white, or they'll put like a little bitty film over the top of it to be like, see, see, it's old. It's like, no, 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 it's not old. I could see everything clearly. It's not old. Yeah. Noise and glitch effects for no fucking reason. Like, what are you doing? Whacking the camera? Like, <laughs> usually they don't do that. Um, and yeah, I, I think the it's all deliberate to obscure the visual of the alien because that's an approach they have throughout the film. Probably because it would be very difficult to have, you know, like there's some shots that are cl pretty clean at the end, but the, they still want to avoid it fully, probably because it's hard to realize it fully and to integrate yeah. it fully in 2002. And held yeah. cam from a foreign country. This is one of the best ideas. Though, you know what? Now I'm starting what? to think about Baller. it. Would... What what about getting a very very skinny rail of a man and getting him in a really well designed makeup outfit? I yeah, like just that... give him the do the predator thing where he's got the really cool, well articulated yeah. like, hat helmet thing, and then uh, I I mean that I, I think so with how kind of prominently they're showing these guys. Well, like, then, I, yeah. I think we're owed a discussion on that from Chris because he's been praising the film for using practical where where he thinks it was suitable. Tell us why the aliens weren't practical. Well, but practical also, why, was did you, why was your point of praise of the reveal of the alien? It's not CGI when it is. Yeah. So these hum these aliens are so humanoid that there could have been a guy in a suit and it would have looked better, probably. It would have actually looked like it's in this space. You know, plenty of movies before this had, you know, aliens that were costumes and practical and stuff like that and they looked good so there's no reason this had an incredibly high budget so there's no reason you couldn't have got someone to make a really good suit you're only mm -hmm. going to use it in like one scene or whatever like you know what i mean mm -hmm. it, there's no real excuse i think it's not like jurassic park where you you can't do all of it without using cgi um I, well, I think I'd, I'd say I don't mind if it's CGI. I'm more annoyed by the fact that he's praising it while shitting on the use of well, like, so CGI to get aliens. I would go as far as saying I think this would have looked better with a practical suit that was really well done. Yes. I think I agree because it's just the time. Like this film, I would say, especially at the end when you see the alien, it's not aged well. Um, yeah. It's no. not a great effect. No, it looks to terrible. Independence Day, right? Which still looks great to this day. Yeah, and if if when you've got producers like Kathleen Kennedy on board, I mean, you're gonna have the budget to do like a practical yeah, thing and do like a melting cold. effect, you know, where the the water melts his arm. Like, do mm. an actual oh, yeah, yeah. real thing where like the you have some a material that deteriorates. That would have been way better than what's there on screen. Um, someone said, isn't the point of his praise that it's not a big spectacle rather than whether or not it's CG? Uh, we can roll it back, but the, the mention of it not being a CG spectacle or whatever, it's, it, you can have a spectacle in practical effects, so mentioning it being not CG in that vein Especially makes it sound like... Especially when he said it so many times. Yeah. He said so many times. Yeah, it's better that it's not CG. But at the same time, it isn't. The first time we see the aliens is not in some beautiful wide shot with sparks flying everywhere and big CGI creations. It's yeah, big CGI creations. It is a big creations. CGI creation, though. It, it is. is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So well, and, and you can have a big practical creation that could be... Exactly. Like, it's something we've been trying to do because sentiment on CG has been wonky as of late. Like, you can have bad practical effects, guys. Always remember that. You can yep. fuck up practical yeah, effects. Not everything, not everything is the thing. Yeah, some mm -hmm. a lot of things are Baby Yoda from Mando season three, which. Uh, oh oof. my god! <laughs> <laughs> it's okay that it's shitty because it's supposed to be a stupid puppet. <laughs> I, I can't, it's hard to get over that because I've I've always just I'm thoroughly impressed by Jabba and uh, how how much work. I assume some of you may have seen like behind the scenes, just the amount of work that goes into the greatest puppets of all of film history is mind blowing. Yeah, all the little internal yeah. mechanisms, the off-screen guy with a little remote control doing the yeah. mandibles or the mouth and stuff like that. Yeah, it's not that big. It's just a dude strolling along. So big in terms of an undertaking of a project, not big as in he's Godzilla or anything. Which is absolutely it's probably for <laughs> for the end. Yeah. 2002. It's a big undertaking. It is. It's on a handheld and, and um, it's just in conjunction with all of the other observations about CG. And uh, I, it's, I don't like it. I'm, it's, it's starting to bug me. It feels really dismissive. Yeah, well, it's, it's a huge art form that takes an incredible amount of skill, talent, time that gets undermined by horrible, horrible crunch 
nonsense from studios that for some reason mm -hmm. don't value the artist's time at all. I am from a yep. foreign country. This is one of the best ideas Knight has ever had. Okay. Because it perfect. What? Because it perfectly. Um, well, we'll like, hear his reasons. <laughs> okay. Captured okay. the terror of what this situation would be like for your average family. Want to know my favorite thing about this scene? After rewatching it many times, I noticed this. You can actually see the camouflaged creature crouching in the brush, looking to see if it's safe to come out. It clearly isn't. <laughs> but it's not, though. He's not crouching. He's yeah. Uh, well, well, he's, he's bent over slightly, but yeah, yeah. So it's clearly almost... not safe. It's clearly not safe to come out. It was pretty obvious. Why did it take you several viewings to notice that he's right there at first? Someone I, must have by now made a meme of Howard the alien standing down at the end of that alleyway dancing. By now, I would hope. It's just um, it's just guess... funny that he moves when it's not safe. There are many people looking at him. There are more people looking at him at that moment than there were just yeah. five seconds ago. Mm -hmm. It's it's almost like He's they're gathering like, because oh, they can God. see him and he can see there, but then he decides, ah, uh, fuck it. Yeah, it is. Happy fucking someone birthday. Someone got kid. the camera it's... and pulled the camera to the window, and that's when the alien thought, right, this is absolutely the time to walk out of this bush. <laughs> now I'm on camera. It is very comedically awkward like that, where it's like, oh, they can see me. Oh, shit, I'm on camera. Oh, All right, I'll just leave. Bye. <laughs> Ammo on? Oh, it isn't, is it? Oh, shit. Clearly, it's distraught. It's hiding. Clearly, it's distraught? It's distraught? It, is, distraught. it is not clearly distraught. Why did clearly it casually distraught? walk over to the other side instead of Honestly, running? the... Um, Why did it go there in the first place? I wasn't going to read into its expression, really, but it looked kind of like it was like, yeah, you, you humans, fuck you. As it as it walks away, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I do. Not that it's destroyed. No. No. Why is that? This is very Why? important. And well, wait. This is the analyzed and explained video. You tell us what's going on here. Don't. Yeah. Don't ask me the questions, Chris. I figure maybe he was walking his dog and he got lost, and now he's annoyed because people are catching him on camera when he was told by his boss to never be caught on camera. He's like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> It would be so funny. It, that sounds like a smiling friend's joke where he would walk up to the camera and be like, give, give me that. Get, stop. Give, no, you can't have that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the kid's like, I have my rights. <laughs> you can't take my camera. <laughs> Delete this is, that. This is my camera. <laughs> Delete that. Helps debunk many complaints about the film's finale, which I will discuss soon. Ooh, cool. Oh, he says this debunks the part of the film. Oh, hell okay. yeah. I'm ready for that. Also, All right, tell me because yeah, that's a really shitty finale. Yeah, so is it me? I'll take a screenshot for you guys. Or has the alien in this frame clipped ahead of the uh? Is so superimposed I, I, over the foliage. I, uh, there. Yeah, I would. I was thinking the same thing that when you slow it down, you start to notice that the alien isn't like immaculately integrated into the uh, found footage. Yeah, his arm has come ahead of the uh, branches there, or the leaves. Yeah. It's not supposed to. Whoops. Oh well. It's okay. Well, that's why he's so distraught. He doesn't know where he is, what he's supposed <laughs> to be doing. He's out of yeah. place here. He knows things aren't right. In the next scene, Graham still doesn't want to accept the reality of the situation and tries to talk to whatever is in the pantry. In a brilliant use of tension, he uses the reflection of a large knife to try and see underneath the door. In a brilliant the use scare of tension, that happens... he uses a knife to look under the door as a clunky sentence. So I'm waiting for... I just want to clear this section because I have a feeling he's not going to explain why this works. In this scene is seriously utter perfection. There is no loud boom or buildup of music to warn us that something is coming. The hand just rushes out from under the door, its claws clicking against the kitchen floor. I'll never forget showing this scene to a friend back in 2003, after the DVD had already come out. He was sitting far forward in his seat, then he literally fell backwards and hit the back of the couch. It was amazing. After No, I said Are we no, not okay. talk so about no explanation. Was... All right. Yeah, so... like the yeah, well, you go, you go ahead, you go ahead. Why I believe that the knife was an impressive choice was because of how limited the view is and simultaneously how realistic I could see someone using this as a strategy. So I was kind of immersed. I was, the blur around it and then the focus, and I'm like, okay, we got the source balls. He's up on a, on a shelf. We need to get further down. But then you start to think like, man, you are close to whatever is on the other side of this thing. You know, mm -hmm. and and you've got a very narrow viewpoint that anything could happen at any point. But 
I am curious enough that I could see myself doing this very thing, and that it's it's this is like risk and reward, push and pull. The tension is there. Like yeah. I, I really do think it achieves it very well. Yeah, I think one of the reasons this the scare works as well as it does beyond just the prop itself or of the hand or the shot itself is when it occurs in the scene in relation to all the other shots. Like you have the beat first when he kneels down, you do the knife shot, he's looking around, you're expecting something, there's nothing. And then he sort of reels the knife back because he, he's sort of like freaked out. He's just like, oh, fuck, I haven't seen anything yet. But I felt like if I had just hung in there a second longer, there might have been something there. And then he gets up and walks and the shot doesn't cut, which is it's actually kind of a cool shot where he walks all the way to the back of the room and then he stops and then he, he decides, you know what, I'm going to go back, fuck it. Yeah. And then he walks back, crouches down, and then immediately then the arm comes out. And that's such a strategically... That's a smart place to put that scare. Yeah, I would argue, I would like, argue I it's subversive the... because we're like we're about to re-enter the tension of looking around the room and possibly getting a jump scare. It's like, no, you're going to get it straight away. The alien this right. time yes. recognizes he's come down to that same position and this time wants to take advantage of it. It all matches. I think it's a pretty well-justified jump scare um, in terms of like it would, it would definitely yeah. run out that way. It's not like arbitrarily thrown in. Um, yeah, I think the scene is one of the ones we were complimenting earlier, but I just feel like Chris is more so ex describing how it made him feel, which is good in terms of like understanding the purpose of it, I suppose, from your point of view, certainly from others that he has as friends. But try to tell us why. How does it do that? How, how as an artist did he get those feelings out of us, you know? You do still have to kind of you know, deliberately ignore that there is an alien trapped in a closet, like it's That's, a creature feature yeah. as opposed to a highly the intelligent alien. intergalactic it's what we space faring civilization. Right, yeah. The scene in isolation those... works, but once you get all the extra information, you're like, oh, this is goofy. This is, he's doinking again. And oh, fucking... M Night. Yeah, M Night was just like, oh, there was an alien in the pantry. And I locked it in there. Bye. Bye. <laughs> like you just like if, if there was a camera in the room where you were observing the alien, he would just be pacing around angrily, going, "I can't fucking believe I'm locked in here." <laughs> like, I love the idea. Like, how did this happen? How alien. did this happen? I have a spaceship. How did this happen? <laughs> he's got an alien mobile phone. He calls Jerry, who is currently trying to get the camera off those kids. And he's like, "I, just, I need a second. <laughs> give me, give me a second. <laughs> he's like, yeah. "How did you? Do you want know to get up out of pantry?" He's like, "Break the window. I don't know." He's like, "There is no window. I don't know what to do." What's yeah. the What's the door made out of? I I think I think they call it I think it's made of those plants outside. It's like oh, then just kick it open. I can't it's, do it's, that. It's really than it looks. It's the reason the alien in the previous scene was distraught is that he's just embarrassed <laughs> that he can't figure out how this technology works. It's just, it's so he's not going to call it beyond he's him. Trapped somehow in the pantry. It he's thinking <sighs> about taking one of the. He, he's thinking about just ending it all and just taking a, taking one of those water bottles and just drinking it and being like, "Oh, I'm so ashamed. I'll just end it now." There's so many How ways does to parry this. Doorknob work? Do I pull it? Do I push um, it? Nope. Well, I'm stumped. The government captured alien. And like the beginning of the interrogation, the alien's like, "What the fuck is your problem? Why do you have these huge blocking things between all your pathways? What is the point? <laughs> it stops anybody from getting point. anywhere." <laughs> <laughs> Everything should be open plan like it is on my planet. Yeah. Fuck, I mean. Well, like those are doors. We use them for the transversal through walls. And like, just have an opening then, and you wouldn't need the door. Ha oh, if it, you're if gonna you need get a wall, cold, have there be it? a wall. Just wear a fucking sweater. <laughs> oh, do they, they poop with the door open then? Oh, no. Oh, then they had it coming. <laughs> They never stood like, a chance. Aliens traditionally have doors, but they're all proxy activated where like you walked close to it and oh, it just Mahler. opens. Maybe maybe they're like those goofy ass fucking alien doors from Amnesia Rebirth. Oh my god, don't remind where me. Where you have to have the pyramid. You have to bring the pyramid close to the doors you want open. And if you want it closed, you have to move the pyramid further away from them. But it's designed in such a way that every time you want to go get something out of your cupboard, you have to solve a miniature puzzle. You know, <laughs> seriously, the potential here is huge. They let the alien go as a, a peace offering, and then he reports back, and he's like, so get this. They have these insane blockages in all of their pathways. Do you know what it's made of? And like, what? And it's like, the same shit that just grows out of the fucking ground, apparently. Yeah. And they, they told me plants outside. that it grows because their acid that falls from the sky powers it up out of the ground. I shit <laughs> like you they're not. Lying to you, Jerry. <laughs> they're, they're, 
they just don't want to give you their secrets. Yeah, they told you a bunch of bullshit. And he's like, no, they showed me. They showed me the whole process. It's like, they lied, dude. Like, why would, why would acid make They have make videos it... of it falling from the sky. Why would acid make walls? Like rivers. What? Rivers of acid. They have oceans <laughs> of acid. The whole Even planet is poison. Acid, they they, they actually say consume if they don't the drink acid. the acid, they'll die. <laughs> <laughs> they thrive on acid. They are monsters. Like, we can't we deal with this. We don't want to harm them. No. We are basically they the xenomorphs the to these guys. Creation during the summer. Or build up of music to warn us that something is coming. The hand just rushes out from under the door, its claws clicking against the kitchen floor. I'll never forget showing this scene to a friend back in 2003, after the DVD had already come out. He was sitting far forward in his seat, then he literally fell backwards and hit the back of the couch. It was amazing. After finally acknowledging that some serious crap is going on, Graham tries to convince his family to head for water, since it's a theory he finds some merit in. Why? Why? Why, <laughs> Why did the theory exist? Why did the first guy find merit in it? He's like, oh, the, the crop circles aren't near water. It was like, well... It's raining a lot, a lot in this world, are. okay? I feel like it's just yeah, not intuitive. A, a lot of fields are going to be near water. Because that's just how I, that's just how reality is. Oh, well, I, that's why I said um, earlier. Uh, does a stream count? I don't. I don't know. I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> how would we, how would we know that they had a fucking you know an equivalent of a crop circle in the ocean or not? Did you check? Did you go look see if they've well, got any weird they shit in the tried ocean? They put it in the waves and they're like, "God damn it! The, <laughs> the substance there covered it back up." This... I wonder if that would melt my hand if I put it in there. The acid factories, we can't draw lines in them. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's just a no-go. His family disagrees, however, on the basis that they want to stay where their mother raised them. He reluctantly agrees on the promise that they board up every window and door in the house. I've also heard many complaints about how the aliens are so dumb that they can't get out of pantries and through yep. wood beams. Yep. I'll get to yeah. talking about those at the end of this video. Ooh, okay, I'm excited. Good. I'm ready. I'm excited. I'm, exci I, I'm yeah. excited. I'm when the family is He's crowded cooking, in you the guys. closet watching oh. the news, they learn that the crop circles are indeed being used as a mapping system. Graham hears of people flocking to churches around the world and leaves the room. Morgan tells Uncle Merrill that he wishes he was. Okay, I'm not kidding. It's like they use just... the crop circles as a mapping system. It's like, why don't just use your mapping system? Why not just use maps? Yeah. <laughs> why not just get? You you made it here. You you had you had pinpoint calculations that allowed you to fly across Matt, again, the galaxy you and get how, here. You know, you wonder how like Magellan or Sir Francis Drake managed to navigate. Every time they went somewhere, they're like, crop right, let's make a crop circle. Yeah, we gotta make crop circles. No, yeah. it disappeared. I'm lost. What's what's a man to do? They turned our they turned our navigation and uh, our navigation system into tortillas. Ah. This is Dad, not Graham. After the house is nearly finished being boarded up, the family Why agrees to have. Why didn't he talk uh, about his the reaction? reaction to yeah, Meryl's reaction yeah. to that. Yeah, like that's like a thing. Maybe he'll talk oh, about uh, it later. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, okay. yeah, Just, maybe he this will. This feels like a prototype for those AI explained videos that are everywhere on YouTube now where they I just summarize those the whole videos. Plot. Where they're oh, like, but that's like, this that's like 90% of what this is. No, I, I, I don't disagree with you. Like, uh, the ones you're talking about, I assume, are the ones where it's like, creepy monster from out of space takes bodies one by one until two people left, yeah. and it's the thing. You're like, what, what the fuck? Yeah. And it just describes the thing to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have what Graham is thinking might be their last dinner. They each pick whatever they want, but when it comes time to eat, Morgan wants his dad to say a prayer. This is a reminder that Morgan hasn't lost his faith, something we learned in the opening scene when he said he thought God made um, the crops. Was up. this the scene where uh, where he said, I hate you, yeah. and you in this case was referring to... Yeah, that to me... I, I don't know, that, that, that seems like a bit of like a wise cross thing. It's like, well, so he doesn't... He doesn't think that God doesn't exist. He believes he exists, but he hates him, which describes uh, a very different sort of thing, you know? It's both whenever the movie wants it to be yeah. one or the other. I, I don't know. It just reminds me of like in God's, you know, God's Not Dead, where he's like, I hate God. How can you hate him if you don't think he's real? Oh! It's not that kind of thing. 
in terms of like, wait, maybe... do you like not understand what like what it means for somebody to like not? Well, in line with the theme, it might not be that he believes God doesn't exist. Rather, God's not going to look out for us at all. We're on our own. He's not an interesting agent in the world. He's yeah. not like he can't rely on him or something like that. Yeah. Doesn't he I mean, say that there's nothing, that there's no one out there? I don't I can't remember exactly um, how he phrases it, but my conclusion right. from that that scene at night when they're on the couch and the kids are asleep that he was saying that he doesn't believe in God at I, all. I think I think it is just mixed messaging. Um yeah. or, or rather it might just be the misconception that with well, somebody who doesn't believe in God, I mean they they believe he's real, but they hate him. That that's that's the conclusion of, of what it means to have lost faith is like, well no, you think he's real, but you don't like him anymore. Um there's there's that, but there's also like, did you catch how with this analysis, when the reference was first brought up to the nature of Morgan having faith, he signposted that. He said like, this is a, uh, you know, this is going to come up a lot in the movie. The difference between these two characters and whether or not they have faith. This is the second reference to it, and he said like, this you see, it was set up back in that scene. It's like that's two, man. And, <laughs> and that was also that was a long time ago. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like this is what this we said. Like there was this really wasn't covered in the film very well at all. There was barely any conflict regarding this. Mm. If, well, you think I, it would really... come up a bit more often, right? Like that maybe there would have even just been an episode, uh, an episode, a, a scene that's on Sunday, and the kids like, can we you go know, to like, church or something? Even the thing going, where he says, "I wish uh, Meryl, you were my dad." Is, is someone could be like, "That's the third reference." I'd be like, "No." That's not really anything. Like, no. like that, the con the context for that could be changed on a whim, depending on. Like I said, my interpretation of the movie was the fact that the dad wasn't taking all of this as seriously as Merrill was. I thought that's why he said that. And it's like, well, that combined with the fact that he doesn't like that his dad has lost his faith. It's like, okay, you know what I mean? It's pretty I really empty. Wanna... Yeah, like I, I... You sh I wish this stuff was shown to me more consistently and or or in any sort of meaningful way. I want to like this scene, um, because like I appreciate capital, like what you were, all the things you were saying about it earlier, and I think it's an important scene in terms of like the family bonding. But it's it's one of those scenes that perhaps the mo most extreme example of like it being unintentionally funny. Like the this scene just makes me laugh. I the, I find it really funny the way. Mel Gibson's is sort of aggressively eating everybody else's yeah. food off their plate yeah, while like his kids are crying. And well, then, that's kind of yeah. That doesn't detract from what I like about it. It kind of adds to it for me. No, fair enough. Yeah. Um, and there's also that other beat where like they he's hugging his kids, and I do like that beat. But then there's this moment where it cuts to the brother. It's comedic who's in for the, sure. His own isolated shot, and he like gets yanked out of it really awkwardly. Yes. Like he stubbornly doesn't want to be a part of the hug, and it's just like get the fuck in here. You're hugging us right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah, um, I like it. It's good. Overall, but, I find it funnier than like touching. I, I understand what you're saying, and I think I'm more in line with Cab that I I think it syncs up okay, because uh, mm -hmm. it's like a heavy moment that the, but the, the they can have a little bit of levity recognizing that Meryl maybe doesn't do the family hug parts, but he's like, yes, you do right now. We're doing that. Yeah, like, yeah. It, it works. I it's more so that the conflict that's supposed to get us this payoff, this scene, isn't especially coherent. Because I, because yeah. just getting back to it, I, I think the way he talks in that important scene when the kids are sleeping and they're on the couch, he makes it seem like he doesn't believe in miracles or coincidences or that like there's any sort of meaning. That seems rather distinct from, uh, I I think God is a bad man and I don't care for him. It seems mm -hmm. like it's just kind of unclear at I best. Well, I mean, I, I think it speaks because it was um, I, I just like the speech itself. That initial conversation presents a uh, it, it's just like a false dichotomy, right? To me, the idea of everything happens for a reason or it's all random chance. It's like, well, wait, hold on. <laughs> I feel like there's dimensions to this um, that are worth exploring and that are kind of necessary to explore. If this is going to be the theme of the film. I think I think you kind of owe it to the film itself to to delve into that conversation a bit more. To provide yeah. like meaningful counter arguments, you know, you need. I think you need to provide like a meaningful, less cynical counter to um to that dichotomy. Because for instance, somebody could say, "Well, I think everything happens for a reason. I think it's causality," you know, or or like, "Well, you know, it's what you make of it, right?" The, these sorts of things, regardless of whether the film actually agrees with those perspectives, you know, like if they, it's just you got to explore it.
When Graham refuses, he breaks down crying, and the entire family comes together for one last emotional scene. Just like during the earlier car one scene, last? the signal... Mm? Sorry, did you say one last emotional scene? Yeah, there are no before, more. Before the crazy events of the aliens, um, I suppose. Yeah, because after this, it's all like, you know, boarding up the doors and the aliens well, no, at the end in. of the movie, there's, there's another we've got, emotional scene well, as well. You know, we've got when he, oh, explains, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. he explains to Bo the nature of her birth and then explains to uh, his son the same thing, right? Yeah, those were emotional as well. Yeah, the one with the son really was like, oh, this is like a... And of a course, the scene. ending of the film is meant to be definitely an emotional moment with the family. Yeah, it's, it's weird that he describes this as one last emotional scene, period. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. He must not have meant that. There's no way he doesn't I consider the ending very emotional. Not. Yeah, I assume that. ...from the baby monitor becomes clear when the entire family is grouped together. They rush to finish... Without the, the dog. Touching it. Not the dog not touching here, it. Yeah, the whole, fa the whole family is not here, and also they are not touching it. Which was when specifically looks... cited as the thing earlier. He specifically cited the family touching it, so... Earlier. ...out the window, the crickets stop chirping yet again. Another warning that the creatures are coming. In the script, Knight the had crickets. originally planned to show us lines being formed in the crops as the creatures advance towards the house. He wisely omitted that visual. I find it much more terrifying without actually seeing that. What? Well, so why do you find it? Why do you? Because I presume he's going to compliment when you have the aliens, uh, like casting shadows on the, uh, like on the windows outside. Why would he compliment oh, yeah. that? Well, I was just thinking, like, lines mm -hmm. forming outside, that could mean a lot of different things, and I could totally picture that being very imposing. Like, um... Exactly. A clear disturbance in the crops, all in a line, if you know what I mean? Coming towards I, the house? I, I guess that's the thing, is, I think I could take or leave it. He's described it as being wise that they didn't... that he didn't do that. I'm yeah. not sure that I agree, that it's, like, clear that that was the bad choice. Or, or that, that there would have been a bad choice to have um, that shot in the film. Yeah, once again, it feels like it would be about execution, which, as a, an aspiring filmmaker, you'd think you would uh, acknowledge that, that there's ways to do it. Thinking that this might be one of the last times he has to really talk with his children, he decides to tell each of them how they were born. Interestingly, the births described are actually the stories of how Knight's actual children were born. All the while, you can hear the creatures crashing through the house. All tension throughout this scene is caused with fantastic use of silence combined with sound design. They head for the basement. At this so, point, oh, so you don't want to talk I, about? The dog I don't get him, man. Right. You no, know the dog or the attic thing. But also, uh, like, could you could you provide an example of what you're talking about with the sound design and elaborate on it rather than yeah, just saying it's got clips. great sound design? Moving on. Yeah, it's got great cinematography. Moving on. You could do it. Yeah, yeah you don't even about need it. to play the clip. You can just ex describe it. This film has great filmmaking. Well, I, I actually think if an alien were listening to this, it's like, did you just tell me it works because there was sound and there was not sound? Yeah, because you need to explain that. Like, yeah, like I, I could totally see someone being like, I'm explain confused. Explain it to me like I'm allergic to water. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, it's just an opportunity because, you know, talk about why you love the film, but try to get further than you liked the no sound and then the sound. You know, I want more than that. Come on point the creatures have gotten inside the house and while trying to wedge the door shut they knock out the lights forcing them to use flashlights they notice that the aliens are just making noises trying to distract them from the real threat that was also a leap by the way uh that was, that was the huge leap. leap he says they're just making noises and it shows a shot where the door is moving significantly like the yeah and they're not yeah, like I mean, against it they're just watching it definitely looks like they're trying to break the door down <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't even know how like, you could that, ever... That's a neat hunch, my dude, but just on the off chance you're wrong, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hold this door <laughs> with all of the strength I can possibly muster, if that's all right with you. Mm -hmm. Well, because it leads to this payoff, and it's like, the, the, you could have just had this anyway. You didn't need to say that. They begin searching for the coal chute, remembering that it used to be poured into the basement. Upon finding it, an alien grabs Morgan, and Knight does something really great here. He focuses on the fallen flashlight, only letting us hear Graham and Meryl screaming to help Morgan. It gives me goosebumps I, every time. Yeah, I time. like this. Well, I like yeah, it too, but I don't think the explanation is much beyond what we saw. No, I... Because, of course, it's, it's that it's kind of a bold choice to, like, not show what's happening. And, Especially yeah, it works well. It's particularly, and... Like, it's kind of a big flashpoint in the story, right? Oh, like, one of the main characters is in peril. 
Uh, and it's left to your imagination to imagine the frantic nature of what's happening here. And I oh, guess it's a contrast between that and just how still this image is. Just a light in the darkness. It's off the top of my head, and I don't even think that was that great. Like, yeah, I, I, don't, that, I like the I think the, yeah, the, then the alien arm, like, grabbing the kid, like, that's fucking creepy. That was, like, a legitimately creepy thing to see it just mm -hmm. moving over when it was there. Like, and it's such a short clip, you know? It's, like... You, this movie, like, I don't think it's a good movie, but there are things to praise about this movie. And I don't feel like you're doing this film justice. And I feel like we're doing a lot more effort for that, even though we have very mixed to negative sort of feelings on the movie. And this is like, this is his boy here, and he's not really selling it. One thing you can talk about in terms of the filmmaking is that you, it might have been uh, like a sort of production necessity to try and not avoid this because it would be hard to show with the visual effects and what they have. And so you have to come up with a clever way of avoiding it. And focusing on the flashlight is a clever choice. If that's the problem and this is the solution, it's a pretty clever choice. That's worth highlighting as that was clever, M. Night. Like, that was a really intuitive and cool workaround to a potential yeah, what problem. You, what I would want to do at this point is have a section of the video talking about M. Night's of, of avoidance of difficulties within filmmaking through making use of a lack. Like, at one point, we don't get any visuals, right? When the, when the light gets knocked out. It's, it is also yep. bold to have just pitch black for a selection of time. Other films have done it, and to varying degrees of success, because that sound design is super important for our imaginations. But that's an example. This is an example. The the scene we've said that's probably the best one in the film has a lot of very minimalistic use of several elements, but tries to create... It's more than the sum of its parts, so to speak. And I would say that M. Night deserves celebration for that, along with his team, for the elements in this movie that, that pull it off. Um, Definitely. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, you can say I, that pretty I guess so. I'm just, why didn't he tie this back into the, the Hitchcock conversation about suspense? Because this was like a really good example of that, of removing information from the viewer so that it's more in their imagination what's happening because like for for the duration of the scene you don't you don't know if it's going well for the protagonist or not you don't know if they're actually succeeding in saving the kid which um I, why doesn't he the, the whole film has basically been relaying what the scene is and occasionally saying it's good it's good and then just moving on to the next scene yeah, well, we're nearing the end of the film, which means we'll get to the strictly analysis and explained part, right? Of the okay, video. yeah. All right. Morgan well, this does seem to be a trend with him. It's just very surface, like, overview. I guess the expectation the is, thing. this is this is his favorite film, right? So... One of them. One of them, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, one I, actually, I think I he think would go into a little bit more argue, this time. Yeah. I would argue it's, it's more inspiration. It's more important than his favorite film. It's the film that made him love film and got him to become a filmmaker. That's that's crazy in terms of what it should yeah. mean to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm more than fine. Like I said, it could very well be at this point that he says, ah, "I'm not as fond of it these days." But at the same time, you should more than be aware of what things set you off, what ideas about the you know the potential of film asthma attack, causing Graham to realize they forgot to take his medicine. Bo says she dreamed this, continuing to add weight to her almost angelic, prophetic dreams. As he's trying to help his son breathe, he begins talking to someone else, who we quickly realize is God. It's clear now that Graham really does still believe in God. He acknowledges his existence, but hates him nonetheless. Eventually the asthma attack subsides. When the family is finally able to sleep, we get a little bit more of Graham's dream learning that Colleen died in an accidental car accident. He wakes up before the dream. An accidental car accident? It, That's yeah, funny. yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, yeah. When he wakes, we hear a voice on the radio, a man who's theory. Yeah, it's like when you're driving down the road and there's some asshole next to you, and you turn to the person in your passenger seat and you're like, there's about to be a car accident, all right? <laughs> you know, um, about why the alien... I was just thinking about how... Uh... He's like he's doing the scene of just cussing out God, being like, "I fucking hate you, piece of shit. You're the reason all this has gone to hell." And God, it like cuts to his POV, and he's in heaven, and he's like that, like, ah, "Little do you know, <laughs> <laughs> you hate me now." But uh, <laughs> yeah. the Anthony face, yeah, yeah, he'll see. That's quite that is, that is quite a striking example of the probable lack of proofreading. If you know you, you don't see the word accident twice so close together. Even when well, reading it out too, I was gonna like, say, oh, how, I just yeah. said this word. You know, it's this how brains work, word. right? Because I think he registers car accident as event, and then accidental as the description of yeah. whether or not it was on purpose. 
I think you're well, right. Well, he needs yeah. to watch Hot Fuzz to learn that they're called collisions now because an accident implies that there's no one <laughs> Fault. <laughs> no, the the confirmation was that there was no one necessarily at fault because God was the one that put him to sleep. I guess it is God's fault there. We should be. Uh... It is all God's Wait, fault. What, what is that? What does that mean? Like he's in the vaccine and the <laughs> some chloroform? <laughs> oh, that would be so <laughs> fucking <Fringy>. funny. <laughs> Listen, Fringy, he's not in the back seat. Jesus took the wheel. All right? <laughs> I just need that scene. M. Night driving, sort of his eyes are heavy. Like... <laughs> God's like, this has to happen. This, let this happen. <laughs> Pops out of the steering wheel like shh, Freddy shh, 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 Stop fighting. Only dreams. <laughs> this will all make sense to you someday. Do you, do you think... Um... I think Mel Gibson took the time to explain all of this to Ray Reddy, who was probably like, what? Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he's like, you know, I, I, there's nothing I hold against you because it was all a part of the plan. You'd be like, okay, yeah. Go, oh, man. Uh, if that works for you, if that makes you feel better, absolutely. ...came to Earth. He says... People think they came here to take over the planet. That's bull. I don't think that. Uh, maybe My friend... the pause here, filter? Yep. <laughs> but a little, little while. His decisions on when to play audio and when not to play audio are interesting. Yeah, I don't know why he didn't have more visual clips uh, while he was talking. This Most of just... screenshots, right? Yeah. Because this could have been just him narrating what is said on the radio, but when he specifically talks about this is an incredible sound decision on the effects or the, the whatever it was, then he doesn't give an example of it. So. And then I saw them. He found a pack of light bulbs. It poisoned his family. Uh, Man, it's still, yeah, the clip's still going. Yeah. Huh? Found a pack of light bulbs. There they are, in the box, with the rest of his friends. We don't even get, like, them or they'll die. you don't understand, chat. Me and Fringy, uh, years ago. And, uh, to be fair, everyone here, to some extent, tortured by copyright rules and regulations. Yeah, it's the scourge of the mm -hmm. YouTubers. It, it really is. Like, if it, if it starts to go for, like, four or five seconds, it's like, done. <laughs> like, stop, stop, on? stop. You're no. stealing this because you're, you played five seconds of this two-hour movie. You're playing movie. with dark arts that you do not understand. <laughs> you're trifling with forces beyond your recognition. I brought it up uh, in a conversation we were having semi-recently, but, like, I think, chat, you've known about this, but the Lord of the Rings trilogy watch-through, we couldn't keep it as one video because copyright kept coming fit no matter what. And one of the things they eventually went after that made me give up was, um, you shall not pass. Just that. <laughs> it, it was cut yeah. down to the you shall not pass and it was like no kind of that it's like of course i can have it's like nope You're like there, uh, okay there, there was a point where you you uh it's you kind of like resign to your fate you know you just kind of it's like a thousand yard stare sort of situation yeah <laughs> once that happens well guess i'm doomed <laughs> like there's nothing i can do all well, right it's, well. like, it's worth studying because um yeah, you split split the Lord of the Rings up into the three films, and the copyright stops being a dick. I don't know why, but once you get to a certain length, it's it just, and that's why the streams have more trouble than the videos. I think with some of these clips. Do you think that the that their logic is uh, if it's a long video, it might be the movie in full? Uh, it could so be. So there's yeah. like a stricter, yeah. That could be a part of the logic, okay. yeah, that they write in. You know, you like you just, uh, nobody knows. But they can individually I... tell which segment is copyrighted or not. So it'll be like a nine-hour video or whatever, but it'll be like, oh, but but only six seconds here was copyright claimed. My guess might be that Must be the whole movie. For like a, a live stream, right? That on a live stream, someone's like, all right, yeah, I'll throw on like the movie or something, do a live stream for the film, so they want to be more aggressive. And never, yeah, probably. never underestimate just how much of it is actually still bots. Just, just crazy yeah. fucking bots. Oh yeah, it's weird yeah. to get a manual. It's almost all bots these days. Well, even you know, um, you'll have some asshole. You know, you know when you see like Twitter posts being like at YouTube, what the fuck is this? Blah blah blah, and they reply. Half the time I read it, I'm like, that's a bot. It's a bot <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> it's a beyond just the robot sitting there on his computer typing out all these messages. Beyond just the claims themselves, you got to be really careful about what you appeal, even if you feel like you have everything on your side, like receipts, for example, for something that you purchased that you use, like, because I've seen people get strikes just for appealing something they were, and they were within their right to do so, but they were just flagged as trying to evade due 
punishment. You know what I mean? I had that like, with Rebel Moon. I used a clip of an interview with Zack Snyder, which had two seconds of the film he was talking about, and I think five seconds of him talking on screen. Um, that was flagged for copyright as the film, appealed it, rejected, copyright strike impending unless you took it down. Same upload, uh, where they could just turn off monetization for tracking purposes because I'd used some trailer footage. No claims at all, appeals were all accepted. Uh, the only way to get past it is if you go through the whole file accounts notification thing, and then they have an, an extra 10 days to respond. And it's basically just an extended version of the appeals process because like 99% of times you will go through that extra process and they're not going to actually bother to bite a five second clip that they don't even own. It's just there really to scare people off actually going through the formal procedure because when you get to legal like language like counter notification, people are going to think, oh shit, this could be really, really serious. My channel could get taken down if I fail. But everyone I know who's gone through the counter notification thing has succeeded and no one's even bothered responding to it within the time window. It's been my, that has been my experience. Same here. I just appeal everything and but hope I don't get struck. <laughs> Plat you, Platoon is right when he says that. It, I think that one of its, probably its primary goals is to just scare people into going along with it. Because I remember when I was just starting off and I got my first claim, and I was like, oh God, I, I want to strike my channel. I don't want anything like that because you're super new to this and you don't understand mm -hmm. it. So you just go along with it. And then you yeah. realize, like, oh, wait, like, they're not going to take me to court. Fuck them. And then you carry on with your life. Well, I wouldn't want my channel struck or deleted. And, and if, like, just the way that's set up where it, like, it sets up the system and then disincentivizes you from taking advantage of it is so fucking stupid. Yeah, and if you, you do, have to actually use complain. Trying to avoid all of the waiting periods as well, so just get it from the get go. And then to prevent future shit too, where they decide they want to go after the video again or something. Um, I've never had it when, like, if I've appealed and, and the appeal has been too. successful, they've never gone back and claimed it again after the fact. So it's like, in my experience, it's always been a one time only thing. I um, had it with uh, but... TFA part three, got claimed, counted, successful, claimed, counted, successful, and then, uh, like, a year ago, it got upset with one of the music tracks in there. <laughs> and it's just like, fuck off. Yeah. It used to be to where they could, they, it's a lot shorter now. It's like two weeks, isn't it? It used to be a month. It used to be they could wait 30 fucking days to even respond to your thing. Yeah. So they could potentially drag it out for like 60 days for free if... to them, essentially. How did YouTube yeah. believe that was fucking fair? <laughs> to, to the well, it's like all of the other decisions YouTube makes. Like, how come you've taken away so many options for customizing my channel? Like, what does that do for engagement? You know? It's, it is the case. The Rebel Moon video I've done, because they the one that they was allowed to stay up was the one they demonetized for tracking. And so like if it's tracking, you can appeal well, you can dispute it. But then it's the 30 day window and there's no escrow monetization, but it's the only way of getting it up. Otherwise it's seven days for appeal, ten days for counter notification, at which point nobody really gives a shit anyway. Um so that's basically just a, a free video, like a month of work, which is just never gonna pay me anything because they've got a month to dispute it, beyond which they might tick up again in the algorithm, but I doubt that it will. So there's also the time consideration is that that's how long it takes for you to sit on it, worrying that you're going to be getting a claim or a strike. Um, and it will just like, that will put you off doing anything. But then when you actually do get in touch with somebody finally, because I've met like the partner manager for the first time to shout at someone human because I was really <laughs> fucking annoyed and the Twitter bot was annoying. She's like, oh no, send it, this email address. This is our copyright people. We'll help you directly. So I emailed it. It's a fucking automated response. Yeah. Like, you cannot speak to a human. And on Twitter, I was like, you don't even get it because the claim, the thing you've claimed is not even the thing you've claimed and they don't own it. And then their bot just said, we do not actually uh, handle copyright disputes and we can't litigate this process. It's like, but, but that's what your system is designed for. So... Like, I'm telling you, the thing they've claimed is not the thing they say that it is, and your system is supposed to pick that up. And they flagged it using your system, but now you're telling me that you can't do anything about that, which is just ridiculous. But fair enough. Fuck you. Yeah. This is our company. We can police it and be as lazy as we want to. Fuck you. Drag them away. Nobody believes me, but they didn't come here for a fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said, man, he played this whole clip. <laughs> Whose voice is that? It sounds familiar. I wouldn't be surprised at all if it was like I'm a cameo voice, but I'm not sure. Oh, you realize I'm making the sounds, right? Yeah, that's Fringy. Mm hmm. This is a raid. They came here for <laughs> us to harvest us. They left real fast this morning. Okay. Like... Yeah, well, well, there you go. Just, they left real careful, fast this yeah. morning. Yeah. Left real fast. This Someone morning. scared them off. They left some of their wounded behind. 
This little bit of dialogue okay. is very important. As I keep saying, I'll get to that in a bit. So <laughs> oh, yeah. Why don't you get to it now? <laughs> We're on the topic yeah. now. Just we say here. it now. <laughs> They're going to have a lot, of, a lot of Piper paying at the end of this video. Yeah. Right? We're right. running out of time to deal a lot with of things. all the things he says. So I'm coming back to it later. We're only about, what, is it seven minutes out from the end of the video? So he's running yeah. out of time to re revisit these topics. Yep. We've still got the rest of the film to summarize. So after a bit of reluctance, the family decides to go back upstairs in an attempt to find Morgan's medicine. When Graham wheels the TV into the living room, we get a scare that made a woman in the audience scream as if she'd literally seen a ghost. Woman moment. I don't even... Yeah. <laughs> Chris, you see, instead of telling me that someone found it scary, you could tell me why it's, artistically speaking, effective. I like the yeah, fact that it reflects in the TV. That there are plenty of bad horror films that make people scream. Absolutely, I agree. I don't think that this mm -hmm. is a great metric to use like, to oh, convince me screamed. that it's a great film. Yeah, it'd be like saying, "Well, I watched uh, like Jack and Jill, the Adam Sandler film. <laughs> there was a guy." It, and be... going, <laughs> Every time. <laughs> yeah, Halo made us scream, but I ain't gonna talk true. about how it's great it is. So. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure someone walked out of the Bye Bye Man because they were too scared. That doesn't make it very good. <laughs> exactly. Bye -bye Why are we appealing yeah. to these anecdotes? Someone had a reaction. Well, and, and instead of being yeah, like, well, so describe the scene. Is that he wants to get the TV on because he likes catch up with the news, see the good news. The aliens are gone. Everything's getting better. That's going to be great. You, you are set at ease. And then he's dragging it in. Everything's nice and normal. But the camera pans to the point where you can see a reflection that's very fucking worrying because that means it's in the room with you and it doesn't compromise the the vision of the alien right because this kind of imagery he could be practical for all we know right like that's how yeah how hidden this the is image a good is. bit of imagery yeah this is good that's what i mean Sorry, like why not talk about it instead of just being like a woman got scared You're like okay also um <laughs> i what because because i was sort of semi thinking about it are there any logistical issues with the alien being around, grabbing the kid. I guess he was uh, camo. Did get in silently or camo? Okay. Yeah, he was probably lying against I, uh... the wall and they just didn't see him. It would be really cool if you could actually see it, you know, pan around the room and you can make it out. Yeah, I will it's say, really silent. I'm distracted in my mind by an anecdote actually from, I'm pretty sure I mentioned it before, when I went to see The Rise of Skywalker in theaters and there was this guy a couple of seats over who just kept saying, oh, fuck off. <laughs> like well, it was so funny it's like what's your name ray skywalker a oh, fuck off Just that is the appropriate reaction to almost every scene in that movie oh, I, I have that. a i have a my previous memorable movie experience similar to that is is also kind of the opposite it was during moonfall when i went with my dad to see moonfall it was it was awful we both loved that movie because how bad it was uh there was a guy in, in the back of the theater up at the top and he was sleeping and snoring very loudly <laughs> for like the last for like the last half of the movie but we're like you know what this is moonfall no i don't care if anything it makes everything more funny that a guy is so audibly snoring through this movie that would be quite funny to hear that all throughout the film, yeah. <laughs> they try to do all these dramatic moments and exciting moments with a gravity I'm bullshit a... in the car and the truck and the chase, and there's just this guy snoring in the back. I, I, I'll be the one to sort of complain if people are talking or if phones are viewable in, in cinemas, of course, but uh, it was I'm pretty sure it was The Predator when I went to see that in cinemas with a friend, and uh, it was the part, you remember where she's got the trank gun and she shoots herself in the foot with it and gets knocked out? Um, yeah, yeah. I like was very audibly just what the fuck, and then I like sort of looked around. I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> like, I'm, in a, like, <laughs> I'm in a fucking theater. Ugh, I'm sure everyone else is having fun. There I'll were a few times when I was watching Multiverse of Madness, where I audibly was like, what the fuck, and I, and there was like people around, but like, I was like, what? Yeah, I get that. An alien is holding Morgan, and it's missing two fingers. It's the one from the pantry. Oh my Why? god! Why yes, though? How, how did that happen? Why? How did yeah, he like, know how to why? find him? So he's in this house, and he just decided to go looking around. He's like, "Oh, that's the guy. I cut off my fingers. I'm, I'm here, here to get I think, the man I think we, who cut off my yeah, fingers." Yeah, we need to reset here. So, alien POV. There's something on the other end of the door. 
It's making noises. It's making- it's got like a knife reflecting in there. I'm gonna poke my hand through because I'm retarded. Ow, my fingers! What the fuck? Jeez. I hate these humans. I hate it here. This is so horrible. And then by the time he presumably either breaks out or his alien friends are like, Bro, did you get trapped in a pantry again? <laughs> and he's like, fuck. Yeah. And uh, they let him go. I guess, did they tell him, like, the guy who chopped off your fingers, we, we tracked him. He's called Mel Gibson. He lives in this little house. <laughs> like, go get him. <laughs> I just don't, I, it seems yeah. so silly to me. Um, this was definitely, especially, it's so cringy, they do the flashback of cutting off the fingers as if the audience couldn't fucking put this together. But yes. in, uh, I actually think that the audience will be distracted enough by going, oh, it's the alien he wants revenge, to not think like, what? What? Why? Yeah. What? <laughs> Why, <laughs> you, though? You cut off two of my fingers, so I'm gonna kill your son. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, I think if this alien were intelligent, he'd be like, my my race has abandoned me. Um, I need to figure out how I'm going to survive in this world. It's like, no, I need to go and kill this little boy. Because I recognize that that will upset the man who took my fingers. That I'm pretty sure it's this guy. <laughs> Ugh. Clearly, this is one of the wounded that was left behind. The family freezes as they watch the alien threaten to poison Morgan. Then, Graham has an epiphany. That's another <laughs> thing that's curious. What was the alien gonna do if they all stood still forever? I don't know, was he gonna just slowly back up? Was he gonna do the thing from Robocop? I want, I, I want a chopper, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I want to <slowly laughs> chopper with my hostage. Or it would be <laughs> funny if he was just <laughs> like, so, I would like to now have a chat. You're all listening, we're all calm, <laughs> nothing will happen to little Morgan here. <laughs> it's all fine. Let's everyone sit down. We My have... mates left me here because I got locked in a pantry again. Let's They're discuss the proposition of me living here with you guys. <laughs> well, alternatively, if you guys Look, could I was get me just following to orders. Like a blackbird, that would be really useful. Well, he would, he would put on what? an episode of American Dad and be like, you see this character, Roger, who lives with the family in the attic? I would oh, like I'm to be this character. As well. <laughs> I went to the future to get a DVD box set of American Dad. <laughs> they would have American Dad at his home planet, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I actually forget the thing that makes the alien do the poison thing. Is it because he sees him lifting the bat off the yeah, wall? Yeah, that's as simple not? as that. He's, he's approaching with the bat, yeah. so it's like, oh, well, I was literally going to... I'm just going to do the thing I threatened to do now. You've called. Yeah. Like you cleverly called my bluff. I will now kill your son. <laughs> and he has the son like it's a, like he took him as a hostage, but he's the one who like came into the room to grab the kid. So yeah. what is he aiming for? What's he doing? Yeah, exactly. No, that, that's that's, that's what my question was. Obviously, he wants to kill the kid. So what's the hostage situation for? He had the the element of ambush and surprise. Why did he waste it on? I've got your kid now. So do as I say, and stay still. <laughs> I suspect okay. that this whole flawed scene was built around the simple visual of seeing a silhouetted figure in a CRT monitor. No, yeah, there's you know, cuz there is something a little hey. spooky about that, but like Yeah, like the visual is good. Yeah. End of praise. Right. And, and it's just like, yeah, let's write a whole scene around this visual happening and then logic be damned. <laughs> Finally see the rest of Graham's flashback. This is when Graham begins to connect the dots, and where some audience members were let down. He remembers that Colleen's last words were, tell Graham to see, and tell Meryl to swing away. He remembers his conversation with Meryl about fate and coincidence, and has a revelation. He's haunted by his question, is it possible there are no coincidences? He tells Merrill, almost pro baseball player, to swing away, who begins to attack the alien, but not before it poisons Morgan. Now we get the next big reveal, and more audience members got. To this is describing events. Yeah, again, I, I, at this I point, you know, I, maybe he's racing to the end. And this is like some talk about maybe, it, maybe, because this is pivotal, important stuff. So yeah. I guess we'll see. Turned off the water. The water is harmful to their skin. This was Bo's addition to the situation. <laughs> Graham gets Morgan outside and gives him his injection as Bo watches Meryl trash the alien, exploding all the glasses of water she left around the house. Before too long, the creature breathes its last breath. In the next scene, a very emotional Graham says, that's why he had asthma. He keeps... <laughs> is, that, is that what you would say? It breathes its last breath? Instead of saying just breathes its last? Normally people people say breathes its last, not breathes its last breath. I don't mind it. Oh, so that's why he had asthma. Okay. I get it. 
We went over oh, this. Now. <laughs> I think it took your last breath is fine. Breathe your last breath is weird. <laughs> yeah, because you've already said that that kind of word, basically. So it's just clunky. Yeah. Accidental. He's telling himself that Morgan's lungs were too close for the poison to get in, as his family waits to see if Morgan will wake up. Someone save me. You know what's curious is the didn't they say did, was it like explicitly that it kills them with the poison? Because I thought they said they were harvesting as in capturing like humans. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a knockout gas rather than a poison one. But I think I think the only thing we got was they secrete some kind of a poison or whatever. A lot of people are dead, and those lines are close mm -hmm. to each other. So that's I think fair. that's just the, what we're led to believe. I don't like well, it either way. You know this. Well, well, I think that the thing is this alien has a vendetta, right? Because like you guys were joking about, which I think was actually the rationale is that he chopped my fingers off. So I'm, I'm going. Get I don't want him to call me eight those fingered. Are my fingers. I need them. <laughs> Someone I need said those after, dude, it would be even for, funnier for, if they're like, "We're leaving the globe shark. <laughs> we're going." And he's like, "I ain't going without that motherfucker's son." <laughs> yeah, I'm getting him. <laughs> he stayed behind so, on purpose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's already traumatized. <laughs> it's the principal. He took we my fingers, man. I got business to take care of. You get your new fingers on the planet. We've got that technology. No, I like my old fingers. <laughs> that one was special. I was really attached to them. You just like it cuts to a scene where Mel Gibson did actually take the fingers and he's playing with them at home. <laughs> <laughs> Mel Gibson is wearing them as like a necklace. Yeah, and, and the alien <laughs> and the is, uh, is and looking the at alien him. Alien sees his fingers. Aliens looking at he's him like, throughout <laughs> the window, just like with the fucking angry NPC face. Like, <laughs> they're oh, my I guess fingers. The thing his fingers in the eyes, or like points his fingers and then to Mel Gibson, like I see you. You took him. Puts the fingers on his head, waggles him around like antenna. Look, Look at me, I'm an yeah. alien too. <laughs> Ooh, I'm an alien. Look, I'm Shrek. Ooh, I can't really go through a pantry door. <laughs> Ultimate until you could oh, swear water hurts his own fingers. <laughs> oh, I hope no one chops my fingers off when I get Don't stuck Don't pour in the water pantry. on me, please. Oh, oh. Ooh, this acid tastes so delicious. <laughs> I do like the idea that the alien is trying to threaten people. You just hold up a glass of water and it's like, whoa, let's not go crazy whoa, here. Huh? <laughs> let's, let's calm down. <laughs> Puts the bat down and just picks up the glass of water. Like, whoa, 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 come on. Listen, man, it was just a joke a right? I was just kidding. You humans are great. <laughs> Which is another thing, by the way. Like, he's like, uh, Meryl's in there smashing glasses of water with the bat. And it's just like, why don't you just pick up a glass? I just like threaten to like you know sploosh it on him, and then he'll be like, oh, "Okay, okay, okay, I'm I'm going." You can get more of the water onto him if you just pick up the glass and sploosh it on him. I yep. agree. Yep. Mm. Or if you pour the water on the baseball bat, then you add plus oh, ten water damage. Yeah. 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 Plus ten water damage. Yeah, which is converted into acid damage. Very true. Nice. I think someone did. In this moment. Graham regains his faith. We pan back through the window that was in the opening shot, and while that opening shot was cold and filled with dread, this one is beautiful, sunny, and vibrant, even though the glass is smashed it's not really in. really vibrant, actually. Oh, I guess he had a different take on it than I did. Fair enough. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't blame him for saying it's warmer colors than the initial shot, but warmer, I, would agree, I do think yeah. that the smash glass is definitely symbolic of something, because that, that didn't serve any other purpose in the story, I don't think. It's definitely for that shot. And uh, a glass ceiling between him and his faith in God him, himself being smashed feels appropriate, right? Oh, he broke the glass ceiling. Yeah. Glass queen. Yeah. Where was the cop lady? She never came back. So sad. Yeah, All that right. was... That was kind of weird, I felt like, in the movie, where she felt like a really important character at the beginning, and then she just never shows up again. She, she in comes in, like, splattered with alien blood and scars with a whole bunch of guns, <laughs> and she's like, we literally had she got a bandana on. 200 officers versus 500 of those creatures. They had tanks, they had all kinds of shit. What happened to you guys? And Mel Gibson's like, I don't know. We, uh, <laughs> we, 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 same here. <laughs> yeah, it was tough, I guess. Yeah, crazy. They, they yeah, must we... have, they must have take, taken home all the dead ones, or else they'd be all over. They were all over the place it last does... night. They were everywhere. In sides, too, they could really argue to try and help the universe. It's like, oh, you guys got the retarded. We sent the retarded ones just to get the family with no weapons, and they couldn't even do that. They, they, they were just... <laughs> they were the goofy fucking They got UFO. stuck in a... Is, is, there was, is there a word for high-security prison... Pan tree? Is that, <laughs> that their word for it? Pan, pan a tree? A it would be fun. 
if funny if at the very end like when you think everything's fine there's one alien that gets up he's still alive he's like Rah! it's like ah. the die hard and then the cop lady like splits him <laughs> open with an axe from behind and then he like the alien falls away and you see her covered in blood oh and i thought you were going to different route I thought you were going to say, wouldn't it be funny if at the very end of the movie, it cut back to the pantry and he was like jiggling the handle. He was like, guys, <laughs> guys, are you there? Guys, That's the after credits scene. It yeah. hurts, actually. I actually, I, I thought I you were going to say, paint. I think you were, I thought you were going to say, what if she like split him in half by shooting him from like bottom to top down, like through the center. <laughs> Each of the blow holes, <laughs> holes creates a, like a clean cut all together and he splits apart. <laughs> But that yeah. would be a big CGI spectacle with sparks yeah. flying and we can't that's have true. that. Yeah, that's true. Beautiful, <laughs> sunny, and vibrant, even though the glass is smashed in. A time lapse occurs to the following winter, and Graham walks out of the restroom all decked out in his priestly garb, and the film fades out. Now, He's I have had a promised great throughout this review that we I discuss so the film's time ending. To provide additional insight. <laughs> Don't say great it's only like five minutes left. Don't say he had a great food. Say he had a holy shit. <laughs> Someone was watching the. Uh, <laughs> Someone was watching the stream. Just sent me a chat uh -huh. summary that says the chat is about a movie called Signs, where people discuss various creative and funny ways to defend themselves against aliens, including using water guns, baseball bats soaked in holy water, spitting, and even peeing. <laughs> <laughs> I love the oh. idea that you piss on an alien and the alien reports back. They they have natural weaponry. It's a gun that's located in their like you know half midsection. It shoots acid at us. Like it's horrible. Yeah, do you know how we have those things on our wrists? Well, they have the half of them have this thing between their I get their legs or whatever, and some are way bigger than others. But and then they 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 pee on us. <laughs> <laughs> they have this acid when they spray. That acid us. gun? That's how they reproduce. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> so they drink acid to live and they squirt acid into their females to make more? What are the eggs full of? We could never dominate this planet. We will never return we to it. We must go home. <laughs> what Lovecraftian horror. <laughs> These bizarre apes from another world. <laughs> You know, a squirt gun would be a cool thing to set up early, like a kid's, you know, playing with it. It's like, how many times have I told you not to use that squirt gun in the house? And then at the end, when the water thing is revealed, it's just like, go, go fill up the squirt gun. Go in the kitchen. Well, I and mean, then, like, as he's filling it up, he gets, like, the, he detaches it and fills it up with water, and the alien's looking at him. Sorry, just give me a minute. <laughs> oh yeah he, he's, oh he's trying to make a water balloon and he can't quite tie it and he tries over and over and over to That'd be funny. Yeah, yeah, into yeah. the water <laughs> balloon Fuck. all right hold on uh, is, this is actually really tough around the finger try i'm trying to get it through the little ah, it's well it is the obvious meme right with the he shoots the water pistol but it goes and like falls onto the ground he's like kind of pump it he's like hang on <laughs> this is gonna be great hang on <laughs> give my thoughts on why a lot of the complaints I hear are completely unwarranted. Ooh, here we go! Ooh, the pantry, go, yes. So this is the explained part, I guess. All right, let's do it. Yeah. Complaint number one: the pantry. Uh, why? Why? Okay, sorry, not to be pedantic here, but like, why is the text different? Why is it different font? Because when he downloaded the font, because it only worked for one, letters, not for numbers. numbers yeah. Yep. A lot of yep. fonts won't have the symbols yep. sometimes. That is exactly usually, why. Usually they have the numbers, but it's the yes. symbols you gotta watch for. Like, do they have there's, actually the? Yeah. You know. Yeah. There's a couple that don't have numbers, and I guess he got unlucky. Oh, I mean, some of the things I had to look for when I was looking for like a whiteboard style font is like, well, it's got to have numbers and some symbols because I'll use those. And he yeah. didn't just pick a different font either, which is funny. <laughs> no, well, he has to go with he has to go for the messy typewriter font. Well, yes, that's right. He has to go for courier uh, because yeah. he is a screen. This is film. We're talking about film. So he has to use the screenwriter font. I am Indeed. a screenwriter. I am a screenwriter, <laughs> Dr. Han. As by how many posts I've seen complaining that the aliens can't get out of a pantry or that boarded up doors don't stop them and how idiotic that is. This I've never been able to understand. They All right, so can you, let's, not let's, before we, you can understand. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, exactly what I was going for. Surely you can understand why this is a criticism. 
surely you can understand how intuitive it is. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it, go, it goes beyond shoes. you. If, if the whole world had this reaction to signs, it's famous for this. Yeah, if you don't understand it, that's just a failing on your part to use any. Like, come on, man! Like, it's don't not, don't you think that's a reasonable issue to take with? It's you not know, hard this... either, because like, imagine okay, Jared, Jurassic Park. What is it? One of the one of the things that makes the Raptors so dangerous is that they can open doors. So just take that, but kind of do the reverse, and then you see why the problem with the aliens not being able to open doors is a problem. And we well, and and we're letting it go. How the fuck did M Night do his? How did he capture an alien? You know, like what 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 happened in that scenario? Were they were they battling and he it did a thing with the alien jump for him and he he like leapt well, back he said, and he said he found him in there. He found what was he? <laughs> he was looking for secret herbs and spices. <laughs> Colonel Sanders, secret herbs and spice, eleven herbs and spices. That's why they're invading <laughs> Earth because the chicken on their home world. I, is I'm very sorry. Quiet. We need to make this movie where M Night comes downstairs to make his sandwich and then he sees the alien. The alien sees him and he goes, "I can explain." <laughs> and then M Night fucking <laughs> closes the door on him. <laughs> Oh shit! <laughs> it locks it. Like, no! What are you doing? I'm friendly. Because, or is like, the beginning of the war caused because the alien got the KFC, but he took the skin off the chicken? Yeah. So mm. they decided it was time to end this civilization. That son of a bitch! But God, it's so bad for you. But that's where the flavor is. Ah, <laughs> uh, more taste, less filling. Great. Like, taste, other peace less talks. Filling. They're trying to organize diplomacy and everything, and then they're like, "So, did one of your aliens try to steal this man's food from his pantry?" And they're like, uh, "That that was no. That we don't know what. Uh, that was a mistake. That was an accident. He would never do that." And besides, you guys chopped his fingers off, so I feel like you're more in the wrong than we are. So, like, <laughs> just putting it out yeah. there. <laughs> and then they're like, well, at least at the chicken council, we can't all agree that thighs are better than breasts, right? And everyone's like, no, no, we can't agree on that. No, That's yeah. not something we can agree on. That would be a whole thing as well. There's the alien from the damn pantry. He obviously got out. How do you think the aliens got into the house? Wait, sorry, let's roll back okay, a bit. Okay, sorry, uh, uh, yeah. He's oh, gonna he's going to make it even worse. Yeah, oh, I was this, this, yeah this I've never terrible. been able to understand. There's the alien from the damn pantry. He obviously got out. Right, so... Okay, so, yes. Chris, what do you think the next question's going to be? Yeah, like, this isn't even <laughs> something you feel should be said, but he's forced us to. It's like, you what can't say he can't get out of the pantry, so... because he did get out of there. You're like, oh... Mm -hmm. What took him so oh, long? Oh no, it's returning. Why, did Why it was he so still long? there for Mel Gibson to find him in the first place? If I was trapped in a pantry on a foreign alien world I was intent on conquering, then I wouldn't just sit around in a pantry waiting for what, who knows well, so what I would be waiting for. Got... I'd be like, no, I'm leaving. I'm breaking the door down because it's not that difficult at all, and I'm leaving. Generally two options here. One... Uh, his alien friends turned up, opened the thing for him, and was like, "Dude, like you gotta, you gotta stop this happening." And the question <laughs> remains: How does that stop him? On the other hand, he did break out, and in which case, but but why did it take him so long? Why what what's take the... so long? Yeah, I like the idea of his friends showing up, walking up to the door. They're like, "Dude, are you in there?" Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you, you know for a fact it would be it would be quiet for about five seconds, and then yeah, <laughs> and then they're like, "You stuck, you know that." I know. Remember, yeah, he, he <laughs> hesitates letting his friends know he's in there because it's so embarrassing. He's just like, shit, yeah, I gotta tell him. One yeah, of them sorry. grabs two pieces of bread from the pantry, puts it on his face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you? Like, remember on oh. Galavolo 7, we got stuff in the Goomba shed? Like, you've done this again? He's like, <laughs> and then they said, you know what this means? You have to wear the clown suit. Here you go. Here's the wig. Here's the little red nose. This is you. You're the clown for today. <laughs> well, he fair. should have that clown suit on in the living room scene. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, you're not here, are you? And he's like, eh, it's my fingers. <laughs> it's nothing <laughs> really. Your fingers. How do you think the aliens got into the house when the family was in the basement? Well, we were told- I like yeah. how he's saying this like, ah, got you good. Like, come on. Chris, you're highlighting the problem. The All he's done is is, is deftly explained so the can, problem. they can, they did. Yes. So they can break the boards, they can break through walls, house. but they did not yeah. do so. At least this is one point. They're like, yeah, if it was before, you'd be like, it's stupid that they can't get through. Also, but I guess if they can't get windows? through, then, you know. <laughs> well, why couldn't they get through the fucking basement door? Yeah, you can't tell me. It has one board on it. Ugh, oh, that was dumb. 
Yeah, it's, this is what I mean. Like, remember it wraps its claws around the bottom of the front door? Why? why it's it good visual, that? but why? <laughs> like, yeah, why is you? Why weird. do you, Mel? Why do you have so much space open on the front of your door to stick your fingers through? Do, <laughs> do you, that's how you get ants, Mel. Mel, yeah, Mel, we gotta talk about this. <laughs> it's basic home security. I don't know. They busted in. <laughs> there is literally no reason to be surprised by a living creature taking some time to bust through something with two tables stacked against it. Um, so the, the, the question, first of all, I guess, is there's a light source in that pantry. Is there a window? In which case, they know how to break through fucking windows way faster. I than, think uh, it'd be safe to assume there is a window if it's a house. Most rooms yes. have windows. And then, of course, uh, this. So it's, so it's like, so you've decided they are strong enough to break through uh, boarded windows and doors, but they're not strong enough to break through a table uh, wedged against the door. That seems a little bit like, I don't know. <laughs> it's just you've decided that's how yeah, strong they are, slash what weapons they have. Or how long he would have been trying to open the door? How long do you think it should have taken him? Several hours? Yeah. It should have probably taken him a minute. And if it took him several hours to get out, then why didn't it take him several hours to also get into the house? <laughs> you no, know, remember, like a, a pantry door. It's just not gonna. St it's not gonna stop a person. It's just a little pantry door. Those hinges, you would just kick them, and they would just come off. They're well, not these designed creatures... to keep a, a human being out by force. My assumption would be that the creatures are much stronger than us, uh, on average, certainly. So, you know, uh, like this, this answer is wholly unsatisfying. Okay. The light source, though, or did he just turn the light on and then leave? Here you go. Here's a light <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> I'm, I'm scared of the dark. I don't like the cornfields either. Actually, I'm not going to tell all my friends because they'll laugh at me. But I'm scared well, at that when we point. Get into the cornfield. Yeah, this it's like a missed opportunity because uh, you would would you be tempted when you're outside to be like, I'm going to go look through the fucking window. Here I go. I'm going to see that thing. Yeah. It's in there. And then he sees you. You see him, and he's just like, fuck you. <laughs> I know. Uh, actually, no. If the light was on. Like, no, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm like, why is there a light in the, in the pantry? So unless you can... turn the light on. Well, I assume no, it's a no, window. No, I'm saying like, oh, why are okay. the lights on? Why, why is it on? Yeah, on? it would be. It's yeah. bizarre to just have your light in the pantry in the always on. Well, if you have the door open. It it we are why is it always it, on? It does not oh, look like an artificial light based on like color no, temperature. It doesn't. Yeah. It looks like a window, like natural it light coming in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a pantry bulb would probably be a tungsten yeah. thing. Yeah, but I agree. Pantries don't typically have windows, so this must just be a weird pantry with a uh, window in it. Funnily enough, because I I don't I don't have much experience with everyone's pantries. It's just not some of the. But uh, Google says pantries should have a window, but it's not necessary. Oh, oh wow! I I would say of all the pantries I've seen, and I so I've su seen a surprising amount actually. Now that I think about it, very few have had windows. Well, so that's what I would have said. In my experience, pantries typically do not have windows, but yeah, I guess this one—they're just yeah. like little. They're just like kitchen, little tiny kitchen closets, and uh, yeah, like they walk in closets for can, food. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Anyway, I think I know. Uh, like, may I? Yeah, it's. it's I, I feel odd like for um, pantry, I Chris's explanation is in aid of the people with the issue. Like he's made it clear why it's an issue. Yeah. It's as simple as this. They don't have freaking laser guns. It's kind of... <laughs> yeah, why not? Oh, That's oh, another problem, have... well, Chris. I don't have laser guns. Yeah. yeah, I don't have laser guns, but I could beat down the door of a pantry without much issue <clears throat> if I really wanted to get out. For sure, yeah. You try to well, hand wave away the weaponry thing. Some, at some point in the film, doesn't the kid read the book and explain that they wouldn't come in using all of their weapons? They'd use like low-scale infiltration tactics and hand-to-hand, -hand, and if they lose then they will come back with their full force, which I think is the film's attempt to hand wave away yes, the absence of technology uh, the, like this. It's not at all convincing, but no. it does try. The book says that if they were to use advanced weaponry, then humans would nuke them, and then the planet would be useless to them. As if the, the, the nature of using your advanced technology to get the job of harvesting several humans and getting out quickly would trigger a nuclear holocaust. Like, what are you talking about? Why? Why would humans, when a bunch of aliens are going to different areas of the world in cities and houses and stealing people, do you really think that the government's going to be like, well, better nuke everything? We live here, sir. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so dumb, and, and it's obviously a line to try and explain why they don't have any advanced weaponry, which is uh, weak, yeah. to say the least.
But you know what? If you're not allowed to have laser guns, you can at least bring a fucking club, an alien club. Oh, yeah, or a crowbar. Like yeah, or like a laser cutter so they can get out of any conceivable yeah, obstacle have, like, if they need to. Kit. Exactly. Or a spacesuit, technology for locations mm -hmm. and communications and blah, 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 Pants. blah, blah. Pants are, uh, pants are advanced technology. It's going to take some not even, time. Not even the Romans wore pants. Come on. To bust through something. Shit. I mean, this thing even did it while it was missing two fingers. Another Why would it not have That doesn't matter. You'd use your feet. On, yeah, either the feet or a shoulder. You Why just would... kick the hinge and it would also, come guess, up. Yeah. <laughs> Just like hit at it with his hands, <laughs> to try and bust He's also not out. entertained at all that his friends came and let him out of the pantry. I'm surprised by this. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, they look after him. <laughs> be like he hasn't come back after a while after he went to that pantry. I mean, we should go get him. Also, I guess pantry does, situation does he not with leave? Because look at his like. There's no. It's, it's like his fingers are sealed up. Like you know. Yeah. Like the way that it would look like if you amputated them in a hospital, but then you know. So I guess that's like a <clears throat> healing factor. Maybe. Uh, I, maybe it's just a weird alien thing. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. Another thing, people tend to be like, well, how in the world did that thing find them? Remember, the crop circles were used for navigation. Obviously, they lived really close to Ray Reddy because he drove right to his house. Um, More than likely, that thing... That could have been 20 uh, minutes. It could have been a 20, 30 uh, minute drive. Uh, Chris, the yeah. amount of people that live within the vicinity of... Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> this whole yeah. town of oh, people. He, drove, he must be really, really close because he, drove, he, he drove there in that rural is America. He drove... Even in a city, people drive like they, 30, we saw 40, how 50 it, minutes. The, the population of this place is insane. He he just was like, it's probably the house next to the side. Why? Why? Yeah, why? why? If, if you drive 20 <laughs> minutes, that could be 20 minutes in any direction and everything that's exactly. contained within that. And it could be way more than 20 minutes. Let's be Obviously, real. Yeah, it could be more than, than way more than 20 minutes. You promised explanations, also, Chris, not questions. <laughs> <laughs> also, okay, if he, if everyone else has left and he's one of the few wounded remaining, why go to the place they were supposed to attack? Unsuccessfully. Yeah. yeah. Close to Ray Reddy because he drove right to his house. More than likely, that thing headed to the nearest crop circle trying to get back to his race, wasn't able to, and went to the nearest house. Wait, so it was so just an entire coincidence, is what you're saying? Yes. Wow. <laughs> All right. Well. Oh, uh, well, a uh, uh, complaint addressed. Complaint addressed. Right. Yeah. You, you did it, Chris. Here oh, we go. No, the water. The water. Uh -huh. <laughs> complaint <laughs> number two the water. This is the biggest one. Then maybe you should call it number one. I know it's a minor <laughs> thing, but like number two. Water. Why would aliens come to a planet composed of roughly 70% water? There's it's water. Not, this, you have to complete the criticism. Not necessarily. It's, yeah, it's yeah. like that might be one question. But the real question is if they are so, if they hate water so much, if it kills them, how come they have not taken any steps to protect them? Yeah, no precaution or understanding of the nature of the thing that's going to annihilate them on this planet whatsoever. It's, 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 mm -hmm. and it's very hard to understand that considering the composition of this planet, which they would obviously have tools to analyze. How could they fucking well, not? I mean, considering can look we at are it. not capable of interstellar travel, and we, well, we're not capable of just it's sending people to, like, Pluto, for instance, but we know a lot about that. Yeah. I was about to call it a planet, and I was like, oh, wait, no, a dwarf planet. Whatever it is in your heart. Yeah. yeah. We know Whatever a lot about spirit. Mars. We've never been to Mars personally. But you know what? When we eventually go there, we're going to have all kinds I'm, of precautions. Yeah, no run around naked. Humans have a variety of hazard suits for beekeeping or radioactive material or whatever the fuck. Exactly. They can't just bring yeah. a fucking don't even waterproof kill us, suit. But we still yeah. wear full suits to protect. Well, us from a bees. sufficient number of bees can get you, right? I guess enough bees. Yeah. Can yeah. Get you. I, uh, I, I think the bees. That's not. The oh bees, yes, indeed. the bees. Oh, oh yes, the bees. But go on. Let's let's hear it. What has he got? Roughly seventy percent water. There's water in the air. What if it rained? I have a large amount of theories about this. For okay. one, it's possible that these... I have a large amount of theories about large... this. Um... It's funny. They are quite <laughs> large in size. <laughs> I, have a large, I have a large amount of theories. Is a I have a large theory. I have a large number of theories, and the theories are very large themselves. Well, he has a large amount of theories. <laughs> large amount. These creatures had both? never encountered water before in their entire lifespan. 
I mean, oh, no. imagine that, that we seems just... unlikely. There is I, a. I don't believe that. There, there, there is a a surprising abundance of water in the uh, in the on on planet. I think that even if I entertain that this or is the water. first encounter they have with water, which is so hard to believe in terms of the composition of just creatures and uh, the the universe, even um, even still. We there's plenty of like elements that we may not have encountered, but we can analyze from a distance. I don't see why this is. Well, why I mean, would they it, even you know, go we, on a fucking foot excursion naked into a planet without first collecting samples or analyzing it? it. Yeah. It, it, yeah, like if we went to Mars, you know, whenever that happens, if it happens, we're not going there like unaware of what that planet is like and how we need to deal with being on that planet. One like over, we actually, we example. target a planet specifically because of what it has on it. Like, you study yeah. it in order to find out what's on it, in order to work out whether it's worth going. You don't sit there, yeah. like, a billion light years away saying, I wonder what all that blue shit is. Oh, fuck it, let's go find <laughs> out. And you yeah, just like, land, wait, wait. immediate <laughs> contact with the atmosphere, and you burn to death. Just That's yeah. just dumb. It, it'd just be like if we went to Venus, like, I'm sure this will go swimmingly, and then just step out. <laughs> Like, well, by the it's... way, this is why uh, it fucking annoys me in Prometheus. It's worse in Alien Covenant. But they're like, oh, this is a this atmosphere has oxygen or whatever. It's like, and they just take the mass off. It's like, there's a lot of different things that could still affect you that you don't know yet. You can't exactly. just decide to do that. Maybe they oh. have airborne chlamydia. You don't know. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, that's the thing with these aliens. The, I would expect them to do what we do. Drones or sample robots. Any kind of anything sent in to and just... Rovers and stuff like that. The idea that you would just go naked to a planet without any awareness of its composition or what could potentially be toxic to you is insane. It's very convenient for your that's horror insane. drama, but it's nonsense. <laughs> so, you know, do better. That's the... Uh... That's the note. I mean, imagine that we discover a far away inhabited planet. It's okay. entirely plausible to assume that there would be unknown elements on the surface that could possibly be toxic to us. Right. Yeah, that's why we wouldn't go there. Sure. That's why when we exit the spacecraft, assuming we couldn't analyze it from a distance, right, with our instruments and tools, we wouldn't go out stark naked and just, <laughs> like, hope for the best. This nope. Really bad. Yeah. So far. <laughs> really Shouldn't bad. we put on the suits? Nope. No. Nah. That's We're just what they'll raw. expect. Yeah. We're gonna go out naked and wriggle around on the ground like worms. <laughs> they won't expect a bunch, a bunch of doink and aliens. <laughs> <laughs> the generals like send the doink squad. <laughs> they go in first. <laughs> Perhaps something that our technology isn't able to discover or warn us about. It's but remember. Water. It's it's the most abundant <laughs> substance on the surface of the planet, the planet that you can identify. What do you mean? <laughs> Just get anywhere. You you collect. And this is of course assuming that they had never encountered water before, which seems unlikely. But you just, the, the drone I, I comes it, in. It I just selects, find it unbelievable. It's like samples. They it. take it back to the ship, and they're like, "Holy fuck! This toxic fucking substance is horrific to anything we tested on that relates to our uh, basic biology." Wow, that's crazy, and the whole planet is filled with it. We shall call Let's it, you else. know, death murder juice. <laughs> the guy on the radio said, they didn't what? come here for our planet. They came here for us. Uh -huh. It's entirely possible yeah, but these... If we go to we're Mars, like we're not going there for any... Yeah, do they not know our composition? Like, we still want to learn about yeah, what we're the like, planet's we're like. Yeah, we're like 90% are... water or whatever. It's a, yeah. We're an absurdly I don't, I don't, large amount of water. <laughs> I thought mean, it was 90, it's like 70, right? But... I thought it was 80 or 70, to the point, yeah. Well, it's like, it's to the point where in other, um, in other, like, science fiction stories and stuff, humans are, like, jokingly referred to as, like, sacks of water. Like yeah. Water sacks. Meat bags. Yeah, meat all... bags, water sacks, the whole thing, because of our, you know, composition. And, of exactly. course, we haven't even spoken about just the fact that there is water in the air. Yeah, yep, so the moment too. they opened so, up the spacecraft, their their skin should have started want, instantly to become irritated and burning. They want to harvest us for our materials, yet they are unaware that the vast majority of the material they would harvest from us is entirely toxic to them, to the point where they don't even recognize it. That makes sense. They would mm -hmm. not like pick one person up just to run a couple of tests to make yep. sure that they don't piss acid or cry <laughs> like death juice. <laughs> None Guys, of that. Yeah. Where's the scout ship that's like, all right, we're just going to check it out and make sure there's not water everywhere, because you know how we feel about that. I, I am shocked that he thinks that this is a compelling argument. Well, hey, maybe they didn't know. 
Well, I mean, maybe they, they were taught it. ships and they traverse the galaxy. Maybe they were taught it as a common defense, but I'm not only going to be doing it for interstellar <laughs> travelers, you know? I just don't think that's going to work out. Well, it's just, we can't travel to other planets with ease. Really, I mean, I mean, we haven't traveled to another planet. We've only been to the moon with people. Like, and we know a lot about our planets and our solar system. Yeah, we know what the what's on the surface and of we planets. Never a lot of the makeups on... of the... Yeah, the Any atmosphere them, and the, the surface. The mm hmm I mean, we know this. And we can't travel to these places with relative ease. I wish they mentioned they on the news reports in the movie how retarded the aliens are once they leave. <laughs> 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 yeah. They seem to be quite dull. Luckily, the greatest enemy of the aliens was their own stupidity. <laughs> the aliens were more retarded than we expected. And than we could have ever imagined. If you're really, if you're really scared of the end, just run a bath and sit in it, and they cannot touch you. It's like you are safe if you're in a shower, for example. Like you can't be touched if you're in water. It's just, and also then it like reinvites the other criticism, which is that if they are only here to harvest us, then why the fuck would they reveal themselves over major population centers? Why not just grab people from like isolated farms or like little villages exactly. and mountain people? Like none of it makes sense. Even if you think you can answer the problem by saying. Oh, but they're not here for the planet, they're here for us. Okay, but then why are they being so retarded in the way they try and get us? I don't know, yep. man. It's, uh, maybe they're retarded. You know, you can grab people before you make the crop circles. <laughs> no, no, well, you can't do that. You need the crop circles to navigate. Yeah, otherwise you get lost. You know, at yeah. this point, yeah. I actually think What's this movie would be more coherent if, afterwards? if the crop circles were a coincidence. That wasn't even the aliens. They're like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else. That was just two guys from down the road. Yeah, that was the Wolfington brothers. Like a, or if it was some sort of an honorific slash religious symbol that they just do. It's like, yes, on the worlds we conquer, we burn the symbol of our god of war onto the, the crops of the enemy before we, before we take you. Bah. Or rags. There was a whole other alien race invading at exactly the same time, and they did that, and they were like, "Oh shit, you guys have already invaded." Okay, well, we can. That's wait. a good premise for a movie where, t coincidentally, two aliens that hate each other also want to conquer Earth. Yeah, so we're, it's mostly just oh, them fighting with each other while we just like, oh, uh, oh. Right. Yeah, we we could be like, you, "Do you guys want to sort this out between you two first? The other two are like, "No, you two fit. No, you two fit. Just like no, fucking. <laughs> not, we'll get to you. We'll get to you. Just, just let mommy and daddy. I need to sort something out. Okay." came here for us. It's entirely possible that these aliens have absolutely zero interest in Earth. They only want- We are water too. <laughs> we are of Earth. Just, we are, we are shockingly not they have watery. In Earth, it doesn't matter. They must have an interest in Earth because they got to go there to get the people. They need to know what the environment is like and if it's hazardous and toxic to them. I don't understand how they're so familiar with human biology but not at all familiar with Earth's composition. What? How does that make sense? Yeah, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work. Want to harvest us. Why? Does it matter? What else yeah. did we learn in that radio scene? That they retreated so fast they left their wounded behind. This shows the creature's desperation. This shows they more than likely had no idea what they were walking into. Yeah, and are that's, that's the criticism. Yes, that's, that's the, the criticism. Problem. You can't Congratulations. explain it by repeating it. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Possibly a race in dire need of survival, looking for some last resort. Remember the Brazilian video? The camouflaged creature cowering oh, when you in the bushes. that he was scared. Well, was and the, cowering. And the, yeah. You made that up. You made it up that he, he, made that up, he was cowering, it, he wouldn't have... And he was talking about how like, it's going to be like really he... important to explain the criticism. So as he said, that this is evidence they were spooked and didn't know what they were doing, which is part of the criticism still. It's not an explanation. Alone? My guess is that thing is terrified. It's completely separated from the group. Perhaps he's watched his friends all die as they were exposed to the atmosphere for an extended... That doesn't make this better. It makes it worse. Uh, yeah. Then leave. Then leave. Go. However you got down, get back up. Ugh. Period of time. Period of time. My point is, this entire movie is told from the perspective. Also, hang on a minute. This happened before they engaged the attack. Yep. yep. Way before. So what? It's they they like got information of all of their here. friends dying from the exposure to the materials of this planet, and then they were like, well, let's just go anyway. And then they had massive losses, and so they're like, <laughs> well, this hasn't worked out, guys. Yeah. A classic be his case argument of, well, that won't happen though. to me. 
like his argument here will be, oh, it's only from our perspective. So we looked at it and we saw them preparing for an invasion. But what they were actually was like scared shitless because all their friends had been rained to death. <laughs> it is kind of funny you're walking across a road one of them steps in a puddle and their foot just fucking falls off he's like ah what the <laughs> fuck like, yeah. jesus brazil's oh, pretty... dissolving into it until it's just like their head <laughs> and then just like disappear it's into like, it. help <laughs> it doesn't a pretty... matter yeah, if it's 10 feet or one inch they'll just sink into it instantly <laughs> either way yeah. i don't know a lot about brazil but i'm pretty sure it's pretty wet far as places go nah well even you made that like up. wherever you go like in the morning the morning dew means you just can't go anywhere and like fog fog is like an acid cloud yeah <laughs> my point is this entire movie is told from the perspective of one family the information that the audience gets is as limited as what they get I'm sure if this was a film that was directed like Independence Day, which in its own right is a really fun movie, showing countries all over the world, the suspense would have instantly ended when they show a place that happened. Well, to be clear, this shows countries all over the world as well. We get the perspectives of like the family in the, the, the Brazil, right? Like that's their perspective. The whole video is them in their perspective mm -hmm. and there's two or three news reports as well, which is not just the perspective of this family. That is the information being like given to this family but it's so limited because the film can't accommodate any perspective which in, like includes inquiry so like they can't actually have news reports telling the family things that we would reasonably have deduced by that point because if they did then the film wouldn't work but that requires humans to deliberately not contact them not like pick up the radio waves not examine what the ships are not fly up to examine them not do anything and just to relay what they've picked up from home videos in brazil which is dumb i would also put forth that if he's saying there's a whole bunch of information we could have access to that would make this all make sense, I'd be like, so as it stands, it doesn't make sense. And then he would be like, yeah. no, it's just about POV, okay? And he'd be like, no, we, we don't have POV enough. My POV is that this doesn't make sense. Yeah, we don't have, the, the information they provided us either doesn't comport with other information they provided us or it's insufficient to support like the ways that the film un unfolds which is a failure of the, the story. And the fact that this is one of the most famously made fun of movies for a, like a small error, or rather a, a detail that just unravels the entire thing. It reminds me of Looper, or... Um, I'm trying to think oh, of... Oh, like... what, where it's... Uh, that you can't, you can't get away with killing people in the future. That's why you got to send them back in time to kill them. But the entire plot happens because someone got killed in the future. Yeah, like it feels like it's just this silly oversight. Like, how did that, how did that happen? You miss yeah. that, like. Well, it's it's like uh, they removed uh, basically the worst possible Jenga block. Yeah. And you're like, it won't matter if I move this, yeah. And then <laughs> the whole thing just falls down. Yeah, and then, that one. Then the film itself is like, don't think about it. You're like, well, but you practically asked me to think about it yourself. You're the one that told me about it. Like, why? I like, I'm just listening to what you're telling me. Yeah, I'm here to watch the movie, and this is what you're telling me. What? What do you? What am I supposed to think? You? You said this. I remembered it. I was listening when you told me this. I'm sure if this was a film that was directed like Independence Day, which in its own right is a really fun movie, showing countries all over the world, the suspense would have instantly ended when they show a place that happens to be raining. Now, you, that's the fucking filmmaker's that's problem the to problem solve. Problem with the story. Yeah, yeah the, the you need to fix that shit. Just you, don't show the things that don't make sense. An interesting strategy, Christopher Stuckman. <laughs> that is, unironically, a lot of bad writer's strategy. Just don't show the things that don't make sense. Yeah, just show the... Well, don't show the no, repercussions no, show of there, your story. Because it would be yeah. silly and sad. Stay on the guided lines. Stay on the guided lines. Oh, yes, Ray Reddy's character said it seemed like they were avoiding water. But remember this, you can't make a crop circle in water. <laughs> Where do you even begin? I don't know why. What like, relevance like legitimately, is that? Legitimately, where do you begin with that? Uh. Wait, you can't make a crop circle in water. So, so I, what? <laughs> you can't make anything. a crop circle in pudding. What am I supposed to do with this information? Well, the aliens must not like pudding. I, I guess that's their weakness. I mean, the aliens weren't stupid it's... enough to land in the water itself. You know, like they. 
I love the use of the word remember there. Like, I can't tell if it's intentionally condescending or not. Remember, like a... you can't do it in water because water doesn't behave like It's the meme like from that. earlier. It's like, they, they also can't do it in lava. I guess that's their weakness. Like, what, well... Yeah. Which is what they were using as a navigation system. All of this is subjective. Which is the whole point. No, it, this what? is the opposite of that. We're describing the events the as they happen. Yeah. This <laughs> this is independent of us. This is just the events of the uh, film. This is just the information. If we all drop dead for whatever reason, that would still be the facts of the matter. It, just, just for using his own example, it is not subjective that you cannot make crop circles in a place with no crops. I mean, that's just objective. <laughs> like obviously, if your opinion differs, if you think you can, you know, that's your opinion. I can make crop circles on sand if I want to, all right? But yeah, I just didn't you. because it's subjective. It's about the terror and confusion of one family trying to deal with this situation, which is why this film is all the more affecting and relatable. Lastly, how long were that was a okay. uh, oh, just, uh, yeah we just jumped okay. into that just point. Give up. that's just giving up that's just giving up well no it's about this so nothing it's about else matters, family and that's what's so powerful things. about it I'll defend the things that don't matter but they they don't matter but I will defend them because they matter but they also it's subjective feel compelled also it's subjective <laughs> but it doesn't matter but it does yeah he but, gave up in the span of like two sentences it's really funny. Um, pro tip for anyone who's working on any sort of work of fiction, right? There are things you can leave open that you don't need to give exact specifics on, you know, if you're focusing on the perspective of characters that don't have all the information, but, uh, it needs to be plausible either way, right? <laughs> this may seem obvious, but there's no way to make sense of the water thing. You know what I mean? It's it's not like oh well, there must be something explaining it that we just don't see. Like there's yeah, no I mean, if, you're, if you're gonna have gaps in your fiction, you got to be able to slot some conceivable logic in there. Like even if it's not, you know. Stated I mean, even explicitly. such that the vast majority of the movie going audience finds it acceptable, as opposed to this becomes a famous flaw for the film. Yeah. If there if there's a reasonable interpretation of how this all works i'm dying to hear it chris don't just tell me it's subjective oh yeah don't don't just tell us that there's there's versions of this film where it would be explained it's like well give us an example what is the explanation exactly were the aliens actually on earth okay so the movie starts out with the family discovering the crop circle then all the crap starts to go down from that scene to when the aliens leave the planet at night only three days pass. I think people tend to miss this. In the course of three days, the aliens arrive on Earth and likely send out a few scouts, like the one we saw on the roof. Scouts to do what? I don't even... Stand on a roof? Why wouldn't they have technology to do what these scouts are doing? Can you see better from the roof than you can your spaceship? If they're capable of traveling across space they can build spaceships why can't they build drones or why can't they build drovers? a fucking camera why don't you just <laughs> yeah. fly around in your spaceship you're already landing like you're parked above their cities so who cares if they see you just fly around and look at stuff Fuck what, it. And, like, and i mean if they are so unfamiliar with the concept of water then surely an ocean existing would be stunning to the point that they'd be like we need to re we should rethink probably, this. Like, look into this and figure out what this is yeah yeah the acid vapor is going to be everywhere in I the also air, like, everywhere we go. This is the thing. This in isolation, we talked about the things we like about it, but it, in retrospect, it's just like, what is the alien doing here? Like, he's like, I'm going to watch them as they sleep to collect yeah. information. Like, what? <laughs> just standing up here, being a spooky man. Just doinking. <laughs> exactly, they're just doinking around. <laughs> doinking hey, around. we doinking! I would like to see uh, him doinking. get off the roof. He's just like, how the fuck am I going to I'd like to down? see him get off, too. He seems stressed. It was like the Santa Claus movie where <laughs> Mel Gibson sees him and he goes, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> 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 like... He slowly crawls he into the cord, thing. like, don't see me, he's not seeing me, he doesn't see me. Oh, fuck. <laughs> then more are sent in a desperate attempt to salvage anything they can. Then they get the hell out of there as fast as possible, even leaving their wounded behind. This is why I'm always surprised at the absurd amount of complaints involving water. 
it's very obvious that this race of creatures is immensely <laughs> desperate and possibly even scared, scrounging for whatever they can. But that wouldn't change if, if they were immensely desperate and they just couldn't leave. They had to stay no matter what. Then why would they leave after the water? If they're that desperate, you, you can't leave. You got to stick to it. I just so we're looking at a species that was hyper advanced and said to themselves, we've got only the material left in our spaceships that we're, we're zooming around in space with. We've got nothing, basically, except the ability to travel to one planet. Let's try this Earth one. I don't know. Let's the best of luck. Zoom. Here we are. Let's let's go down and get some stuff because oh god, we're about to die. Oh geez, these humans have water. Oh, let's get. Oh, it's over, guys. We're fucked. <laughs> I just it's like what? <laughs> it's a real shame, man. I guess they ran out of everything to the point where they were like reduced down to the equivalent of the Stone Age aliens. You know what I mean? Like they they just they're just naked. But the yeah. leaving must be an option for them because they leave. Well, yeah. Like it's it's not they're not so desperate that they have to get something from this mission. They send Bob down, and Bob gets down, and it's like, oh well, this planet has water on it, and the people piss water, and they they drink water, and like everything's water, and it's shit. We can't do this. This planet was don't designed then send, by the gods to keep. You us don't send out, more so Bobs out of desperation, yeah. and then recall the Bob so you can run away somewhere else to do this. Like that ordering of events doesn't make sense. You don't commit more resources out of desperation if you are resource strapped and you know you're getting nothing. That's just dumb. Mind you, they are dumb, so maybe that is what they would do. Well, and he hasn't really addressed the, the question of, like, even in day one, they would have been rained on. They're all over the earth. So he even showed the comment where somebody basically said yeah. that. Like, it, it, that's what I'm saying. He hasn't addressed it. He's just said they're desperate. It's like, uh, well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it what it just makes... doesn't seem to align with the way that they conduct themselves throughout the film. This is just uh, cope. Yep this movie scary to me is that it focused on one family and their plight throughout this situation. Since we know as little as they know, it's terrifying. Everything I just said really isn't the point of this film, however. The movie isn't about aliens or invasion, it's about it faith. Is. He's really done every possible, like, you know, low-level sort of just dismissal argument possible. Um, yep. yeah, so like, here are the raw counters that don't make sense. Here are some speculation counters that definitely don't make sense and aren't a part of the film at all. Also, you don't need counters, just so you know. Also, it's subjective. Also, it's not what the film is about. It's like, okay. <laughs> I feel like you're holding way too many counter arguments that do not coexist at all. We're just throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. That's how it feels, yeah. Losing it and regaining it. It's about a family figuring out how to work again, and I find that extremely moving. I would if it were well executed. It's mostly kind of mess. Yeah, but that was just family figuring out how to work again. It's like, well, they didn't seem that bad off. Like even I at mean, the beginning take of the movie, Bo for example. Pretty well. Her, as he described it, like contribution to the unity of the family was being like, "Ew, the water tastes gross." I'm gonna leave my shit out. Yeah. yeah. So if Mel was like a normal person, and he said, "You, you can't leave." endless cups of glasses of water half full around the house everywhere that you go like this is unacceptable i will beat the shit out of you keep doing this <laughs> then it's like well the the then the final bit of the movie doesn't happen if he was just a responsible parent which and, is an um, interesting part of the theme if i see one more glass i'm gonna get that bat and i'm gonna swing away <laughs> i'm gonna get yeah i'm gonna swing <laughs> he's like he sees one more glass he's like meryl hit her he's like what he's like, hit, her, hit her right now hit her hard <laughs> <laughs> He's got to learn someday. Um, yeah, that is someone brought up as well. It's, it's like, Chris, though, about the, uh, it's about faith. It's, it's just, does that excuse the alien story being nonsense? Is that what you're suggesting? Because, of course, if he were like, well, uh, somewhat, and be like, so then decide. Do you think it's nonsense or not? Well, well, surely it undermines the idea of faith if essentially the characters are saved through the incompetence of the aliens rather than, like, divine miracles. And since water is a universal symbol of holiness and purification, it makes sense that Knight would choose that as the thing that washes well, the evil I mean, away. <laughs> I understand it, but like... <laughs> I it the symbolism can be stupid. Washes the evil away. <laughs> it's also the reason that the, the water is all left around is that the girl says it's contaminated, not that it's pure. So like, it, even if it is the idea mm. that he's going with holy water as this, this cleansing instrument, 
the setup for it is fundamentally misunderstood because no, 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 it's no, no, only no. left it's around that, because it's is, supposed to be dirty. This is commentary on M. Night Shyamalan's libertarian opinions on what the government does to our drinking water. Oh. It's really kind of a... It's, it's the floor, right, that did it. I'm telling you, well, I don't, I, I make no claims. <laughs> the uh, the, alien, the aliens water. analyze the holy. water, they discover it's the fluoride, holy. and the aliens are like, their government oh. puts drugs in their water? Oh my god, that's that, that's horrifying, <laughs> I can't believe it. It's like, yeah, I know, we should, we should save them from their awful government. <laughs> we should get them out of there. <laughs> <laughs> their government dilutes their acid? That's awfully kind of them. <laughs> It'd be funny if it's, it's not... actually the fluoride that's damaging. Yeah, the they're like, they poison the their water. <laughs> An army of dentists come out. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them disagrees. Remember, it's always 9 out of 10. 9 out of 10 dentists come out and fight the aliens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> always 9 there are. No more, no less. Fight, yeah. the, they have like, they, yeah, they have, uh, there's 10 spots, there's 9 in a row, but there's a very conspicuous gap between two of them. <laughs> There is a tenth dentist. Everyone's like, "Why are you a part of this?" He's like, "I'm just not. I have been convinced by it. I, my opinion is different from the other nine. That's that's." that's I that's support the other brand. Yes. Oh no, we're on the home stretch, and I have to reload again. Yeah, this is the end. No more arguments. Oh, oh is there? Because uh, I Sorry, froze. That would be my guess. It, oh, the part that played. It's just talking about. Oh yeah, signs are really important to me. So I think I'm starting to realize, oh, we're done with arguments. It's over. Well, um, unfortunately, give me a second, yeah, he's reload. got less than a minute to go. So who knows what he's going to say? Un momento. Apparently my, uh, it's, it's Chrome, I think. I'm going to blame Chrome anyway. That's fair enough. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, we have a chat summary that was submitted uh, recently. Uh, the chat is about a new movie that seems to have plot holes that are frustrating many viewers. The main topic seems to revolve around the illogical use of a pantry door. <laughs> you know what? That's a hundred percent accurate. <laughs> this this YouTube live chat is discussing a movie about aliens who break into a suburban house and steal all the food from the pantry <laughs> while the family is hiding in the basement. <laughs> Uh, might have something to do with the 10 million pantry titles that people are coming up with. <laughs> the, the aliens break in and steal all their food. <laughs> well, they hide in the basement. They're like, oh, and he's upstairs and he's just stuffing animal crackers into his pockets and like oregano. <laughs> just grabbing leaves of it. Oh my God. Like, Ooh, potatoes. Ooh, yum. Yeah, you don't have to refrigerate. Really. <laughs> he takes them. So the impression I get uh, is the film creates a very satisfying atmosphere for a lot of people, and so they feel the need to try and make sense of the aliens mm -hmm. instead of yeah. just being like, "Guys, we could just admit it. It's okay." Yeah, um, I've almost got it back. Hang on. And what a what an odyssey you're going on to just try and I know. <laughs> get the watch to get working again. Like I said, I'm almost certain it's Chrome. Uh, I've heard nothing but complaints from all the people who host streams about Chrome and uh, even StreamYards and then OBS and stuff. It's just things not working as great as they often would. Who's to say what exactly is going on? Loading up Watch Together again was doing its like, I'm not sure about this loading screen. You're not making fun of Chris, are you? I've seen how you treat him. Oh, hey, man. Uh, maybe Shelby Oaks will be quite inspired by signs. Ooh, yeah. You know, you could probably get maybe Mel Gibson Maybe the woman now. will be defeated by water, yeah. Si oh, maybe he shouldn't get Mel Gibson. People would be like, wow, how could you? And he'd be like, oh, no. All right. This is probably a symbol gonna... of holiness and purification. It makes sense that Knight would choose that as the thing that washes the evil away. Signs is the reason I'm talking to you guys about movies today. I owe the film a lot of thanks. Thanks so much, guys, for watching this review. Oh. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. That thanks a lot, Signs. We owe you. Worth. We owe you yeah. a lot of thanks, Signs. That's really it. Really appreciate that. Again, I that just want to stress: analyzed and explained. No, it was mostly described. You know, what, we, we, go, what, we go into way more depth, and I usually name these like we chat about, or we, you know, break down. 
this was a pretty deep and meaningful discussion about like signs. Like we talk about this a lot and its failures and its successes and what it's trying to do, what it could have done better, potential changes. I mean, we I think we gave we give signs a very fair shake. Fairer than he does. Yeah, you would think that we liked it more than him in terms of uh, how much it's clearly had an effect on us, but really it's more a matter of I just wanted to represent the film properly and I had lots of things to say about it and I think you guys were similar. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I look forward to doing more analyzed reviews in the future. I hope you enjoyed this and if you like signs, I hope you like it a little bit more now and if there were some <laughs> things you were maybe confused about. No. Why? <laughs> how, how could I possibly like it more now? How? If anything, you said like yeah, you didn't do it justice. Oh, and maybe I didn't notice. Stupid. Maybe I didn't notice that veterinarian was written on his mailbox. So maybe there's that, and now I like the movie now. Like, what have you added to it? I mean, he did describe most of what happened. So if you were looking at your phone, or if you missed some of it, you'd now know more about That's what happened. True. <laughs> if I was half watching it on a second monitor, then maybe I would like it more now. Uh, I wish they did that name thing we were talking about earlier with the vet veterinarian, where it's like Victor. Eterinarian on the <laughs> Victor Eterinarian. <laughs> uh, Harriet Arbinger. How could you do that? God, I hope this maybe cleared it up for you. And maybe just ma <laughs> Samuel Urgen. Maybe if you were annoyed by the water thing, you're not as annoyed by it now. Because trust me, I understand. It's a little weird. It's a little different. But the movie really is a little different. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Being retarded is not different. Trust me, there's a lot of films that like to do it. You're in, you're in good company. About that. Also, let me know in the comments below other films you would like me to analyze in this fashion. Guys, thanks so much for watching, and if you like this, you can click right here and get stuckmanized. Oh, he said it. Yeah. I'm, He's got a I'm tiny kind, gun. I kind Look of am stunned gun. Like, by how vacuous that was. That was really empty. It's even going back 10 years, like, that was really bad. Um, I don't know like I anything. 1.4 million views on that. I, I don't know anything. why. Like, it's, there's nothing in it, but, you know, we got to have chats about stuff. Um, it is more than time to uh, express to you folks, since probably not going to do it in the form of watching a video because we're already at six and a half hours, but at least to explore with you a, a theory which kind of set me on wanting to talk about science in the first place. But um, okay. we'll see what you, what, you, what you think. The theory goes that in the world of signs, in the film, they were never attacked by aliens. They were attacked by demons from below. And they arrived uh, to, to attack violently and to, to do whatever they wanted to ravage humanity. And that when they were beaten back by things like holy water and other appropriate religious iconography that may be alluded to by the, uh, they said, a primitive way of backing them off. Um, Baseball bats? They all, <laughs> uh, they, all, <laughs> they all retreated back into the depths that they came. It is a movie about faith and God, and that these are, like, it was a mistake to think these were aliens when they were, in fact, demons from below. Where did the demons get their spaceships from? Well, so the... The explanations I've seen are like, you, there are no spaceships, people just thought there were because they were just lights, but this is an explicit reference to crafts, like, several times moving, leaving, and there's the bird that flew into one. I don't understand how we're arguing that all the... the... What I'm saying is so that... So all the um, indication of airborne craft was a distraction set up by the demons to make them think... could be demon... Let's make them think... Yeah, Satan aliens. himself did that as a distraction to test Listen, our faith, kind of like the dinosaurs. Demons... I mean, demons don't want to walk, so... You know, <laughs> yeah, demons made some spaceships. Stuff. Yeah, they don't want to get... Yeah, you want to get tired by the time you're on the above world. <laughs> so so when, um, when you're listening into demon conversations, what you need, you need a baby monitor, and you need to get up high in order to listen to the demons that are coming up from below you. <laughs> demons come from above. Demons come from above. It's we just this like Snyder. Snyder told us. <laughs> uh, right. They just they just drive up in a big drill like the mole man from Incredibles. What it, what's his name? The Underminer. The Underminer. Yeah. underminer. <laughs> so, uh, the Underminer. A uh, bow and the mum are supposed I to. I don't like be water. Keep it away. Partially from me. like angelic. They're supposed to like the the dream slash uh, premonition information that's supposed to represent that they have an angelic influence on the life of Mel Gibson. They're supposed to represent like the average person and their struggle with faith and. 
I um I I appreciate the attempt to make signs make sense, but I'm sorry, I don't think the references cute, match yeah. that it's demons whatsoever. And to be honest with you, doesn't it's not holy water just because it's in the house of a priest, right? It needs to be blessed. I thought. Yes. Correct. Yeah, <laughs> like when the, when a priest is at home and he needs to wash his dishes and he turns on the tap, it's not like he's sanctifying. Well, especially all the and he's and a former bowls priest. And... He's a former. He gave it up. Also, he's a former priest. That yes. should count for something. Yeah. And there's also, as Platoon mentioned earlier, the girls going on and on about how the water's contaminated. So yeah, that's, that's kind of weird. Hard to... If it's like it's contaminated, but it's actually like blessed. Well, can you bless the sink, and then anything that comes out of it is going to be blessed? Uh, I imagine that's not. Fluoride is right. Fluoride is actually just a bunch of priests <laughs> blessing all of the water. <laughs> a cavity be gone. <laughs> and remember, she said that the water was contaminated in that bookstore. Were they? Did they have holy water as well? No. Or are we simply arguing water <laughs> is enough on its own? It's it's just that demons just hate water because it's kind of it's holy related. Um, I will say no. the demon theory explains a lot of their retardation somewhat because demons can just be <laughs> creatures going, blah, 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 I'm gonna get you. But uh, mm. yeah, so uh. I, uh, you know. It's, Maybe it, that's uh, Shyamalan's genius. He incorporated a twist that wasn't well, so even revealed. In that's the, the other thing is like Chris Stockman's favorite film of all time, but he hasn't even entertained that theory. He's he's strictly <laughs> on the it's aliens. So um, not to say that's evidence of anything in particular. I'm just I'd be curious to see what I would hope he wouldn't just say that's an interesting theory. I would I would hope he'd be like, does that line up? I don't know. Maybe she's part demon. Yeah, and you'd think a demon could escape a pantry still. Yeah, it's a shame. Yeah, it, you, you could op open up like a hole into hell, like right in the pantry, and just jump into it. <laughs> the demons get stuck in a pantry. It would just repeat all the same questions, really. Add a few extras. Yeah. I don't know. It's um, and so that I guess that sort of brings us into conclusion. Signs. It's a film. <laughs> it's a mixed bag. I'm I I'm still just I am surprised by how little I gained from that video. No, and especially considering how long it was. Like, as somebody, I, I don't consider myself to be particularly, like, knowledgeable on signs, you know? Yeah. It's not, it's not that important a film to me, um, but I don't feel like I learned anything. I feel like I got a recap of the film, and then, man, this was so good. Anyway, so the next scene is this, and then, like, right at the end, for a couple of minutes, r really feeble responses to what we all recognize are just obvious flaws with the film. I would just expect more if this is his favorite movie, or one of them. Or well, one know? of the most important movies of his life. I just, I thought I'd yeah. learn something. There's so little discussion of the actual craft, considering this is the movie that made him want to get into making movies. Yeah, mm -hmm. you would think you would talk more specifically about just filmmaking techniques. Well, there's so little um, uh, use of like this behind the scenes docs for uh, signs. I know there are because I remember watching one, but you didn't use much footage from any of that, nor any commentary from them. Um, audio commentary information? Did he not gather any insights from M Night talking about making it? I think something. he made one when mention of a deleted scene at one point, I think, and that was just to dismiss it because obviously it wasn't in the movie, so it was the right call not to be in the movie. But right. that was the only time I remember. Yeah. This video is 10 and years I, old, long also... before he became a bland, this is movie film reviewer. Yeah, but I don't think this that is this is... When he was good. <laughs> That's quite depressing. Oof. I will say this video is better than what he makes these days, but yeah, uh, it's not fantastic. And it's especially weird being that this isn't a random film he reviewed. This is the, the number one, or at least number one in some vein. What a shame. A little bit. Um, but hey, you know, I'm glad a lot of people enjoy Signs for the atmosphere it creates. I just wish the script were a lot tighter. And um, I don't know. I guess it's cool that he got to make... Like, I, I find M. Night more interesting as the... I'm going to make some shit person than uh, Snyder. Uh, but maybe the, those two should be kept in the same sort of comparison at this point. I don't think people are ready to reduce Snyder down to M. Night, but give it another few Rebel Moons. I think we'll be there. 
Well, there's a bit of overlap there for me, actually, because I like Dawn of the Dead. And ever since then, it's just I've not liked anything he's made. Ah, I'm back. But maybe... well, the, the overlap being that uh, Shamlin made Sixth Sense, and then since then, it's just been downhill. Well, it's kind of funny, because when you said that, I'm thinking about who do I respect more? And I said, well, it's probably Shyamalan. Oh, between who and who? Shyamalan and who? And Snyder. Shyamalan. Yeah, probably, I would say. I think M. Night for me, yeah. Um... Oh, there is say... like artistry to this that isn't cringe or immature. Like there's actual, there are things in this that are well executed. There are some interesting shots and there are some interesting ideas and there is some good execution of some stuff. I mean, it's not a meritless movie. And from what I hear, he's made some like legitimately good movies because all Snyder seems to make is terrible shit. Well, I think then... he's good at conceiving sort of horrific images and translating that well, yeah, to film his movies. on occasion. <laughs> yeah. his filmmaking is truly horrifying <laughs> no that's uh, I do like aspects of what he does well, I remember uh, Signs being the transition movie for me with, with M. Night though it was uh, I really loved Unbreakable and Sixth Sense and then Signs I was like hmm not sure what I'm thinking about that one and then The Village I remember being like okay that that was silly <laughs> uh, what the fuck <laughs> Um, and then the half of the well, that wasn't next, but the village, damn, the village is one of those movies that exists in this place in my mind where I don't know anything about it whatsoever, but I've just like heard it pop up every once in a while as a thing he's done. That's a wonky, weird movie. It's uh, and I have no idea what it's about other than I assume a village. But... It's hugely about the twist at the end, which is what I assume many people may or may not know. But if you don't know, I'll leave it vague. I have, I have no clue. Um, I don't know anything about the village. I still think village is probably going to be much stronger than uh, the happening or uh, after <laughs> Earth. You know, just a second. <laughs> we do that. That will inevitably be covered on EFAP movies. The the happening. <laughs> just a what? second. What? No. <laughs> no. Truly <laughs> <laughs> really brilliant. Um. Well, I suppose that brings us to the end of the stream. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was a good, hearty, almost seven-hour discussion. Bet you guys didn't see that coming. Signs. You, know, like, in, in you didn't the see the signs. Of the Acolyte releasing to the horror of the universe. You're like, oh, yeah, let's talk about that 2002 movie from M. Night Shyamalan. Why not? But yeah. You get it all here. You get it all here on every frame of pause. We cover it all, top to bottom, any age. It was a it's fun conversation. I had a good laugh. I'm yeah, glad it was a good you did. Conversation. Before we head out, why don't we ask our little guests here what they're up to on their respective channels? Capital O, how are you up to words? How I up to? I up to great. You've been doinking, doinking around yeah. here on the internet, having a grand old time. Come over to the channel. There's some videos you can watch. We'll leave it at that. Thanks. Well, beautiful. Link in description. Sweet. John, what about you, sir? Uh, John Graham on YouTube. I'm doing a Cops and Aliens show with Halo Reach at the moment. I got the first hey episode out, but I'm taking a bit of a break right now, dealing with some moving shenanigans. Mm. So, But uh, I'll resume production as soon as I can. And uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Sweet. Makes sense. Uh, little Platoon... <laughs> I know you've been up to a lot recently. Why don't you tell the audience about it? Yes, lots and lots of Acolyte stuff. Um, it's nice going from one video every like three weeks to three videos in a week. It's absolute yeah. nightmare on my sleep pattern. Um, I'll be getting back to episode three after this. In fact, that will hopefully be out. Realistically, it's not going to be tomorrow at this point. So Monday, maybe, hopefully, or Tuesday. But at some point before episode four, episode three will be out on the channel. You really are trying to keep up with them as they come out, huh? Not bad. <laughs> well, I fell behind with Ahsoka, and then everyone sort of lost interest, and so it became pointless. So I want to, yeah, keep this one. It'd be nice to stay on top of something for a change rather than playing catch up. Yeah, I get you. Um, so you don't like the Acolyte, do you, or...? I think that's safe to say. Hmm. No, I think that there's nice bits about some of the ideas that almost make it into the script. I mean, it's uh, okay. Well, I mean, the the third episode I heard is the one that actually like turned the show around somewhat. It was uh, that oh, was the one people were celebrating. So yeah, yeah. Um, so that's nice to know. 
keep it. Uh, We're so back. Is that what you're saying? Definitely. Yes. <laughs> you know what's funny is I'm, I'm expecting that kind of attitude at the end of the next episode where they show all the lightsabers. Um, that part, they know what they're doing with that. Everyone's gonna be like, it's so cool. We shall see. Um, yeah, for those curious as well, uh, EFAP TV episodes have been released for the first three. If you would like to know what the Acolyte is all about. Uh -huh. But as was mentioned, you get some deep dives on uh, Little Platoon's channel. And uh, plenty of videos to enjoy on all three of our guests from today, which we very much appreciate you guys hanging out for something so specific and strange. Uh, hopefully you had fun with the, the signs. Absolutely. Uh, Rags, Fringy, anything you guys want to mention, say, in any way, shape, or form? Nothing I want to say right now. Just things are getting worked on kind of in the background. And, uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to mention any release time or anything quite yet. Uh, I mean, you know the deal. It's just editing Dungeon Acolyte. That's happening right now. Halo will be, at, at some point, we'll talk about <laughs> when that's, when that'll be releasing at some stage. Yes, and um, in the future, I, I, yeah, well, there's, there's things to come. We're just sorting out exactly how things will release. In fact, the next, how to line everything up. You know, you get in your acolytes chat, but you're also gonna get a uh, King Arthur war movie arc soon. I'm not exactly sure of exactly when, but it'll happen. So, uh, yeah, have a good night, all. Thank you very much. And yeah, we everybody. Shall see you on the Thanks next for being one. Here. Doodle pip. Yes, we, will. Later, everybody. we will see you later. Bye bye. 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 bye see you later, everybody. Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye.